Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price in The Letter. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Some stars are born to fame. Others have fame thrust upon them. Then there's a third kind, like Betty Davis. All the honors in Hollywood have come to her at one time or another. Those who judge stars by box office value place her among the leaders. Those who judge by purely artistic standards accord her the same position. She's won the Academy Award twice, and yet I doubt whether Betty has has ever been completely satisfied with one of her performances. Like most great artists, she always found some detail that that might be improved, but neither the box office nor the critic judges harshly as her own instinct. Tonight, we present Betty Davis in The Letter by Somerset Maugham. She gave one of her finest performances in the Warner Brothers picture, and that was only fitting, because it was in another Maugham story called Of Human Bondage, that Betty really came of age as an actress. The letter packs the drama of a lifetime into a few weeks of love and violence and death. It's a great play for a great actress. But you'll hear more than one star performance because Herbert Marshall will play opposite Betty in the same part he had in the picture. And our third star is Vincent Price, who makes his first appearance here tonight. When I was first connected with the theater, the audience which enjoyed a production like this was limited to the few hundred people who could crowd into a Broadway playhouse. You can picture the riot that'd be if tonight's stars were appearing on Broadway for one night only. But today, Lux Flakes has made it possible for 30 or 35 million people to hear the play at the same time, and every one of you has the best seat in the house. The soldier in New Guinea... It's in the third row center, right beside the banker who is listening from his Park Avenue apartment. And Lux Flakes is at work in both places, in millions of American homes and abroad where a steel helmet may do double duty as a wash tub. Here's the curtain now for the first act of the letter, starring Betty Davis as Leslie, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and Vincent Price as Howard Joyce. this happened a few years ago on the Malay Peninsula in the days before the war. Just north of Singapore lay the great rubber plantations, kingdoms of commerce built by natives and white men. On this particular night in the main bungalow of one of these plantations, a light burns dimly through a shaded window. The night is hot and humid, the soft breeze heavy with the scent of flowers. A clouded moon hangs low in the sky, filtering slowly through the trees, making patterns of shimmering silver on the ground. There is deep silence. Suddenly, the door of the bungalow is flung open. Missy, I hear a gunfire. Missy Crosby, I hear. That man, that is Mr. Hammond. Is he dead? I... I think him dead. You see him, Missy Crosby? Do you know where the new district officer lives? Yes, Missy. Send someone for him at once. Say there's been an accident and Mr. Hammond's dead. Yes, Missy. And get word to my husband. He's out somewhere on the number four plantation. Yes, Missy, I try. Leslie, where are you? Leslie, I'm here. Mr. Crosby? Yeah? I'm John Withers, the new district officer. Where's Mrs. Crosby? She locked herself in her room. She wouldn't see me until you came. Oh, excuse me. Leslie, let me in. Leslie, darling, it's Robert. Leslie, what happened? Didn't they tell you? They said Hammond was killed. Is he... 
Is he still out there? I had your head boy remove the body to a shed. Leslie, what happened? Tell me. He tried to... to make love to me, and I shot him. Leslie. Oh, Robert, I'm so glad you There, darling, there. Hold me tight. I'm so frightened. There's nothing, nothing to be frightened about. It'll be all right. (gasps) Oh, there, now, 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 that's better. Uh, I'll try not to do that again. Mr. Withers, I hope you'll understand. I didn't want to see anyone until my husband came. Yes, of course. I understand, Mrs. Crosby. Oh, Howard, uh, come in. I got your message in Singapore. Howard, how nice of you to come. Naturally, I want to be here if I can help. Oh, you will help us. In every way I can, as your lawyer and your friend. You're a dear. Mr. Withers, this is Mr. Howard Joyce, my attorney. How do you do? How do you do? How's Dorothy Howard? Oh, she's very well and anxious to see you. Has her sister arrived from England? Adele? Oh, yes. She came last week. Oh. Oh, here now. Uh, here now. Leslie, you better be rested. Oh, I do feel dreadfully faint. Come and lie down, darling. I'll, uh, I'll get you a drink. I'm sorry to be so tired. Nonsense. You're being very brave. How long have you been here, Mr. Withers? About an hour. One of the Crosby houseboys came to fetch me. Was Hammond dead? Oh, yes. He was just riddled with bullets. What? Well, here's the revolver. All six chambers are empty. Here, you two. You better have a drink yourselves. Thanks, but I'm afraid I shouldn't. I'm on duty of a sort, you know. Well, I'll have one, Bob. You feeling any better, Leslie? Much better, thank you. Um, Mrs. Crosby, I'm afraid it's my duty to ask you some questions. Well, I think I can wait, Mr. Withers, until my wife... Oh, it's all right, Robert, really. I, I feel perfectly well now. Then suppose you tell us, Leslie, in your own words, exactly what happened. I'll try. And take your time, Mrs. Crosby. Remember, we're all friends here. You've been so patient. Well, well, as you know, Robert was spending the night at number four plantation. Oh, I never mind being alone. A planter's wife gets used to that. Oh, my dear. I had dinner rather late, and I, I started working on my lace. Oh, I don't know how long I'd been working, when suddenly I heard footsteps outside, and someone came up on the veranda and said, Good evening, can I come in? I was startled because I hadn't heard a car drive up. Who is it, I asked? Jeff Hammond. Oh, of course, I said. Come in and have a drink. Were you surprised to see him? Well, I was, rather. He hadn't been in the house for ages, had he, Robert? Three months at least. I told him Robert was over at the number four plantation getting out a a shipment or something. Wasn't that it, darling? What did he say to that? He said, oh, I'm sorry. I felt rather lonely tonight, so I thought I'd just come over and see how you were getting on. Well, I put on my spectacles again and went on with my work. We chatted about one thing and another... He asked me if Robert had heard that a tiger had been seen on the road two or three days ago. He said he thought he'd try to get it over the weekend. Oh, yes, I know about that. Don't you remember I spoke to you about it yesterday? Did you? Oh, yes, I believe you did. Well, we we went on chatting until... Well, well, suddenly he said something rather silly. What? It's hardly worth repeating. He paid me a little compliment. I think perhaps you'd better tell us exactly what he said, Leslie. He said, you've got very pretty eyes. It's too bad to hide them under those ugly spectacles. Has he ever said anything of the sort to you before? Oh, no, never, and I thought it impertinent. I don't wonder. Did you answer him? I said I didn't care a row of beans what he thought about me. But he only laughed and said, I'm going to tell you all the same. I think you're the prettiest thing I've ever seen. Yes, sir. Let her finish, Bob. Well, in that case, I said I can only think you half-witted. He laughed again and moved his chair up closer. But, Mrs. Crosby, I wonder you didn't throw him out there and then. Well, I didn't want to make a fuss. I think a woman only makes a perfect fool of herself if, if she makes a scene every time a man pays her a compliment. When did you first suspect that Hammond was serious? The next thing he said. He looked at me straight in the face and he said, Don't you know that I'm awfully in love with you? Swine. Were you surprised? Of course I was surprised. Well, we've known him for seven years, Robert. and He's never paid me the smallest attention. Well, I didn't suppose he even knew what color my eyes were. We haven't seen very much of him in the last few years. Yes, yes. Go on, Leslie. Well, he helped himself to another whiskey and soda. I began to wonder if he'd been drinking before. I wouldn't drink any more if I were you, I said. He emptied his glass and asked me in a funny, abrupt way, you think I'm talking to you like this because I'm drunk? I said that's the most obvious explanation, isn't it? Oh, it's awful having to tell you all this. I'm so ashamed. I wish there was some way we could spare you, Mrs. Crosby. Leslie, it's for your own good that we know the facts, all you can remember of them. Very well. I'll tell you the rest. I got up from my chair. I was standing in front of the table about about here. He rose and stood in front of me. Good night, I said. But he just looked at me, and his eyes were all funny. I'm not going, he said. Well, then I began to lose my temper. 
You poor fool. Don't you know I've never loved anyone but Robert? And even if I didn't love Robert, you're the last man I should care for. He answered, Robert's away. Well, that was the last straw. Oh, I wasn't frightened, just angry. If you don't go away this minute, I told him, I'll call the boys and have you thrown out. I walked past him to call the boys, and he took hold of my arm and swung me back. Oh, I screamed as loud as I could. He flung his arms about me and began to kiss me. I struggled to tear myself away from him. Oh, he seemed like a madman. He kept talking and talking, saying he loved me. Oh, it's horrible. I can't go on. I'm very sorry, Leslie, but we'll have to know the rest. Well, he lifted me in his arms. I, I struggled to get free, but he was too strong. He started to carry me, and, and then he stumbled on those steps, and I got away from him. Suddenly, I remembered Robert's revolver in the drawer of that chest. He got up, but I reached it before he caught me. Oh, it was all instinctive. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know I'd fired. I heard a report and saw him lurch, lurch toward the door. I followed him out to the veranda. He staggered across the porch and fell down the steps. I don't remember anything more. Just the reports, one after another, until there was a funny little click and the revolver was empty. And suddenly I looked down and saw him lying there, lying in the moonlight. It was... Only then that I knew what I'd done. My poor darling. Mrs. Crosby, may I say I think you've behaved magnificently? I'm terribly sorry we had to put you to the ordeal of telling us all this. Well, you were all very kind. It's quite obvious the man only got what he deserved. Withers, if you'll come with me, I'd, I'd like to see the body for a minute. Oh, yes. Yes, I'll take you to the shed. We'll only be a few minutes. My poor child. Oh, Robert, what have I done? You've done what any woman would have done in your place. Only nine-tenths of them wouldn't have had the courage. And yet I'd give almost anything if I could bring him back to life. It's so horrible to think that I killed him. Leslie, why, there isn't a man or a woman in the colony who won't be proud to know you. Darling, we have been happy, haven't we? You've been the best wife a man could have. I'm grateful for all the time we've been together. Oh, Robert, don't say it that way. It sounds so... so in the past. Oh, nonsense. We've got most of our lives ahead of us. Oh, if only there was something I could do to help you right now. You can love me. That's all I need. I've always loved you. Yes, but now. Leslie, darling, if I could love you anymore, I would now. Robert. You have to be very indulgent towards my cooking, gentlemen. I can't vouch for it. Well, I can and will. Funny. The head boy running off tonight. Yeah, it is odd. Well, he couldn't have done any better than this, my dear. It's delicious. It certainly is. Thank you, gentlemen. I think we should start for Singapore as soon as we're finished. Right away? It's still dark, Howard. It'll be 8 o'clock by the time we get there. We'll ring the Attorney General and find out when we can see him. I think that's the first thing to do, don't you, Withers? Uh, yes, yes, I think that's the best thing to do. Would I have to be arrested? Well, you see, Mrs. Crosby, uh, as a matter of fact... I... I think you're by way of being under arrest now. It's purely a matter of form, Mrs. Crosby. Shall I be in prison? Well, that's up to the Attorney General. But it's quite possible he'll be able to accept bail. He's, he's a very good fellow, and I'm sure he'll do everything he can. How do you mean, be able to accept bail? Well, my dear, it, it depends on what the charge is. What do you mean by that? I think it's not unlikely that he'll say that only one charge is possible and. In that case, well, I'm afraid that an application for bail would be useless. What charge? Murder. Leslie. Oh, I'm quite all right. More coffee, dear. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, if we're going to leave, I'd better put a few things together. I won't be long. Let me do it, Robert. No, no, no. Don't bother, dear. Oh, Leslie. Yes? There's just one question I'd like to ask you. Yes, what is it, Howard? Just before, when I was looking at Hammond's body... Oh, yes? It seemed to me that some of the shots must have been fired after he was lying on the ground. I'm afraid it sounds very cold-blooded. But I was so terrified I didn't know what I was doing. Everything was confused and blurred. Oh, well, there, Leslie, I, I shouldn't even have brought it up tonight. Put it out of your mind. Come in. Well, Longchi? Mr. Crosby to see you, sir. Oh, ask him to come in. Mr. Crosby. Thanks. Hello, Bob. Uh, how, how is she? Have you seen her? If I can be of any assistance, sir, I shall remain within call. Not at the moment, Ong. Thanks. 
Hong has been a great help on the case. He finds out everything. He's the perfect confidential clerk. I tried to catch you at the house. I had to see you, Howard. You needn't hesitate about coming to the office, Bob. You know you're always welcome. How is everything? Everything's fine. In fact, Leslie's much better than you. She hasn't turned a hair. She's worth ten of me. I don't mind confessing I'm all in. It's the first time we've been separated for more than a day since we were married. Oh, you mustn't let yourself go to pieces, old man. I've tried to work, but it's no good. The estate can go to blazes for all I care. I hate the house and every tree on the place. But then why not stay in town with us? Dorothy's for it, and so am I. Thanks, I think I will. I won't be so lonely. Oh, you'd better get some sleep before you see Leslie. You don't want her to have to cheer you up. She is a plucky woman. It's monstrous that they should have to keep her in that filthy prison all this time. They have no choice. Anyway, it's only a week now before the trial. Well, the whole thing's a farce. Why subject her to the ordeal of a trial? Because she admitted killing a man. A trial is inevitable. She shot him as she, as she would have shot a mad dog. You don't have to convince me, Robert. You know, it, it's curious Hammond was able to keep his life so hidden. That gambling house he owned, and especially the Eurasian woman. Will she be one of the witnesses? And I shan't call her. I'll just produce evidence that Hammond was married to her. He managed to keep that manager's secret, too. Oh, I know you're busy, Howard. I, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Oh, nonsense. Now stop worrying. That's your lawyer's job. All right, thanks, old man. I'll, I'll see you up at the house. Yes? Mr. Joy. Well, Long? If you are not too busy, sir... May I trouble you for a few words in private conversation? No trouble at all. It has to do with the case of the Crown versus Crosby. Yes. A friend has brought me information, sir, that there is a letter from the defendant to the unfortunate victim of the tragedy. Well, that's not surprising. In the course of seven years, I have no doubt that Mrs. Crosby often had occasion to write to Mr. Hammond. But the letter, sir, was written on the day of his death. Well... You will recall that Mrs. Crosby had stated that until the fatal night, she had had no communication with the deceased for several weeks. This letter indicates that her statement is not in every respect accurate. Have you seen the letter? I have with me a copy, sir. The original is in the possession of a woman who happens to be the widow of Mr. Hammond, deceased. May I read it? Oh, certainly, sir. Of course, as I said, this is but a copy. Can you understand it, sir? Perfectly. Ong, oh, it's, it's inconceivable that Mrs. Crosby should have written such a letter. May I suggest, sir, that it would be well to make sure, since my friend is of the opinion that the letter would be of some interest to the prosecutor. I'm obliged to you, Ong. I'll give the matter my consideration. Very good, sir. Do you wish me to communicate that to my friend? It might be well if you kept in touch with him. Yes, sir. It might be very well. You may stay in the visiting room as long as you want, Mrs. Crosby. The warden's orders. That's very nice of him. Thank you. Howard, how good of you to come. I wasn't expecting you today. Good morning, Leslie. You're looking very well. Thank you, Howard. Well, the trial's only five days off now. I know. Each morning when I awake, I say to myself, one day less, just like I used to at school with the holidays coming. Oh, Leslie. Oh, don't feel sorry for me, Howard. The time has really passed quite quickly. I've read a great deal and worked on my lace. But I will confess something to you, Howard. I'm not looking forward to testifying in court. Leslie, one of the things that it's impressed me is that each time you've told your story... You've told it in exactly the same words. You've never varied a hair's breadth. And what does that suggest to your legal mind? Well, it suggests either that you have an extraordinary memory or... Or? Or that you're telling the plain, unvarnished truth. I'm afraid I have a very poor memory. Leslie, I suppose I'm right in thinking that you had no communication with Hammond for several weeks before the catastrophe. Oh, quite. I I'm positive of that. Let's see. Well, the last time we met was at a tennis party at the McFarren. I don't think I said more than two words to him. And you hadn't written to him? Oh, no. At one time, you'd been on fairly intimate terms with him. How did it happen that you stopped asking him to anything? Well, we hadn't anything much in common. He was very popular, you know, and well, there didn't seem to be any need to shower him with invitations. Are you quite certain that was all? 
Well, I may as well tell you, we heard about his, uh, his wife. And once, just by chance, I actually saw her. Oh, well, you never mentioned that. What was she like? Horrible. Covered with gold chains and bangles and bracelets. And a face like a mask. And it was after you knew about her that you stopped having anything to do with Hammond. Yes. Leslie, I think I should tell you that there is in existence a letter in your handwriting from you to Jeff Hammond. Well, I've, I've often sent him little notes to ask him something or other. This letter asked him to come and see you because Robert was going to be away. Oh, but that's impossible. I never did anything of the kind. Here, you'd better read it for yourself. This is not my handwriting. I know that. It's said to be an exact copy of one written on the day of Hammond's death. Well, Leslie? What does it mean? That's for you to say, Leslie. I didn't write it. I swear I didn't write it. The original is in your handwriting. It would be useless to deny it. But it could be a forgery. It would be difficult to prove that, Leslie. It would be very easy to prove that it was genuine. Uh, Well, it's it's not dated. It might have been written years ago. Oh, if you'll you'll just give me a little time, I'll try to remember. Leslie, the prosecution could cross-examine your houseboys. They would soon find out whether someone took a letter to Hammond on the day of his death. I swear to you, I did not write this letter. Very well. Then there's nothing further to talk about. I'll be going. Howard! Howard, wait a minute. I... I did write it. But you see, I was afraid to mention it. I thought none of you'd believe my story if I admitted that he'd come there at my invitation. Go on. You see, I was preparing a surprise for Robert's birthday. I knew he wanted a new gun, and, oh, I'm so dreadfully stupid about sporting things. I thought I'd talk to Jeff about it and get him to order it for me. Perhaps you've forgotten what's in the letter. Will you have another look at it? No, I don't want to. Then let me read it to you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I'm desperate, and if you don't come, I won't answer for the consequences. Don't drive up to the door. Leslie, I'll have to talk to you very plainly. I told Robert today that I was certain of your acquittal. And I didn't say that just to cheer him up. I don't believe the jury would have retired at all. But this letter alters the case completely. I won't tell you what I... what I personally thought when I read the letter. The duty of counsel is to defend his client, not to convict her. Even in his own mind. I don't want you to tell me anything but what is needed to save your neck. Oh. They can prove Hammond came to your house at your urgent invitation. I don't know what else they can prove, Leslie, but if the jury comes to the conclusion that you didn't kill Hammond in self-defense... I know. I know that... that... Leslie! Matron! Matron, quickly! Yes, sir? Call the nurse. Mrs. Crosby is ill. While we wait for Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price to return with Mr. DeMille for Act Two of The Letter, do you remember this tune? It's a song I've always liked. Remember? Night and day, you're the one. Only you beneath the moon and under the sun. Isn't that what every woman would like to hear? And she can hear it if... If she's the charming person she's meant to be. And don't think you must be a great beauty to be charming. Think, don't you know women who aren't beautiful or even pretty? Yet their whole being draws you to them. They're warm and gay. Yes, not they always very dainty, flower fresh and immaculate? And isn't that the picture in your mind when I speak of Lux girls? They go together, Lux and daintiness. Yes, because these gentle lux flakes make this appealing quality so very, very easy to have. We women are busy. Oh, yes, there's so much to do these days. But all the more reason to remember lux. It's so quick. That dainty habit of dipping under things daily in lux. A little thing, seemingly, but a major part of charm. So let's never be too busy to use lux fake flakes for undies each day. The ABC... Of charm is L-U-X. Then you are sure to hear from the one you want most to hear it from. Night and day, you are the one. Only you beneath the moon and under the sun. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act two of the letter, 
Starring Betty Davis as Leslie, Herbert Marshall as Robert Crosby, and Vincent Price as Howard Joyce. In that split fraction of a moment, before her mind slipped into blackness, Leslie Crosby realized that the letter she had written to Jeff Hammond was damning evidence. Evidence enough to hang her. Now, a few minutes later, in the first aid room of the prison hospital, she leans wearily back in a chair, her eyes half closed. I'm afraid I've made rather a mess of things. I'm sorry. For Robert, not for me. You've distrusted me from the beginning, Howard. That's neither here nor there, Leslie. Who's got the letter now? The Eurasian woman who was Hammond's wife. Oh. Howard, are you going to let me be hanged? What do you mean by that, Leslie? You could get hold of the letter. Do you think it's so easy to do away with unwelcome evidence? But surely nothing would have been said to you if the, if the owner wasn't prepared to sell it. That's quite true. But I'm not prepared to buy it. Oh, but it wouldn't be your money. Robert has saved some. I wasn't thinking of the money. I don't know if you will understand this, Leslie, but I've always thought of myself as an honest man. You're asking me to do something which is no different from suborning a witness. Do you mean to say that you can save me and you won't? What harm have I ever done you? You can't be so cruel. I want to do my best for you, Leslie. But a lawyer has a duty to his profession and to himself. I can't do what you ask. Oh, poor Robert. He doesn't deserve it. He's never hurt anyone in his life. He's so kind and simple and good. And he trusts me so. I mean everything to him, everything in the world. And this will ruin his life. Oh, I know what you're thinking. You despise me. You think he's well rid of me if they do hang me. It isn't important what I feel about you. Do you understand? But I'm going to do what I can. Oh, how? Bob will want to know what the money's for. Will it be a very large sum? Well, I imagine this woman has a pretty shrewd idea of the letter's value. You won't have to show Robert the letter, will you? I'll do everything possible to prevent it. He'll be an important witness, and he should be as firmly convinced of your innocence as he is now. And after the trial? I'm going to try to save your life. Oh, if Robert loses his trust in me, he loses everything. It's strange that a man can live with a woman for ten years and not know the first thing about her. say your friend could be induced to part with the letter? I believe so, sir. But my friend has not got the letter, sir. The woman has it. She did not know the value of it till my friend told her. What value did he put on it? Ten thousand dollars, sir. Only ten thousand? Well, why not fifty or a hundred? For the reason, sir, that Mr. Crosby has in the bank a savings account in the amount of only ten thousand four hundred and fifty dollars. Ten thousand dollars is a good deal of money, Ong. Well, I'll speak to Mr. Crosby. Have the woman come to my office. I was about to mention, sir, she made two conditions. She insists that the money shall be brought to her. I can take you to the house whenever you are ready. What is the other condition? That Mrs. Crosby shall bring it to her personally. Why, you must be mad. Great heavens, man. Do you suppose Mrs. Crosby can just walk out of a prison cell whenever she feels like it? My friend thinks you could arrange to have her stay at your house until the trial. I believe the judge will permit it if you are responsible for her, sir. Very well. Ong, tell me something. Yes, sir. What are you getting out of this? Two thousand dollars, sir, and the satisfaction of being of service to you and our client. Well, sit down, Howard. I've taken the liberty of ordering for you. Oh, Thanks. You're looking more cheerful, Bob. I feel better since this morning. I guess you finally convinced me we have nothing to worry about. Well, as a matter of fact, Bob, something has come up. Oh, it's nothing very much, but I thought I'd better have a talk with you about it. Yes? Well, it, it seems Leslie wrote a letter to Hammond asking him to come to the bungalow on the night he was killed. Why, that's impossible. You heard her say she'd had no communication with him for weeks before it happened. Nevertheless, she did write the letter. She wanted his advice on something she was buying you for your birthday. Your birthday was about then, wasn't it? Yes, it was the end of April. In the excitement, she forgot the letter at the time and then later was afraid to say she'd made a mistake. But that's not like Leslie. She isn't afraid of anything. This was a pretty serious mistake. And she realized it. 
Who has the letter? Hammond's widow. She threatens to turn it over to the prosecution. Well, what if she does? Leslie can explain it in court just as she explained it to you. Yes, but don't you see, it might alter things a good deal in the minds of the jury if, if Hammond came to your home by invitation. Well, what's to be done about it? I think we must get hold of that letter. I want you to authorize me to buy it. I'll do whatever you think is right. All right, buy the letter. I'll pay you back whatever it costs. Good. Now put the matter out of your mind. Oh, by the way, Leslie will be at the house tonight. I've arranged to have her released pending trial. Don't tell me that's the same lace I saw you working on at the McFerrin's. How can you go so fast? Well, I hadn't anything much else to do this past month. What's it going to be? It's too fine for a tablecloth, surely. It's a coverlet for our bed. Oh, Dorothy, Leslie and I have some work to do this evening. Look here, Robert. Why don't you take the girls to a picture? Well, it won't take all evening, will it, Hard? Well, there's a lot to go over. No use you three hanging around. You'd much better see a good film. Yes, go ahead, Dolly. It'll take your mind off tomorrow. I want you to. All right, then. I'll bring the car around. Oh, come on, Adele. I can see the legal mind is anxious to get rid of it. <laughs> Good night, Leslie. Good night. Where do we have to go? The Chinese Quarter. Some sort of shop, I believe. I've always wanted to see the Chinese Quarter. I hear it's a bit creepy. Of course, I'd have chosen other circumstances for a visit. Be flippant about your own crimes if you like, but don't be flippant about mine. Oh, I'm sorry, Howard. I didn't mean to be flippant. Really, I didn't. Oh, maybe it's my own sense of guilt... I have an unpleasant feeling that I'll have to pay the piper for what I'm doing tonight. I'm jeopardizing my whole career, and I have to rely on your discretion. Whatever else I am, I'm not ungrateful. Please forget what I said. Leslie, when did you first start doing that lace work? Oh, a few years ago. How did you happen to take it up? I wanted something to do, and it appealed to me. But it must take enormous concentration and patience. I find it soothing. You mean it uh, takes your mind off other things? Is that a legal question? You're not an ordinary client, Leslie. You've been watching me, Howard. I felt it all evening. Trying to read my thoughts. I'm trying to understand you. Why? Because I'm so... so evil. That's it, isn't it? Some time ago, I saw a volcano erupt. An island south of here, Guadi... It had been dormant for years. And then suddenly the crest blew off. It was terrifying and beautiful. Fire turned the sky and the sea crimson. And three villages melted into ashes. Well, it's time we were starting. Ong Chi will be waiting for us. Come in, please, come in. This is the shop of my friend. If you will wait here, I shall return in just a moment. And let's not be too long about it, Ong. I will speak to the lady at once, sir. Well, they seem to have a little of everything to sell here. Yes, most of these shops do. That looks like good jade. And this dagger. See the workmanship on the ivory handle? Imagine all that on a knife. He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes. One against himself. Will you follow me, please? The lady will see you now. Now, where is she? You said she'd be here. She is coming, sir. Well, what is she standing there for? Ask her if she has the letter. Yes, sir. Nego Fung Su Hesama Fung Shung. Il get no yen trigamo. Um, how munque? Il quit trigamo. Mrs. Crosby, I regret, but the veil that you wear over your head, Mrs. Hammond requests that you remove it. Of course. Il quit hang la nishi. Mrs. Crosby, Mrs. Hammond has a further request. She wishes you to walk over to her. Now look here, tell her this is enough. Howard, Howard, it's all right. I don't mind. Ne sang oi function. Ne nun gim hega. Heyunga deha. What does she say? Mrs. Hammer say 
You may have the letter if you will pick it up at half feet. Thank you. Gentlemen of the jury, uh, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Your Honor. The prisoner will please rise and look upon the jury. You find the prisoner at the bar, Leslie Crosby, guilty or not guilty? We find the defendant not guilty. From that day on, I made a solemn vow that I wouldn't make another cocktail until Leslie was acquitted. So if these aren't up to my usual high standards, remember, I'm out of practice. Oh, Dorothy, <laughs> darling, they're wonderful. N n never been better. Robert Crosby, right now you wouldn't know what you were drinking. I guess that's right. I, I can't taste or think or feel. All I can do is keep saying to myself over and over... Leslie's safe. Darling. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, anyone planning to bathe, shower, or sponge before dinner should be getting at it. Well, a shower for me. Oh, I've laid out some things for you, Leslie. Thank you. Darling, I'm going to tidy myself up a bit. No, 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 don't go, Leslie. I shan't see a minute. Well, there's something I particularly want to talk to you about. And, Howard, I want to see you, too. I want your legal opinion. Oh, you do? Well, what's up? Well, I want to get Leslie away from here as quickly as possible. Well, I think a bit of a holiday would do you both good. No, no, I mean for good. But how could we? Well, you can't very well throw up your job. Well, I've got something in view that's much better. It's, it's in Sumatra. We'd be away from everybody, and the only people around us would be Dutch. We'd start a new life. The only thing is that you'd be awfully lonely, darling, at the start. Oh, I wouldn't mind that. I'd like to go, Robert. I don't want to stay here. That settles it, then. I'll go straight ahead, and we can fix things up at once. Is the money as good as here? Well, I hope it'll be better. At all events, I'll be working for myself and not for a company in London. What do you mean? Why should I go on sweating my life out for other people? This plantation belongs to a Malacca Chinese planter who's in financial difficulties, and he's willing to let it go for $30,000 if he can get the money the day after tomorrow. Well, how on earth are you going to raise $30,000, Bob? Well, I've saved about ten, and the bank is willing to let me have the balance on mortgage. Robert, darling, I, I shouldn't like you to take such a risk on my account. I'll be perfectly all right here. Really, I shall. Nonsense, darling. You just said you wanted to go. But I'm not sure it wouldn't be a mistake to run away. Everyone's been so kind, and, and they'll all help to make it easy for us. I do think the thing to do is to stick it out here. Anyhow, Bob, it's not a thing you want to rush into. Let's wait and see. Why should I wait? It's a good thing, and I don't want to lose it. Look, I've got all the papers in my briefcase. I'll go and get them, and you can see for yourself. And I have a couple of photographs of the bungalow to show Leslie. I don't want to see them. Please, Robert. Oh, now, come, darling. That's just nerves. That shows how necessary it is for you to get away. But, Robert, Leslie, I... Leslie, darling, in this case, you must let me have my own way. I won't be a minute. Howard, what are you going to do? What can I do? Oh, don't tell him now. I can't bear any more. You heard what he said, Leslie. He wants the money at once to buy the estate. He can't. He hasn't got it. Oh, give me a little time. I'll pay it back. Leslie, I can't afford to let you have a sum like that. I've mortgaged everything I own. I was glad to advance it, but I... Where is the letter? I have it in my pocket. Oh, it will break his heart. What shall I do? I don't know, Leslie. If I tell him, he'll want to see the letter, of course. Here we are. Well, he's coming. It's up to you, Leslie. Oh, tell him. Tell him and have done with it. Mr. DeMille presents Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price in the final act of The Letter in a moment. Right now, we have a special guest to tell you not about Lux Flakes, but about our boys who have been dishing it out to the Japs and taking it, too. She's Lieutenant Leda Jelinek, an Army nurse stationed at Birmingham General Hospital at Van Nuys, California. I suppose you're quite busy these days, Lieutenant Jelinek. Yes. Many of the casualties from our Pacific campaigns come back here. Boys who've been in tough battles, but they're on the road to recovery now. You know, about 97% of our wounded men live to tell the stories of their adventures. That's certainly a high percentage. Thanks to the quick treatment they get. Drugs administered right on the field give a man a fighting chance even before he gets to the hospital. 
and that's why I'm here tonight. I want to say thank you to you women of America for the used fats you saved, fats that help make many of those medicines, things like sulfur ointments, opiates, and tannic acid for burns. Your used kitchen fats are made into hundreds of military medicines we use every day. We need them desperately now, and will continue to need even more as we carry the attack to the enemy. So, please, keep right on saving used fats and turning them in. The medicines they make will help bring these boys back alive. Thank you, Lieutenant Leda Jelinek. Yes, ladies, every drop of grease from your frying pan or broiler will help make more of those life-saving medicines. So put aside a tin can of any size or shape. Never use glass and pour in every drop of used fat. Don't throw out even a spoonful, no matter how burned or black or smelly it is. Just a tablespoonful a day will add up to a pound a month. And your butcher will give you two meat ration points for each pound, as well as four cents when you turn it in. Within three weeks, it will be ready to be made into life-saving drugs. Remember, your used kitchen fats may save a wounded man's life. Now... Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. After the play, we'll ask Betty Davis about a certain special hobby of hers. But now here's the curtain for the third act of The Letter, starring Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price. Robert Crosby has returned to the room. His thoughts full of plans for the purchase of the new plantation... In silence, Leslie and Joyce watch Robert, who is brimming over with enthusiasm as he arranges the papers on his desk. This is really a handsome estate. We'll be stealing it for 30000 Bob, I don't like to throw cold water on your plans, but hasn't it struck you that the costs of, of well, of what we've been through will be pretty heavy? Costs? Oh, yes, the uh, legal expenses. Oh, no, I'm not going to charge you anything for my own services. But there are certain out-of-pocket expenses. Oh, that's awfully decent of you. I'm not sure I can accept that. But uh, what, what do these other expenses amount to? Well, the principal item is that uh, that letter of Leslie's I mentioned to you. Oh, yes, yes, I'd almost forgotten. You were going to... I had to pay a great deal of money for it. Well, if you thought it necessary, I'm not going to grouse. How much was it? Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars? Why, well, you must have been mad. You may be quite sure, Bob, I wouldn't have given that if I could have got it for less. But that, that's every cent I have in the world. Why didn't you let them bring the letter in and explain it to, to the jury? I didn't dare. Do you mean it was absolutely necessary to suppress it? If you wanted Leslie acquitted. But what, what was there in the letter? I told you at the time. It was very stupid of me, Robert. I, I remember now. You wrote to Hammond to ask him to come to the bungalow. Yes. You wanted to uh, get something for me, didn't you? Yes, I wanted to get you a gun. He knew all about that sort of thing, and, and you know how ignorant I am. Buying that letter was a criminal offense, wasn't it? Well, it's not the sort of thing a respectable lawyer does in the ordinary way of business. It was a criminal offense. Yes, it was. I might be disbarred for it. Then why did you do it, you of all people? What were you trying to save me from? Leslie, you knew I was buying a gun from Cameron. Why did you want to make me a present of another? Well, how should I know you were going to buy a gun? Because I told you. Well, I'd forgotten. I can't remember everything. You hadn't forgotten that. What do you mean, Robert? Why are you talking to me like this? Who has the letter now? I have. Where is it? Bob, it's not your letter or mine. I've got to pay $10,000 for that letter. I'm going to see it. Let him see it. Thank you. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No, you couldn't. We'd been in love for years. It's not true. I used to meet him constantly, once or twice a week. Every time we met, I hated myself for it. It was horrible. I loathed myself. I was like a person who was ill. Then came a time about a year ago when he began to change toward me. Oh, I didn't know what was the matter. I was frantic. I made scenes. I threw myself at his feet. Leslie. Then I heard about that, about that native woman. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. At last I saw her. I saw her walking in the village with those hideous spangles and that chalky face and her eyes like a cobra's eyes. I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. You've read the letter. Oh, we'd always been so careful about writing before, but this time I didn't care. I hadn't seen him for ten days. He came, and I told him I knew about his marriage. Oh, at first he denied it. I was 
frantic. I don't know what I said to him. I hated him because he'd made me despise myself. I insulted him. I cursed him. At last he turned on me. He told me he was sick and tired of me. But it was true about the other woman, that she was the only one who really meant anything to him. He said he was glad I knew, because now I'd leave him alone. I knew that if he went out that door, I'd never see him again. I hardly know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired. He gave a cry, and I saw it hit him. I ran after him, and I fired and fired and fired until there were no more cartridges. That's what happened. And I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. How could you do this? How could you? I'm sorry, I shouldn't let myself go. I, I've got to think. Leslie. Well? He's going to forgive you. Yes. He's going to forgive me. And the fifth couple of the Prescott. Oh, yes, Robert's told me about them. Oh, you'll adore them, Leslie. Well, now, both of you get a good sleep because it'll be a late party. Good night. Good night, Dorothy. Good night. It's lucky you brought your dinner coat, Robert. You hardly fit in one of Howard's. Now, let's see what else you'll need. Oh, well, how about your studs? They're, oh, they're probably still in the bureau at home. Home. Robert, it's no use, is it? We can't make it go, can we? I don't know. I'm not sure. Robert, you're so kind and so generous. You should have had the sort of wife you really deserve. Through no fault of yours, I've failed you. Wrecked your life. I can't ask you to forgive me. If you love a person, you can forgive anything. But what about you? Can you go on? I'll try. I'll really try. That's not what I'm asking. I'll do everything to make you happy. Everything in my power. That isn't enough. Unless, Leslie, now, this minute, do you love me? Yes, I do. Kiss me, then. Kiss me as if... Rob. No. No, I can't. I can't. Leslie, I can't. tell me, Leslie, what is it? With all my heart, I still love the man I killed. Leslie? Leslie, let me in. My dear, they're all waiting for you. This is your party, you know. I'm sorry, Dorothy. I took rather long to dress. Why, Leslie, isn't that your lace work? Yes. Were you working on it just now? A little. I'm anxious to finish it. Oh, Leslie, please come downstairs. Of course, dear. In a few minutes. Very well. When did you first start doing that lace work, Leslie? I find it soothing. You mean it takes your mind off other things? I couldn't give him up. I sent for him. At last he turned on me. He was sick and tired of me. She was the only one who meant anything to him. She was the only one. I hardly know what happened. I seized the revolver and fired. Fired and fired and fired until there were no more cartridges. I have no excuse for myself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to... Who's out there? Who is it? You, I see you there. Mr. Crosby. Come here. What are you doing out there? I don't want to come. She make me come. She tell me I come here. She? Missy Hammond. She tell me I come here. Bring dagger. Leave it outside window. Of course. Mrs. Hammond. Dagger, Missy. She say bring dagger to you. She's here, then. Yes, Missy Hammond on path by gate. You no go in garden, Missy Crosby. She kill you. She wait there. That is what dagger mean. She kill you, you go in garden. Missy, you know till police I come? Missy, you know till police I come? Dagger, see the workmanship on the ivory handle. Imagine all that on a knife. 
He who kills with an unworthy tool commits two crimes, one against himself. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. I don't deserve to live. Leslie. Leslie. Yes? Leslie, you've got to do something about Robert. He's acting very strangely. What is it? I don't know. At first I thought he was drunk, but it's worse than that. I'll be right down. But where will you ship from, Crosby? Oh, it's near a good harbor, only five, six miles away. And I can ship my rubber for less money, or to get ahead fast. In ten, fifteen years, I can live in London, travel, do anything I please. Robert, will you come with me, darling, please? Not now, darling. Maybe later. I'm telling the boys about my new plantation. Sounds like quite a place. Of course, we'll miss Singapore. Our friends are here, and we've had some mighty fine times. No English people in that part of Sumatra, only Dutch and natives. Going to be a little lonely at first, maybe, but we'll get used to it. Robert. There'll just be the two of us. But my my wife's a good sport. Always can count on her. She's not afraid of anything. And we'll have each other. That's the important stop thing. Stop it, stop, stop it. I can't stand anymore. I can't stand it. Give me a drink. I want a drink. Oh, I don't understand. Where is Leslie? She ran out into the garden. The garden? Oh, I'll find her. No, let her alone. There's nothing you can do for her. You no go in garden. She kill you. You go in garden, Missy. See the workmanship on the ivory handle. She kill you. I couldn't give him up. I said for him. Robert will be away. I absolutely must see you. I couldn't give him up. What does this mean? It means that I was in love with Jeff Hammond. That's not true. It means I was in love with Jeff Hammond. No. We'd been in love for years. We'd been in love for years. We'd been in love for years. Mr. Crosby, go back. Go back. Oh! You killed her. You killed her. Kui Ying say. Who is that? Don't move. The police. The police. Don't move. I will shoot. What do you do here? I do nothing. I tell her no go into garden. I tell her. This woman, she, she is dead. Kui Ying say. In order, say Kui. She, she, she kill her. It was right she die. Leslie. 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 Our stars will return for a curtain call in just a moment. Meantime, we take you to a home, almost anywhere, and a mother who might be almost anyone. Mrs. Thompson is in her kitchen, and she's getting ready to do her dinner dishes. There. All scraped and rinsed. Now, why, that's funny. I know it was here when I did the luncheon dishes. Now, where did I put it? Not on the table. The closet. Hmm. I know I haven't used it all. A box lasts me practically a month. Well, I suppose I could use the laundry soap. But it takes forever to make suds. Besides, it's hard on my hands. Alice! Oh, Alice! Do you know what happened to the box of Lux Flakes I keep here on the drain board? Oh, well, you bring it right down this minute. I need it for the dishes. Well, do your sweater later, dear. I have to have it now. Yes, I'll have to get a box for the bathroom when I go to the store tomorrow. The man said he expected more this week. I hate to be caught without Lux. I know what those strong soaps do to my hands. Women everywhere say that once you've used Lux for dishes, you'll never want to use a strong soap again. Lux leaves hands so soft and lovely. Even if they're red and rough from using harsh soaps, just changing to gentle Lux Flakes will take away that dishpan look, make them smooth and attractive again. And Lux is thrifty. You can change dishpan hands to Lux hands 
for less than a penny a day. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. A curtain call is one of the oldest traditions in the theater. I don't believe it's, it's ever been better earned than tonight. And coming back to the footlights now are Betty Davis, Herbert Marshall, and Vincent Price. It's a pleasure to be back, Mr. DeMille. I'd like to thank all the people in the cast for their excellent work tonight. Now, to most of us, Betty, your, your name stands for fine artistry in the theater. But I think that when this war is over, many, many thousands of soldiers will remember you for another reason. That being the Hollywood canteen which Betty started. I've seen the canteen in action, and it's a very fine thing to be remembered for. So that we can keep the record straight, let's give mm. credit to the right people. There were really more than 6,000 who worked together in a team to make the canteen possible. I still say you coached that team, Betty. How many boys have visited the canteen, Betty? Well, I believe about a million and a half, Vincent, many of whom greatly admired Bart Marshall's work as a bust boy. You know, I've, uh, I've often wondered what the fellows talk about when they wander over to the snack bar to see you or Irene Dunn or Eddie Lamar. Well, I remember one boy who paid me a very nice compliment. Hiya, Rosie, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stand you on the screen, but you're certainly sweetness and light around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's quite a tribute to your acting, Betty. <laughs> Have you picked a play for next week yet, Mr. DeMille? Yes. And it's a roaring drama of the West. Republic's current screen hit in old Oklahoma. And our stars will be Roy Rogers, Martha Scott, and Alba Decker. It's the story of a, of a girl and a cowboy who discover romance as well as oil in the rich land of Oklahoma. And besides a thrilling drama, we'll also have the songs of Hollywood's great cowboy star, Roy Rogers. Very exciting evening, C.B. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Any theater should be thankful for players like you three. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Martha Scott... Roy Rogers and Albert Decker in in Old Oklahoma. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This week, all America salutes those women who are working in war useful jobs. Women must get into the war with their hands as well as their hearts until victory is finally won. Betty Davis has just finished the picture of Mrs. Skeffington at Warner Brothers and is currently seen in Old Acquaintance. Herbert Marshall appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Vincent Price is currently seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, The Song of Bernadette. The Warner Brothers screenplay of the letter was written by Howard Koch. Heard in tonight's play were Charlie Lung as Ong Chi, B. Benaderet as Chinese Woman, Richard Davis as Withers, and Frederick Warlock, Alex Havier, Regina Wallace, Paula Winslow, Joe Gilbert, Eric Snowden, and Charles Seal. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Martha Scott, Roy Rogers, and Albert Decker in the play... In old Oklahoma. Listen, everybody. Free vitamins for you and every member of your family. Your druggist will hand you a regular 50-cent package of famous Vims free with every large economy-sized Vims you buy. A $2 and a quarter value for $1.69. Remember, Vims are vitamin complete. Have vitally needed minerals, too. Complete satisfaction with Vims or your money back. The offer is limited, so hurry to your druggist. Don't wait. Get your free Vims. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. It's summer, a late afternoon. 
At a wharf on Cape Cod, a young man in a small cabin cruiser is about to cast off for an island several miles offshore. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon, but are you going to the island tonight? I missed the steamer. Well, that'll teach you not to be late. Besides, you don't take passengers. This is a government boat. Oh, I'd be very indebted to you. My cousin's expecting me. I promise I won't be any trouble. Can't you see I'm full up with supplies? Well, I'm not very large. Well, Come on. Oh, thank you. Hey, just put your bags over there. Thank you. I've never been to the island before. How long a trip is it? Oh, about two hours. I love the sea. I come by it naturally, I guess. All my ancestors were whalers from Portland. Maine or Oregon? To a Yankee, there's only one Portland. Maine. Welcome to New England, Yankee. Oh, thank you. What have you been doing? You sure have been awful quiet. I've been making a sketch of you. Me? Where? Huh. Hey, that's good. You going to the island to paint? Yes. Uh, the island's a regular hangout for artists. They're always wanting to paint the lighthouse. Eben won't let him near the place. Eben? Uh-huh. Eben Folger, he's the lighthouse keeper on Dragonhead. I'm, um, uh, what you might call his temporary assistant. Oh. Well, there's the island. Have you ashore in ten minutes. I hope your cousin's still there. Am I glad to see you? Oh, you certainly gave me a scare, Kate. Steamer came in and not a sign of you. Oh, I'm sorry, Freddy. I missed it by one minute. Well, car's down here. Oh, incidentally, who was that who brought you across? His name's Bill. Oh? Pat arrived yet? Yes. Freddy, where's Dragonhead? Dragonhead? Well, it's a lighthouse about a mile offshore. Why do you ask that? The Dragonhead launch brought me over. Do you know the keeper? His name's Folger. Oh, dear, I'm sure I don't. Now, tell me what you'd like to do tomorrow, Kate. You can paint... Does he come to the mainland every day? He? Who are you talking about? The lighthouse keeper. Well, of course he does. Oh, I don't know. How do I know what he does? Now, come on, Katie. Come on. Hello? Hello, Mr. Folger. Oh, golly, ain't you got no ears? No visitors, I said. This here's government property. No visitors. If you'd let me explain, Mr. Folger. You get back in your sailboat and get out of here. But there's something in this package that may interest you. Huh? Now, wait a minute. You're the one that stopped me in town yesterday, ain't you? Yes, in Granby's antique shop. Yeah, you're the one who wanted to paint my picture. And I told you if you was to pay me $50,000, I wouldn't be found dead sitting for no Tom Fool portrait. I know you did. And when you left, I bought this. It's a... A ship model, Mr. Folger. Miss Granby told me you're an expert on ship models. Tell her for me to mind her own business. Oh, it's a great imposition, I know, but you see, I know so little about ship models, and I I don't like the idea that I may have been rooked. Won't you look at it, Mr. Folger? Eh, yeah, maybe. Hey, Evan, do you want me to... Well, hello. Why, hello. Say, you the one he brung over in the launch from the mainland? Yes. Now, about that model. Oh, you're pretty smart for a woman. You knowed I wanted this ship model, didn't you? I want to strike a bargain with you. Watch out, Evan. She's a Yankee. You found out I tried to buy this here model. That old lady Granby. Hundred and fifty dollars, she said. By country, that's highway robbery. You can have it for nothing. If you'll pose for me. No. Only an hour a day for two weeks. No. You set the time yourself. He who hesitates is lost, Evan. You're getting too big for your britches, son. All right. You be here each day at four, but no Sundays. Sundays, too. Oh, Sundays then, doggone it. <laughs> He's a tough customer. You're pretty slippery yourself. I know. Well, I... I guess I'd better go. You must be busy. Yes, I... I have a little work to do here. Well, I... I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, Bill. Goodbye, Kate. What's happened to Evan? He's gone into the lighthouse. Then you let him? He says he can't pose if there's a fog and he can't control the axe of God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I haven't any complaints. We've had such wonderful weather all week. Well, let me see the painting. Oh, my, that looks fine, Katie. Oh, thank you. Hey, that... Fog's rolling in fast. You're not going to try to sail back in it, are you? Well, I... Oh, you better stay here for a while. Oh, I'd like that, but... Well, Mr. Folge has never been very hospitable. Oh, that's nonsense. He's got a heart as big as a house. Come on. I've never been at the top of a lighthouse before. Does the fog frighten you? A little. There's something so terribly lonely about it. I don't mind being alone, but I... I don't like to feel lonely. There's a difference, isn't there? You know, I don't mind being alone either. 
fact is, I deliberately took this job to get away from people. I can understand that. But you know, you wouldn't be afraid of that fog if you went right out into it. Come on, let's go down. I'll show you what I mean. I'll take you to a favorite cove of mine. It's like the end of the world. It could end like this. I don't think I'd be frightened, even if it were. Or lonely either. No. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, I knew you'd get over it out here. I wonder what people would do if the world should end like this. Then they'd have time to say all the things they'd always wanted to say. Then they'd have the courage to say them. For instance? Honest things. Such as? Such as telling you that I didn't particularly want to paint Eben's portrait. Then why have you gone to all this trouble? Because I wanted to see you again. Lonely people want friends. But they have to search very hard for them. It's difficult for them to... to find... Other lonely people. Yes. The fog's lifting. It wasn't the end of the world after all. You're the first person I ever brought here. And you know, the one time that I, I wish I could paint is when I'm here. Katie, do you suppose that you could catch all this? Oh, no. No, I'm not nearly a good enough painter. Oh, Bill, you were made for all this. Was I? <laughs> you know, I went to a class reunion this spring. Some of the fellas, they, well, they, they were ribbing me about being stuck way off down here. One of them even offered me a job. I guess he felt kind of sorry for me. Oh, if he only knew how I felt for him. You found your place in the world. I envy you. You know, you're the first person that's understood that. Don't ever give it up. I don't ever want to. I'm through at Dragonhead for a while, Katie. You're going away? Yes, I have to go up to Boston tomorrow to see the superintendent. Oh. Well, it's been lots of fun these past few days. I... I know I've had a wonderful time. I'll miss you, Bill. Oh, Katie. Oh, Bill. Come on, I'll take you over to the island in the speedboat. Thanks for bringing me across, Bill. I I can go the rest of the way myself. No, but I'd like to walk you home. Oh, no, no, it's late and I have a lot of things What's to do. What's the matter? What's the matter? Are you ashamed of me? Oh, no. Huh? <laughs> no, it isn't that at all. You wouldn't be holding that on me now. You haven't got a husband or anything like that, huh? Oh, of course huh? not. <laughs> what an idea. Hmm? Well, good night, Bill. I'll sail your boat back in the morning. Thanks. We could have lunch, maybe, huh? If you'd like. I'll pick you up at the wharf at 12 o'clock. And, oh, Katie, when I go away, it, it won't be for long. I'm glad, Bill. Good night. Good night, Katie. Hello, sis. Pat. I thought I'd wait up for you, Katie. We haven't had a talk for a long time. I've been busy, Pat. Tell me the truth, Katie. That lighthouse keeper isn't old, is he? Yes, he is. He has a beard down to his ankles. Having fun these days, Pat? Bored stiff, frankly. Why don't you go to Hyannis? Your gang's all there. Not trying to get rid of me, are you, Katie? Don't be silly. You know, darling, you're not a very good liar. Now, who is he? Who's what? Pat, you have a one-track mind. All right, don't tell me. What'd you do tonight? I know something's happened to you. You were singing like mad in the shower this morning. And for an elderly lighthouse keeper with a beard down to his ankles, you spend an awfully long time in front of the mirror. I saw the hunky-dory offshore. Does that mean Tom Fraser's in town? Oh, Tom's getting to be a bit of a nuisance. He's a good catch, Pat. Want him? Oh, no. I know my limitations, Pat. I'm dead I'm going to bed. He must be wonderful. Bet you ten dollars I get it out of you. Ten dollars you don't? Such a divine night. No kind of night to be stuck in a house all by yourself. You should have gone out. It's been warm enough to go without a coat. Painting in the dark, dear. <laughs> oh, I wish now I'd double that bet. <laughs> Darling, just so you'll feel better, I will be seeing Tom for the next few days. Lunch on the yacht tomorrow, and heaven knows what from then on. Good night. 
Night, Pat. Hey, Katie, where are you going? Hey, Katie. Well, good morning. Hey, what's the matter? Didn't you see me? Huh? I couldn't have looked very closely, could I? <laughs> For a second there, I thought you'd forgotten all about our luncheon date. Day? Oh, Oh, no. No, I didn't forget. You were walking right past me. Oh, how could you think I'd forget? I'll be right back. I, um, I want to speak to that sailor at the end of the wharf. Oh, sure. Sure, go ahead. Morning, Phil. Morning, Miss Pat. Uh, Phil, will you please tell Mr. Fraser I can't possibly come out for lunch today? Yes, Miss Pat, I'll tell him. Thank you. Tell him I'm dreadfully sorry. You really dolled yourself up today. I always doll myself up when I have a luncheon engagement. I have a wonderful idea. Let's go to the cottage for lunch. Oh, now, wait a minute. You know how you've been about keeping me away from there. It's a woman's privilege to change her mind. Well, well that's just fine. Good. More coffee? No, 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 thanks, Katie. I'm just right. It was a divine night last night, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, it was. Unusual to have it warm enough to go without a coat. That's right. Katie, you got me going around in circles. You know, I don't know if I can quite explain it. But look, you're a swell person. I always knew that. But, well, it, it, it just seems that there was something lacking. Now, maybe I can explain it this way. It's like you were a cake. A cake? Uh-huh. Yeah. A cake without any frosting. And I guess, well, I guess most guys are kind of like the frosting. You know what I mean? And today, you think I'm well frosted. I'll say. <laughs> no, I was never more fooled in my life. <laughs> Katie. Katie, I guess you know that I think you're something special. I'm afraid I think you're something special, too. Well, what I... I really want to say is... Well, what was it you wanted to... Oh. Hello, Katie. You're not seeing things, Bill. It's true. Well, I'll... Be. Hello, Bill. I see you did keep our date for lunch. Well, I, I, I thought I did. <laughs> Look at him, Katie. Bill, if you could only see your face. That, that's very clever. <laughs> Which one of you think these things up? I'm always the one. Katie, I swear I was going to confess, but you came home just a second too soon. Oh, it's lucky for you she did. You were just about to be kissed by a perfect stranger. As you can see, it's very easy to confuse us. Yes. Uh, Katie, your sister here is a very dangerous woman. Well, I better be on my way. I have to catch the four o'clock boat. Will you walk to the gate with me, Katie? Going away? Yes, I'm going to Boston overnight on business. Oh, uh, uh, thanks for the lunch. Uh, Patricia. Uh, Patricia. Bill, Pat, Pat's apt to do crazy things. No, oh, that's all right, Katie. Oh, uh, the Lippincotts are giving an old-fashioned barn dance tomorrow night, and I'll be back in time. Would you like to go with me? I'd love to. All right, I'll pick you up at 8 o'clock. I'll be ready. So long, Katie. So long, Bill. Have a good trip. I'd like to buy a paper bill, but I don't seem to have any change. Well, hello. Hello. Which one is it? You know. Uh, yes, I know. How'd you get here, Pat? Flew over. Lots of people have to go to Boston, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they do. I haven't done a square dance bill since I was a kid. Hope you don't mind if I step all over your feet. No, we'll step on each other's feet, Katie. If you are Katie. I swear by my honor, it's Kate. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> well, here we go. Bill, there's Pat. Huh? Well, so it is. I wonder how she knew about this. Uh, uh, maybe the Lippincotts invited her. But she doesn't know the Lippincotts. Well, maybe I mentioned it to her in Boston. Boston? Yes, I... I didn't, didn't you know that Pat went to Boston yesterday? No, I didn't. Well, well, good evening, Kate, dear. Hello, Freddie. Freddie, this is Bill Emerson, my cousin, Mr. Lindley. Well, how do you do, Mr. Emerson? Pat come with you, Freddie? Yes, yes, she did. She asked me to bring her. This... Uh, Sudden passion for the bucolic life. Hardly her type of thing, is it? Well, Bill, aren't you going to ask me to dance? Well, sure, Pat, sure. I'll be right back, Katie. Well, that was quick work. Katie, let's you and I have a nice cool drink of Applejack, shall we? No, thanks, Freddie. Katie, tell me something. Just where does Pat fit into this jigsaw puzzle? It's a long story, Freddie, and I don't feel like telling it. Excuse me, I think I'll... 
go out and have a cigarette. Katie? Freddie, don't bother about me. Hey, would you like to take a drive, Katie, huh? It's a fine night. Can I get you some coffee, then? You can drink it out here. Oh, for heaven's sake, say something. Katie, if that Bill Emerson means so much, do you fight for him? I can't. Why must you always let that sister of yours get ahead of you? Freddie, take me home. Why, Katie, I thought you'd be asleep. We missed you. Bill looked everywhere for you. Pat, you know I've never been very good at mincing words. What does Bill mean to you? I might as well admit it, Katie. I'm mad about him. And he feels the same way. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. It isn't anybody's fault. Bill's so fond of you, Katie. Over and over he said what a swell person you are and what fun you'd had together. Oh, skip it. Pat, do you know Bill? Do you understand the kind of things he likes? The kind of life he likes? You've never known anybody like him before. When Bill's kind fall in love, they mean it. I know the kind of person Bill is, Katie, and I am mad about him. You must believe me. I believe you. And I wish you all the happiness in the world. You said yourself a minute ago that it wasn't anyone's fault. Go to bed, Pat. Go on before I make a fool of myself. Please. It was just one of those things, Kate's twin sister, Pat, and Bill Emerson. Their meeting, their falling in love, and now, in the sister's spacious home in New York, their marriage. Cousin Freddie has just observed that Kate has slipped away from the wedding guests and gone upstairs to her studio. I thought you were probably in here. I wanted to get away for a few minutes, Freddie. You should go back to the guests. Kate, you've got to forget Forget Pat, Bill, everything. There's nothing you can do about it. I know. I know there's nothing I can do about it. Have you made any plans? I'm going to work to paint. Now you're talking. That's my girl. Hello, hello. Long distance. I was hello, talking... Hello, Kate. Are you still there? Yes, we were cut off, Freddie. But you were saying something about an exhibition. Yes, the Gruen Gallery on Madison Avenue. My oils and watercolors. Are you proud of me? Kate, that's just wonderful. When? Two weeks from tomorrow. Oh, good evening. Good evening. There's one nice feature about art exhibits. What? The buffet table. When the paintings bore you, try the hors d'oeuvre. I intend to fill up before I'm thrown out. Who's going to throw you out? Don't be funny. Look at me, I'm a bum. By any chance, are you also an artist? Enough of one to have an opinion of this exhibition. Oh, then you're a critic as well. You don't have to be a critic to recognize an amateur. Well, most of the people here don't seem to share your opinion. These people? What do you expect them to say? Well, I think I may as well tell you. I painted this collection. I was wondering when you'd confess. How'd you get in? I walked in. I was hungry. What do you do? I paint. But I never had an exhibition, if that's what you're driving at. If you had the opportunity, what would you do? You're making me an offer? I think I'd like to see some of your work, find out whether you're a phony or not. Well, let's get out of here. I'll show you. Now? Now or never. I'll get my coat and meet you outside. Ah, Miss Bosworth, don't you like my room? Don't you like my paintings? Your kind never does. If you'd stop being class conscious for a minute, I'd like to say something. Go ahead. I owe you an apology. You most certainly are not a phony. What shall I do now, bow from the waist? What's your name? Karnak. Now that you've done me the great honor of praising my canvases, I suppose I'll have to start praising yours. Tell me what's wrong with my painting. Everything. Chiefly because you're what you are, stiff, Ingrown, afraid. I bet you're not even a woman. 
I know your kind, a checkbook in one hand and a paintbrush in the other, while someone like me can't even afford a decent pad of drawing paper or a tube of paint. What did you mean? I'm not even a woman. Yeah, that always gets them. You can criticize a woman's work, but when you suggest she's not a ball of fire, oh boy. What are you talking about? Come here, I'll show you. I think I'd better be going. Okay, go. But you're not a hopeless case, you know. How encouraging. Good night, Mr. Connor. All right, Connor. What happened this time? Why did Deirdre quit? She's the best model we've had. Because I happen to speak my mind about you and about the way you paint. Connor, I think it's time we settled a few things. You're most welcome to use this studio, you know that. But not if you continually upset everything and everybody in my home. First the servants, now Deirdre. Okay, go on with your smug little life if you want to, but you can count me out. Oh, stop being such a pig-headed boor. I'm perfectly willing to allow you to humiliate me as regards my work. I want it that way, but not as a person. Nor will I allow you to humiliate anybody else as long as you're in this house. Oh, go soak your head. Come on, let's get to work. Go and get your think. Hello, yes? Oh, Bill. Well, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Pat with you? Oh, I see. Why, yes, of course I can. Oh, don't be silly. You're not interfering with anything. No, I can be there in no time, Bill. Yes, I will. Goodbye, Bill. You can be where in no time? The calls department store. I thought we were going to work. Tomorrow, Connor. Tomorrow. Bill, it seems forever since I've seen you. It has been a long time, hasn't it? How's Pat? Oh, she's fine. Why'd you want to meet me here? Well, I uh, had so little time, and I want to get a birthday present for Pat. I thought you might be able to help me. Oh, I see. Well... What about lingerie or a, or a negligee? Oh, sure, that's fine. They're over this way, Bill. What are you doing in New York? Uh, making arrangements to take a trip to Chile. Oh, for a Yankee, that's a far cry in New England to Chile. That's right. A new job? Uh-huh. Pat going with you? Yes, uh, yes, she is. You remember my telling you about uh, a job my college friend offered me? Yes. Yes, I remember very well. Well, I finally took it. It's even more money than I thought. I can't think of you away from the island somehow. Well, I had to do something to make more dough. I can't let Pat go on spending her own money. Oh. Here's a negligee, Bill. It looks like Pat. May I help you, madam? Hold it up to you, will you, Katie? Oh, it's a wonderful style for you, madam. Well, am I a prize dope? What's the matter? Well, if it's Pat's birthday tomorrow, it's yours, too. Of course. Well, I'd like to get you something, Katie. Uh, oh, that's sweet of you, Bill. No, thank you. Oh, but there must be something here you'd no, like. No, no. Thank you very much. Are you taking the negligee, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, oh, we'll wrap it as a gift, eh? Yes, sir. You know, I'm surprising Pat. She doesn't expect me till Thursday, but I, I want to be there for her birthday. Oh, Bill, how stupid of me. I completely forgot I have an engagement. I must run oh, Wouldn't you have time for a drink before I catch the train? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I really have Well, uh, well... It's been wonderful seeing you again, Katie. Wonderful to see you. And thanks a lot for helping me out. Oh, it was fun. Goodbye, Bill. Give my love to Pat. Hana, haven't you gone home yet? Where have you been? Kind of late. Oh, I went to a newsreel. I walked around the lake in the park. Who's this guy, Bill? Where is he? Gone. You look awful. Can I fix your drink? No, thanks, Connor. You know... I've been doing a lot of thinking. All this art stuff's been a substitute for something, hasn't it? You'll be glad to know, Carnock, I've come to a decision. Hmm? I'm a third-rate artist. I always will be. So you won't have to bother with me anymore. What are you going to do? I don't know. I haven't decided. Always running away. No wonder you lost him. We won't discuss it, Connor. You'll never land a guy all closed up inside like this. But I wasn't always like this. People change. Remember what I said when I first met you? I most certainly do. You kind of went for me then, only you got cold feet. Connor, your conceit really amazes me at times. Man needs woman. Woman needs man. That's basic. Everything else starts from that. Art, music, the whole works. Only women like you want to make something important out of it. You want a guy to stifle himself for you, the grand passion, all of that baloney. Yes, we do. Now, don't go female on me. Get wise to yourself. Oh, leave me alone. Sure you're not running away from me now? Really? That's better. What's the matter? 
Would you like being kissed? I'm sorry, Clark. I guess it is the grand passion or nothing. Connick, I think I'll go to the island in the morning and try and figure things out. Hello? This is Western Union. We have a telegram for Frederick Lindley. I'm sorry, but Mr. Lindley isn't here. May I take the message, please? It's from New York City. Arriving this evening, don't bother to meet me. Love, it's signed Kate. Oh, thank you very much. Dad, what are you doing on the island? I thought you and Bill were on your way to Chile. I wasn't able to go. He went alone. Where's Freddie? He got my wire, didn't he? Freddie had to go to Providence for a few days. Oh, I didn't know. You look tired, Katie. Anything wrong? Nothing in particular. Pat, why couldn't you go to Chile? Oh, I had a perfectly dreadful cold, something like the flu. What a shame. Bill was so excited about your going. Bill so naive about a lot of things. But that's Bill. Naivete is a bit trying to live with all the time. Katie, you haven't said a word about my dungarees. I'm getting to be a big outdoors girl now, learning to sail, all that sort of nonsense. That I want to see. I'll prove it to you tomorrow. We can sail out towards Dragonhead, your old stamping ground. Take off your hat, Katie, and stay a while. I'm coming about, Katie. Well, what do you think of your new skipper? She's all right. Pat, whatever possessed you to come down here? Oh, I wanted to see the gang again. Pat, it looks as if we were going into some heavy weather. That's wonderful. Hey, look out, Katie. I'm going to jive. Pat, it looks really nasty. We better turn back. Not on your life. I've always wanted to sail in a storm. Katie, you were right. We should have gone back. It's too late now. All we can do is hope to get in Lee of the lighthouse. Watch it, Pat. Oh, I should have insisted we go back. You manage the rudder, Pat. I'll handle the sail. Hang on, Pat. Katie, we're heading straight for the rain. I'm no pulling back. Lee wouldn't hang on. No, Pat, no. Don't stand up. Get down. Get down to the bottom of the boat. <laughs> Hello. Hello, police headquarters. This is Evan Fold, your Dragonhead Lighthouse. You better get over here as soon as you can. There's been a drowning. A girl named Kate Boswell. I pulled her sister out. The other is a goner. Yeah, and bring a doctor with you. I think the doctor's still inside with Mrs. Emerson. She'll be coming out of that sedative soon. I'll need all the facts for the police record, so suppose you... I told tell... you all the facts. I looked out, and there was the boat heading for the rocks. Sail was all torn to shreds. Could you see which one of them was handling the boat? How could I tell in a sea like that? I couldn't tell them apart anyways. When you got out to them, were you able to see the body of the other one, or was it under the boat? I never did see the body. Coast Guard ain't found it yet either. They never will. Mrs. Emerson. Mrs. Emerson. It's all right, Mrs. Emerson. I'm Dr. Knowles from the village. Mrs. Emerson. Mrs. Emerson. Mrs. Emerson. Mrs. Emerson. Why does he call me Mrs. Emerson? Bill. 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 She's opened her eyes. She's coming around. Oh. oh. There. There, Mrs. Emerson. Everything's all right. We just want you to keep very warm and quiet. I tried to pull her back. I tried. We know, Mrs. Emerson. Evan saw you. He knows you did everything you could. No. I'm the police chief, Mrs. Emerson. Now, your sister came up to visit you yesterday, didn't she? I... I don't... She's confused. Don't you bother her with that stuff now. Mrs. Emerson, ever since it happened, you've been lying here crying for Bill over and over again. You keep saying... I tried to save her. Well, Bill ain't going to blame you, Mrs. Emerson. If the good Lord had wanted to take you instead of her, why, he'd have done it. So you get well and strong now, Mrs. Emerson, and be a good wife to Bill. 
she'd have wanted it that way. Evan, Mr. Lindley's come. Yeah. It's your cousin, Mrs. Emerson. He's come to see you. Thank you. I won't talk to you very long, dear. I don't want to tire you. Can you understand me, Pat? Yeah, dear. Bill is coming home. He just answered my wire. He arrives in New York by plane Friday. By plane on Friday. Oh, Bill. Bill. <laughs> Three days ago, Patricia Emerson was drowned off Dragonhead Lighthouse, and her body never recovered. But as far as the world is concerned, the girl lost in the storm was Kate. Motivated by her love for Bill, overcome by the temptation to be his wife, Kate has assumed her dead sister's identity. At her home in New York, she and Freddie have just returned from the airport. With them is Bill Emerson. You really shouldn't have bothered going to the airport, Pat. Oh, of course I'd meet you, Bill. Don't be silly. You know, you've hardly said a word. Well, there's not much to say. I'm terribly sorry about Kate. I hope you don't mind if we stay here a few days so I could, you know, straighten out some of the things. Oh, I prefer to stay. I've got some work to do here in New York. I think we could all do with a drink. Freddy? Uh, no, not for me, Pat. I have an appointment. Oh, but you simply can't leave us. I'll drop around tomorrow. You're being frightfully unsocial, Freddy. Goodbye, Bill. I... Call me if there's anything I can do. Thanks a lot for your help, Freddy. This really hit him, didn't it? I know just how it feels. It's very strange for me without Kate. Would you like a scotch? You know I drink bourbon, Pat. Oh, yes, of course. Kate is gone, but, you know, somehow I, I just can't believe it. I didn't know she meant so much to you. We were very good friends. That doesn't mean that I was in love with her. She knew that. How do you know? Oh, well, she... She told me just before the wedding... Bill, I'm so glad you're back. There's nothing any different between us, Pat. I, I came back only because of Kate's death. As soon as you... Why, the astonishment. Now, don't try to pretend that you've forgotten. Oh, no. No, of course I, I haven't forgotten. I I only thought that perhaps... I know you've been through a lot. That's why I didn't go directly to a hotel. It's unfortunate that the accident happened at this time, but I think that just as soon as you get Kate's affairs wound up, you'd better go to Reno and get it over. Reno? Pat, it was your idea as much as mine. Oh, yes, of course. It's just... Bill. Bill, would you mind very much if I went to Boston tonight? I I could come back later and straighten out Kate's things. If you'd prefer. And, and Bill. Yes? Could we let this divorce business ride for a while? I, I can't seem to think about it right now. What's there left to think about? I want another chance. Do you think you deserve one? Oh, maybe not, but I want it. Well, that's the first honest thing you've said in months. Let me try. All right, Pat. You'll probably change your mind when you get to Boston, but in the meantime, we'll let it go at that. Thank you, Bill. How long will you stay in New York? Oh, I don't know. Two, three days. Uh... Be sure and wire me when you're coming. I, I'd like to have everything ready for you. Yes. Uh, yes, I'll wire you. What? Your ticket, miss. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Thank you. Ticket, please. Boston. I'm going to Boston. To Pat's home. How will I know? Little things, what rooms there are. What Pat used to do. And the servants. I don't even know their names. I must be out of my mind. And for what? Bill's going to leave me. What did Pat do to me? What did she do? Hello? Hello? Is that you, Mrs. Emerson? Uh, yes. Who is this, please? Why, Lucy, ma'am. Lucy? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Lucy. I didn't recognize your voice. I, I'm in Boston, Lucy. I just got in and I'm at the station. Yes, ma'am. Are you coming straight home? Uh, yes, I'll take a cab. I, I thought I'd call you first. Mr. Talbot phone. Uh, well, th thank you, Lucy. I'll be home in a few minutes. I certainly didn't expect you back so soon, Mrs. Emerson. Uh, Mr. Emerson will be home by the end of the week. Oh, for heaven's sake. I thought he'd be in Chile for three months. Lucy, I think I'll go right to my room. I, I have a headache. Oh. You'd better take my bag up. What are you waiting for, Lucy? I thought you said you were going up. Well, I, I, I am. I, 
I just want to see what this mail is. Yes, ma'am. I wouldn't bother about unpacking tonight. Lucy, just put the bag on the bed. Well, I guess the mail can wait. Mr. and Mrs. Devereaux called. Oh? They're leaving tomorrow. Well, I, I'll call them later. <laughs> You're looking things over, aren't you, Mrs. Emerson? I'm sure glad I kept everything dusted. And the house looks very nice, Lucy. Those roses on your dressing table. I thought you might like them there. Mr. Talbot sent them. Thank you, Lucy. He's been calling every day. I didn't think you'd mind if I told him you were coming home. That'll be all, Lucy. Don't you want me to call him? What? Mr. Talbot. He said he'd be there all evening. Uh, well, I'll attend to it later. But he's moved. He said to tell you he finally found an apartment. The Empire House. Apartment 326. Thank you. What about Alma? I'd better let Alma know you're home. Well, couldn't that wait, too? Well, it can if you want, Mrs. Emerson. But if you knew my cooking as well as I do, you'd tell Alma to be here first thing tomorrow morning. Oh, of course, tell her to be here. Yes, ma'am. Good night, Mrs. Emerson. Good night, Lucy. Oh, Bill. Bill. Who is this Talbot? Is that what Pat did to me? Who's the telegram from, ma'am? Mr. Talbot? I just figured since you won't talk to him on the phone, maybe he wired you. Lucy, Mr. Emerson will be home this afternoon. Here's your coffee, Bill. Oh, uh, help yourself to cream and sugar. Thank you. And here, your tobacco. Isn't Alma the world's best cook? We're lucky to have her. Look, Pat, I, I know all this is as difficult for you as it is for me. Oh, but it isn't, Bill. I love being here with you. You do believe that, don't you? I want to. You know that. What about Talbot? Have you seen him? No. Surely you must realize that that's the most important thing to get straight between us. I don't want to see him. Don't you think you owe it to him to tell him that it's all over? Oh, perhaps it isn't over. Oh, yes, it is, Bill. I swear it. He's telephoned and sent me flowers, but I haven't acknowledged them. I, Well, I thought that was the very best way to handle it. Pat, until you get this Talbot thing straightened out once and for all, there isn't anything more we can say to each other. Oh, Bill. Empire House. Apartment 326. Pat. Hello, Jim. Well, come in, darling, come in. Martini? No, thank you. I don't believe I feel like one. Jim, I know I should have called you. Yes, Lucy told me Bill was back. I must say I was surprised, considering everything. He came back today. And just where does that put me? I have something to tell you, Jim. I find out I'm still in love with Bill. I'm sorry. That's perfect. You mess up my life when you say you're sorry. I happen to have arranged to divorce my wife for your sake. I suppose it never occurred to you that someone could say a thing and mean it. There's something behind all this, Pat. What is it? No, no, there isn't. You must believe that. I'm in love with Bill. I always will be. But you can't mean this after all we've meant to each other. So it was just an interlude with you. Yes, that's what it was. You dirty little double-crosser. You're doing to me what you did with all the others, aren't you? The others? You didn't think I knew about them, but things get around, Pat. You're not a very discreet person. Oh, I wish... Get out. Get out! Why the suitcase? I'm leaving, Bill. May I ask why? You were right. It wouldn't have worked out. I should have known it wouldn't. You've seen Talbot. And you're still in love with him, is that it? Oh, no. No, it isn't. Well, if you're not still in love with him, then why are you leaving? Bill, you can't want me to stay, can you? Not after... You said the only thing to be straightened out between us was the Talbot business. But what about the others? Much worse. Surely you knew about them. If you didn't, you were a fool. Don't you know you've been the laughing stock of this whole town? I don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> All right, my dear. As soon as I got you... Patty, I hope I won't be a nuisance. Don't talk like that, ever. Now, sit down. While you were unpacking, I made some tea. You look as if you needed it. Freddie, I don't know what to say. I had... I had so many things to tell you. You see, I've left Bill. 
Oh, that isn't what I wanted to say at all. Freddie, if I were to now, tell you... Wait a you... minute. I think I know what you want to tell me, Kate. How long did you know? Well, I suspected just after the accident. But I tried to put such thoughts out of my mind. And then when you called and said you were coming here to the island, of course I knew... It's absolutely unbelievable that you would do such a thing. But it seemed my only chance for happiness. But you were never a liar, Kate. How could you think you could live a lie? I didn't think. I just let it happen. Oh, it was so simple at first. It wasn't going to hurt anybody. But after I found out how Pat had treated Bill, I... Well, I couldn't go through with it. She'd hurt him so terribly that he'll never forget. And no matter what I try to do, it will always be there. What are you going to do? I don't know. I want to do what will hurt Bill the least. To a man like Bill, the truth is the only way. Freddie, would you forgive me if I went out for a while? Certainly. You see, Freddie, Bill never loved me. Bill. Bill. I've never brought anyone here before, Katie. Oh, tell me what to do. Tell me. The one time that I wish I could paint is when I'm here. Oh, Katie, do you suppose that you could catch this? What should I do? What should I do? Katie. Katie. Oh, I knew I'd find you here, Katie. Bill, then you know. Yes, I know. I can't even ask you to forgive me. I don't want you to ask me anything. I don't want you to tell me anything. Oh, Bill. Bill. I'm the one who needs forgiveness, Katie. Oh, yes, I fell in love with Pat, but it was never right. Not the way we were always right for each other. I've known that for so long. Oh, but all that happened. We'll forget it, Katie. We'll forget everything that happened as though we never left the island. Can you do that? Yes. Oh, Katie, I love you so. I love you so much. The Lux Radio Theater presents Betty Davis and Joel McRae in Forsaking All Others. Lux presents Hollywood. We're always glad, ladies and gentlemen, to hear how you like our program. We enjoy your letters. And when you tell us of your purchases of Lux toilet soap as an indication of your appreciation, we're delighted. It is your enthusiasm for our products that makes this program possible. Starred tonight are Betty Davis, Joel McRae, Anderson Lawler, and Leona Miracle. Miss Kathleen Coglin of Paramount Studios is also here to tell us about fan magazines and the stars. Louis Silvers conducts our orchestra. And opening our program is your host and producer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Her mother called her Ruth Elizabeth. Her childhood companions called her clothes hanger. And the world calls her Bet, but should call her Betty Davis. One of the most engaging and talented dramatic actresses in pictures, she has large blue eyes, blonde hair, and weighs 105 pounds. She likes to knit. And has been a wizard in the kitchen ever since she won first prize for her coconut cookies in a contest sponsored by the New York Public Schools. Given her first opportunity on the stage, she almost ruined her chances by catching measles. But Hollywood sent for her in haste and dropped her in haste. Then, when she was actually leaving for New York, recalled her and gave her another chance. For Warner Brothers, she made one of the oddest screen tests on record. She had to show the studio how she could handle a fervent kissing scene, but they wouldn't furnish a man for demonstration purposes. 
So she kissed the air with such a sincerity that it won her the part. She's played a southern girl before, on both stage and screen. But she learned the accent all over again, this time with the Louisiana flavor for her new film, Jezebel, in which, for the first time in pictures, she sings. To her, a good part is more important than a sympathetic one. Tonight, we present this distinguished young actress in another fine role, that of Mary Clay in Forsaking All Others, the stage and screen hit by Edward Roberts and Frank Cavett. Co-starred with Miss Davis is Joel McRae, whose latest hit is the current Paramount picture, Wells Fargo. In the film, Joel rides the mail. In real life, he rides the range. Joel's home is far out in the San Fernando Valley, a thousand-acre tract, where with his uh, wife, he, Francis D., he spends his time between pictures raising cattle and horses. Joel is no pseudo-cowboy. Drive by his ranch, and you'll see him in dusty overalls rounding up the doggies with as much precision as the sombreroed horsemen who call him boss. Joel lays aside his shafts and spurs, however, and comes to us tonight in the role of Jefferson Tingle. Anderson Lawler, who created the part on Broadway, is Dylan Todd, and Leona Maracle plays Constance Barnes. Now for the play. The Lux Radio Theater presents Betty Davis and Joel McRae in Forsaking All Others. Park Avenue in New York City. A taxi cab darts in and out of the afternoon traffic, clicks hubcaps with a park limousine, and swerves to a screeching stop in front of a red light. <laughs> Jeff Tingle, in the back seat of the taxi cab, leans forward and taps politely on the window. Oh, driver. Yeah? You know, I didn't think you were going to make that. Huh, I didn't need it for a minute. Pretty good brakes on each of your cabs, though. They always work, I suppose. Oh, sure. Hey, you uh, ain't nervous, are you? Oh, no, no, I wouldn't care for myself. But there's a lady back here who's going to be married tomorrow. If it's all the same to you, she'd like to be married without splints. <laughs> I get it. Congratulations. Thank you. Very neatly put, Mr. Tingle. I thought so myself. I'm sure the driver thinks it's you I'm marrying. No. Of course he does. Maybe I'd better tell him. <laughs> Do you think he could stand it? I don't know. Probably better than I can. Jeff, you haven't a secret sorrow, have you? Tell me about it. Well, I'm the old-fashioned type, I guess, but I don't believe in the groom's best friend going shopping with the bride-to-be. You know, I've always felt that the best man shouldn't even see the bride until they meet at the altar. Is that all? I thought you were going to confess you've been hiding a secret love for me. No, no, I couldn't do that. Have a secret love for me? That's a leading question I refuse to answer. I'm disappointed. Think how dramatic it would be. Mary, I have been silent long enough, but now on the eve of your wedding to Dylan Todd, I must tell you, I love you. And I hope you'll be very, very happy. Oh, Jeff Tingle, why didn't you speak sooner? I couldn't. I had laryngitis. <laughs> You're happy, aren't you, Mary? Very. Good girl. Well... This is it. You're coming up, aren't you? Well, I thought I might get back to the office. Oh, come on. Everybody will be there. I invited the whole crowd. All right, go ahead. I'll see you upstairs. I'll leave the door open for you. What's the tariff, Chief? It's a dollar twenty. Lady sure looks happy, don't she? Uh-huh. Yeah, great stuff, this in marriage business. I got two kids myself. Oh, is that so? Yeah. You sure got a nice girl. Well, that's nice of you to say so. Lonesome Tingle, they call me. Always a best man, but never a groom. Which is, uh, huh? You can keep the chain. What is the guy's school? Hello? Hello, is this... Oh, hello, Miss Kramer. This is Mr. Tingle. Everything all right down at the office? Ah, uh, it's fine. Say, did anybody I know buy or sell anything today? Oh, well. Thanks, Miss Kramer. I don't know what I'd do without you. Jeff, Jeff. Uh, Just a minute, Paula. You take care of the flowers. What? All right, Miss Kramer. Goodbye. What's the matter, Paula? What about the flowers for the church? It's all attended to. You worry too much. Well, I can't help it. No one else around here seems to bother about a thing. I was a friend of Mary's mother. I'm just trying to do my duty to her as if she were my own little girl. Who, Mary's mother? Why not? Oh, some people, Jeff Tingle, make a wedding very difficult to manage. Well, personally, I like the way Mary's managing her wedding. I think I'll let her manage mine. Jeff, Jeff, look at this. Hello, Dottie. In the newspaper, look, it's Constance Barnes. What? What about it? Uh, anything wrong? What's the matter, Dottie? Constance Barnes. She's back from Europe. Listen. Also included in the first cabin list. 
were the so-and-sos, the empty poop, and Miss Constance Barnes. She docked this morning. Well, the woman has a right to come and go. You, you needn't get so excited about Constance Barnes. Mary might. Mary knows all about her. Who is she? Nobody. Take my word for it. She's somebody. Take my word for it. Well, hardly a person to consider at this particular time. Everybody knows that little story is ended. Ended happily with no hard feelings. Now, I, I think we needn't say anything to Mary about it. Say what, Paula? Oh, oh well, well, nothing, Mary. I... No, nothing. She'll probably find out anyway. Oh, Dottie Winters, I'll wring your neck. can I find out? What are you talking about, Jeff? Connie Barnes is back. Got in today. It's in the paper. My right. The dark lady in Dylan Todd's life. Well, I don't think it's so funny. Oh, Paula, you poor dear. Why, I'm very proud of her. Oh, you're not fooling me, Mary. You don't like her. You can't. I don't know her. But she is a definite proof of Dill's importance. If Dill had to be led around by his distinguished nose for a while, I'm glad the lady was as elegant as she is. Now, you make Dill toe the line. And no more nonsense about admiring women who steal other women's husbands. I hope you men see what weak, miserable creatures you are. Yeah, I'm beginning to. How about you, Jeff? Oh, I always knew. Miss Mary, <laughs> these flowers just arrived for you. Two boxes at once. Mm. Thank you, Dent. Yes, Miss Mary. Open one, will you, Chef? Sure. Look, Jeff. Orchid. Orchids. A fortune in weeds just to cover up a lady's collarbone. <laughs> What's in the other one, Chef? I don't know. Here, what do you call them? Oh. Oh, they're cornflowers. How sweet of Dill to remember. Chef, you and I are intruding on a sacred moment. Cornflowers must have a special meaning for Oh, they're my favorite. Do you mind if I'm a little sentimental? He did remember, you know. Uh-huh. Wear one for me. Here, Chef. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. And one for you, Mr. Tingle. Oh, no. Too bad, Mary. But flowers wither on me in an instant. I know. Just one brief blinding flame. That's it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hold the bridegroom. Hello, Mary. Dill, you finally got here. Miss me? Terribly. Hello, Jeff. How are you? Hi. Say, Chef, aren't you hungry? Not me. <laughs> it's all right, Jeff. <laughs> they have swell food in the pantry. Come on, let's get some. I just said I wasn't hungry. Then haven't you any tact? Come on. Uh oh, yeah, I get it. Oh, don't, get it. don't bother, Chef. We're leaving ourselves. Come on, Dill. I want to speak to you. See you later, Jeff. Uh-huh. Alone at last. <laughs> I love you, Dill. Swell. I wish it were this time tomorrow. Darling, if you'd rather, we'll get married by a policeman tonight. Oh, no. We'll do it right and proper. Excited, darling? A little. What? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> you know, the first time I ever kissed you was in this room. <laughs> Wasn't it? Was it? Well, good Lord, I thought it was. Maybe it wasn't. Well, I don't remember either, but I love you for trying to remember. I do remember. Everywhere I look, I seem to see a Mary doing something or other. Sort of like spots in front of your eyes. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Mary, age 15, making everything about Latin very clear. Well, I couldn't do it now. Mary is Juliet, age 17. 16? Paula made me be Juliet. I think I would have been much better as Queen Elizabeth. Still, I rather like Juliet. Especially in the solarium, sneaking a cigarette. <laughs> oh, Dill, thanks for the flowers. They got here all right? Mm, especially the cornflowers. I didn't send any cornflowers. I wouldn't admit it either if I were you. <laughs> admit what? Jeff will hound you to your dying day, sending your bride cornflowers. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I sent orchids. I give up. <laughs> Hello. Connie. How are you, Dill? Dolly said I'd find you in here. I... I thought you were in Paris, Connie. <laughs> yes, I was a week ago. Oh, yes. Well, I I can't keep you in the dark any longer, Miss Bond. I'm Mary Clay. I knew you were the minute I looked at you. I must apologize for breaking in like this. Oh, no, we're delighted. It's open house. Besides, I feel Dill owes many of his friends an apology. You know, for marrying a strange woman they know nothing about. Why don't you take off your things? Oh, I can only stay a minute. I've so wanted to meet you, Miss Clay, but it seems as though you travel as much as I do. Well, I've come and gone. I returned last month for my wedding. <laughs> yes, I heard about it in Paris. You're a clever girl, Miss Clay, for putting Dill through his paces. He always said he hated big weddings. The experience will do him good. Oh, it's just me, dear. I'm only two bridesmaids and Paula, my maid of honor. Well, can I uh, do anything to help? Yes, come and see it tomorrow. <laughs> well, will, will you two excuse me a minute? Uh, certainly. Well, Dill, here we are. When did you get back, Connie? This morning. Perfectly heavenly crossing. I think we broke a record or something. Staying a while? Oh, perhaps. I haven't made any real plans. I just decided all of a sudden to sail, so I sailed. How are you, Dill? You shouldn't have come here, Connie. You know that. I came because I wanted to see you. To get, shall I say, one last glimpse? 
And I thought there might be a bare chance that you would like to see me. Well, I don't want to see you. Oh, why, Dill, you're cruel. Stop it. It doesn't matter to you. Nothing has ever mattered to you. You did, Dill. You never meant it. Any of it. Not even Sorrento? Not even Sorrento. Dill. Yes? I did mean it at Sorrento. And in Switzerland, too. Remember that divine little village in the Alps? I really think you'd better go. Just as you say. Dill. Yes? Are you in love? Utterly. Happy? For the first time in my life. Honeymooning? Of course. A continent? No, London. Oh, dear, but why London? It's so cold and so gray. I like London. Mary likes London. <laughs> well, I guess it's London. But if you should happen to get over to Italy... We won't. But just in case, London does seem a little too gray and too cold, and you wanted to see what sunshine was like, and you suddenly found yourself in Italy, would you do something for me? What? Would you look across that beautiful bay and up at the smoke plumes of Vesuvius and think of me? Of you? Of us? Just once? But we are not going to Sorrento. Well, that's that. Goodbye, Dill. No hard feelings and bon voyage. Goodbye, Connie. Must you go so soon, Miss Bond? Oh, I'm sorry. I really can't stay. And you must have at least a dozen things to do. At least. But they can wait. Oh, no. I've really got to run. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, dear, why don't you drop Miss Bonds off? Oh, no, I wouldn't think of it. I'll be all right. Goodbye, dear. <laughs> well, that was a little unexpected. Do you mind? Why, of course I don't, darling. Why should I? Oh, Mary. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, come on in, Jeff. Oh, I just wanted to tell you that everybody's gone. I'm on my way now. Oh, don't go. Let's sit around and talk. The three of us. No, I can't, Mary. I don't know about you, but I've got a big day ahead of me tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, see you in church, Miss Clay. See you in church, Mr. Tingle. Rain. Wouldn't you just know it? Rain for a wedding. Oh, stop crying, Paula. Rain's lucky for me. The side door driver. Yes, ma'am. Oh, look at the crowd going in the church. All for me. Oh, Paula, in all my life, I've never had such a fuss made over me. I love it. Hurry up, driver. Hello, everybody. Oh, Mary, we thought you'd never arrive. It's a fine way to treat your bride. Calm down, darling. Take your cue from Mary. Hello, Jeff. Oh, you're here. What's the matter? Wasn't I supposed to come today? How's Dill feeling? Well, I, I, I don't know. What? The best man doesn't Just know. don't get excited. I'll be right back. What's wrong with him? Well, why don't they stop? What are the women singing for? They ought to be playing the wedding march. The sweetest story ever told. Paula, did you tell that soprano to sing the sweetest story ever told? No, dear. Well, neither did I, and I loved it. Oh, this May I sit down? No. Uh, quick, everybody, who goes where? Paula? Paula, am I all right? Do I look all right? Listen. Well, here we go. I'm weak. My knees are buckling. Let isn't it? Start, start. Goodbye, everybody. Wait. Mary, don't go out there yet. Oh, dear, Jeff, are you crazy? Mary, I... Who told him to start that thing? Tell him to stop, stop the music. Oh, Jeff, what? Is it Dill? Is he sick? No, he's... He's married. No. What? Did you say married? Je yes, Mary. Married to who? Connie Barnes. To Connie Barnes? Yes. Oh, you Connie. Shut up, everybody. Well, well. Jeff, I... Steady, Mary. Oh, it's all right. I'm not going to faint. Tell me. It's true, Mary. Dill wired my house. The boy just brought it. I had the woman sing to stall for time. The sweetest story ever told. Mary. <laughs> it said he was sorry, didn't it? Oh, oh yes. you poor darling. Oh, oh, yes, I'm sure he's sorry. So am I. It's one of those things you'd like to see happen to somebody else. Like a fat lady on a banana peeling. Oh, Mary, I'm so sorry for you. Well, we're leaving at once. Tell the papers that. Tell them that Mary Clay decided at the last minute she... she didn't wish to marry. Jeff. Jeff, put these lilies in water for me. I might want to get married again sometime. Will someone get Jeff a pitcher or a bucket? There's plenty of water outdoors. Let's go, Mary. They're sending the crowd away. Let's get ahead of it. Wait. The benediction. Hold open the door so I can hear. No, please. Well, then I'll hold it open myself. And the ceremony will be indefinitely postponed. Miss Mary Clay will not be married to Mr. Dylan Todd today. Miss Mary Clay will not be married to Mr. Dylan Todd today. Sounds funny, doesn't it? 
And I always thought that rain was lucky for me. <laughs> Act one of tonight's Lux Radio Theater play, forsaking all others, with Betty Davis and Joel McRae. We go on to Act Two in a moment. Meanwhile, during our intermission, we have a new game we'd like you to play with us. It's called Last Word Up. Here's how it's played. We've asked a young lady to read a piece to you. The game is that you pick out the last word in every sentence she reads, like this. I am very anxious to stay beautiful. The last word in that sentence was beautiful. Remember, pick out the last word in every sentence. Place them together in the order in which they appear, and you'll find they themselves make a complete sentence. See what that sentence is. Ready? Let's go. Sentence one. You will notice the most popular girls are always dainty. Sentence two. Daintiness, the most appealing charm of all, should be on the beauty program of all girls. Sentence three. It's a charm they all can have, and one they can keep through the years. In fact, always. Sentence four. It's romance women really want, and the girls who are dainty usually win. Sentence five. But remember, the girl who neglects this charm loses out. And that's all. Now let's see if we have the right last words up. My little pad reads, dainty girls always win out. Famous screen stars will tell you that's the truth. For instance, here's what the lovely Loretta Young says. No smart girl neglects daintiness. Unless a girl has it, no other charm counts. Use Lux Toilet Soap as a beauty bath. Its active lather leaves skin really fresh and sweet, delicately fragrant, too. It's the best way I know to ensure daintiness. You'll love it. And thousands of girls everywhere have found from experience that what Loretta Young says is true. It pays to be exquisitely dainty with gentle, fragrant Lux Toilet Soap. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. We continue with Forsaking All Others, starring Betty Davis and Joel McRae. It's the following afternoon. Trying bravely to hide her real feelings, Mary is entertaining again at her home, passing the whole affair off as a joke on herself. But there's desperation in her bravery and bitterness in her laughter. Jeff Tingle has just arrived at the house. Still wearing his coat, he stands at the telephone. Speaking to his secretary. Hello. Uh, Miss Kramer? Uh, Mr. Tingle? Is everything all right down there? Ah, it's fine. Now, just between you and me, is there any use of my coming down to the office today? Or tomorrow? I didn't think so either. Goodbye. Oh, Dent. Yes, sir? Uh, when that gentleman arrives, you'll... I'll uh... show him to the library. Good. Yes, sir. Shall I take your coat, sir? Miss Clay is in the sitting room. Come and join the party. We're celebrating my sudden release from matrimony. You're looking very lovely, Mary. Thank you. The frock is for my trousseau. I had it fumigated. Sit down. I called you late last night. Why didn't you answer? Because I wanted to unpack my trunks and get settled. Oh, then I was tired, so I went to bed after writing a few checks for the monthly bills, and, and I read myself to sleep on a book that Dylan and I received as a wedding present, being very careful about finger marks, of course, since back it goes. Finally, I put the book down and went to sleep. Did you have a good sleep? Best in years. It must have been a good book. It was rather nice. I'm going to buy it someday. I'd like to speak to you, Mary. May I? Of course. We can go in the library. My ambassadors of goodwill in there, Jeff. They all came to see what a jilted lady looks like. You're putting on a good show. Thanks. Well, they're married, all right. How romantic. Justice of the peace, 11 o'clock yesterday Oh, morning. don't spare a thing, Jefferson. What did the bride wear? I don't know, but knowing Connie Barnes, I'd say something clinging and trailing. Yes, I imagine so. Oh, Jeff, why did he do it? I don't know. I've been trying to figure it out. I have too, all night, all morning. You're doing swell, Mary. Jeff. Jeff, do you hate being told to move on? If you're in some place that you think is all right for you to be, and somebody comes up very roughly and tells you to move on... That's how I feel. Ordered to take my little picnic basket in hand and get out of somebody's private property. I want to go away. I want to go away and hide. But I'm not going to. I'm going to stay and have a big time as if nothing had happened. Jeff, never again as long as I live will I laugh when the gentleman kicks the lady comedian. 
What is it, Dent? For Mr. Tingle, Miss Mary. The uh, gentleman. Who oh, all here. right, Dent. Thank you. Yes, sir. What was that all about? Uh, Mary, Bill's here. What? You've got to see him. Who says so? I do. What does he want? I'll let him tell you. I only spoke to him on the phone, but I promised I'd fix it so you'd see him. Your whole life may depend on this. How can it possibly? Please, Mary, for me. I'll send him in. All right, Bill. Go ahead. Yes, thanks. Mary? Yes, I'm still Mary. Remember me? It's hard to explain what I did, but... Why do you try? What makes you think I want an explanation? I must... I must make some attempt to... Justify what you did. No. That isn't possible. Well, perhaps you want to be forgiven. All right, I forgive you. So what? Jeff said you'd see me. Allow me to talk. Well, you're talking. Go on. Mary, you've always been a reasonable person. Have I? You've always been fair and just. And generous. That's a good word, too. Please, these aren't just words. Believe me, I know. I appreciate what I've done. I played you the meanest trick. I know all that. I only want to tell you it was my loss, too. Too? Who else has lost? Have I? Oh, I was humiliated, embarrassed, naturally. But think what I escaped. Why, I almost married you. Oh, that's something to be grateful for. You know, like missing a train that was wrecked. You don't mean that. Don't I? You can't. No matter what I've done. I know. And you may laugh at me for saying so. But I love you. I've never stopped loving you. Love? All right, maybe you do love me. What's that got to do with it? Perhaps I love you, too. Yes, I think I do. I think I am in love with you. That doesn't mean I want to be. If I stay in a dark room and do as the doctor says and take plenty of nourishment, I'll get over it. Mary, listen to me. I haven't slept. All night long I've walked the streets. I don't want... Oh, I know this is a rotten thing to say, but I need you. It's you I want, not Connie. Oh, Dill, Dill. Can't you be loyal with anyone? What do you mean? Well, you're married to her, aren't you? Now I think you'd better go. All right. All right, Mary. Doesn't want Connie. What's a fine time to think of that? Keeping me waiting at a church all day and... Oh, no. <laughs> Mary. Here, have a cigarette. Light? Thanks. Well? Well, why don't you ask me what happened? I don't have to. I saw Dill's face on the way out. You know, Jefferson, I, I can almost tolerate myself again. I've said things that I didn't know I could. Horrible, mean things. And it felt so good. And you know, you're going to take me out to dinner tonight, Jefferson. I want a good dinner and I want to dance. Dinner? Mm-hmm. With you and in Shep and Paula and anyone else who'd like to come. I see. I'm Papa. I'll wear my new white evening dress. Who are you trying to make jealous? Oh, Jefferson, now girls don't do that sort of thing anymore. But you can send me flowers if you like. Heaps and heaps of them. No, no. Nothing doing. I sent them already. Jefferson Tingle, you never sent me flowers in all your born days. No? Well, it so happens that the day before yesterday, I sent you some cornflowers. But you've probably forgotten. Well, I'll see you tonight. Why, Jefferson Tingle. I tried to get her to come. I said, Mary wants you to come, Paula. But she said she was just too upset. There. What do you think of that, Jeff? I'm jilted at the altar. And Paula is so upset she can't come. <laughs> Iron nerves, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say we have something to eat? I'm hungry. Uh, don't be common, Mr. Tingle. What about a steak all around? Yeah, what else do they have? Steak. I'll have a steak, please, Mr. Tingle. Very good, Miss Clay. Anything else you'd like? Yes, a smile, Mr. Tingle. A smile? How's this? <laughs> Gruesome, gruesome. Well, I'm sorry, but that's the best I can do. So what's the matter with you, Jeff? We're supposed to be on a party. Yes, whoopee! We ought to have noisemakers. Uh, Mary, you're beautiful tonight. Thank you, sir. If you ask me, Mr. Dylan Todd is a dope. Who asked you? Well, don't you think he was a dope? I try never to think about anything. Yeah, well, that's nice. That's loyally. Yeah, well, I stop it, stop it, back. stop so it. I won't have you men quarreling over Carlotta, the dance hall girl. She isn't good enough. <laughs> well, I'll have my steak rare. What about you, Mary? That guy is hopeless, Mary. That's all. He's hopeless. Oh, 
Ah, good evening. Good evening, Miss Barnes. Oh, good evening, Alfred. We haven't seen you for a long time, no, Miss I'm, Barnes. I've been away. Is Mr. Todd here tonight? No, I haven't seen him, but will you wait? Yes, give me a table, please. A quiet one, Alfred. Right this way, Miss Barnes. <laughs> Chef, you're marvelous. I'm glad you brought him, Jeff. <laughs> Just Papa, that's all. Look. Am I hysterical, or is that really Connie Barnes coming through that door? It's Connie, all right. Connie Barnes. She's heading right for us. Oh, let's get out of here. I don't want to see her. We can go upstairs. Come on. No. No, I won't. I haven't done a thing to be ashamed of. Sit tight, Mary. Mary, if I were you, I wouldn't go looking for trouble. Yes. Why, Connie, how do you do? Oh, good evening. Well, hello, Connie. Hello, Connie. Hello, I, I was looking for... I told Dill I'd meet him here. We've just ordered. Won't you join us? Why? Oh, we'd love to have you, wouldn't we, Jeff? What? Oh, yes, delighted. We're celebrating. Paula couldn't come, so you can have Chef Connie. Well, thank you. That, that's very sweet. Sit down, won't you? Sit down, Chef. Sit down, Jeff. You're not going to stand up all evening, are you? We'll clear the ring when we hear the gong. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Sit down. Well, if you think it's safe, have a seat near the door, Chef. Thanks. I know what you all must be thinking. Yeah? You're good. Jeff, please. Miss Clay, I'm glad we had this chance meeting. I feel there's some sort of explanation, do you? Explanation? Yes, it was really unfortunate. I mean that our marriage should have to be at such a time. Yes, it was a bit uh, inopportuno. I'm so sorry. I really blame Dill. He knew how it was with us. And just forgot for a time. Yes. And you are attractive, Mary. May I call you Mary? I can imagine Dill found you hard to resist. Hard, but not impossible. But it's not Dill I'm concerned about. No. After all, you're the one who... Who lost. Well, it amounts to just that, doesn't it? Really, you're not flattering me, Mrs. Todd. Now that's it, Shep. Outside the rope. Let's go. Can't we look at this thing impersonally? Oh, of course. I'll be Exhibit A. I like your saying that. To carry out the idea, I'll be Exhibit B. And Dill, Exhibit C. It's the New World's Fair, Shep. I'll sell you the popcorn concession. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jeff. I, I know you grew up with Dill. You were taking your marriage as a matter of course, just just one of those things. A love match. I don't doubt your sincerity, Mary, but I should have married Dill a year ago. Oh, what's a year, more or less? When I heard he was going to marry you, I knew suddenly that I had to see Dill again, to know once and for all if he was important to me. Any woman would have done the same. But not so successfully. Do I detect a note of sarcasm? Oh, not a bit. Oh, you have my best wishes, and so has the bridegroom. Thank you. I, I wish you'd say that to Dill yourself. Heaven knows I want you to be friends with Dill. I know you can be. I think you're good for certain things in his disposition. Dill is accustomed to going to you. He needs you. Well, he said he needed me. Yes? Yes, he said he needed me this afternoon. This afternoon? Dill saw you this afternoon? Yes, for the very thing you said, because he needed me. Well, you two had a lot to talk about if Dill went to you. Oh, I think he stopped by the church first to see if she was still waiting. I see. It's not pleasant to be left waiting. You should know, Mrs. Todd. Really, should I? When did you see Dill last? Well, what do you mean? Well, shortly after the wedding, wasn't it? Nearly two days. It's a long time for a bride of two hours. How do you know that? Dill told me. You've seen? You know where he is? Where is he? My house. Where's that? I've moved. Answer me. <laughs> Jeff, what have you planned, all of you? What have you planned? It's not pleasant to be kept waiting. Are you it? insinuating that oh, I... Oh, Connie, Jeff, please now, don't quarrel for my sake. Fighting in a restaurant, it's vulgar. What have you and Dylan planned? Nothing. Good. Because Dill and I understand each other. Why, this will all blow over. I know all about your childhood, sweetheart. But now he's mine. He's nobody's. He belongs to himself like any decent human being. I think I can speak for Dill in that matter. I resent that. I resent it for Dill. You might ask him how much he resented what I said night before last. Oh, you can't hurt me, Connie. Tell me what you said. Or shall I tell you? She'll make you such a good wife. That's what you said. A sweet girl. Go on, marry her, Dill. Forget me and better not think of the things that might have been. That's what you said, Connie. Well, probably not as plain as that, but with the same meaning. Hail and farewell, you said. No, don't kiss me, Dill. Remember Mary, poor dear Mary. And you swept him in with your tenderness. Oh, how beautifully you do it. And once again, the world was lost for love. And it always will be. You'd better learn that. Rose or pink at your wedding, Connie? Which did you wear? Or blue or green or black or white? Whatever I wore, it suited the occasion. 
A grown-up occasion and not for little girls. Good night, Miss Perry. Good night to you, Mrs. Todd. Well, you won. Yes. Yes, I won. But for some reason, it tastes a little bitter. Shall we dance, Mr. Tingle? Delighted, Miss Clay. Excuse us, will you, Chef? Have a good time, children. Jeff, tell me, is it true what you said before she hasn't seen Dill? Not since... He told you? He went to my house when he left you. Then at least he meant what he said to me. He's been miserable, Mary. Oh, has he? Are you going to tell me Nothing. That... He deserves it. Oh, let's... Let's stop, shall we? I don't feel like dancing. Come on back to the table. I'm sorry, Jeff. I guess I'm just all of them. Mary. Dill, what are you doing here? Mary, I couldn't stay away. I've got to speak to you. Did you tell him to come here, Jeff? Well, I told him you'd be here. Why? Well, he asked me and I told him, that's all. Well, I guess I'd better wait outside. No, Shep, stay where you are. You too, Jeff. He can talk as much as he likes. Well. Thanks. I won't take long, and I'll try not to embarrass anybody. It's just that I've got to say this. Yes? It started a year ago. With Connie? Yes, in Europe. I saw her for months. Then as suddenly as she came into my life, she went out of it. I felt disloyal to you even then. You see, I've never thought of anyone but you since I was a kid. But something happened to me. I was fascinated, I guess. When I left for home, I promised Honest. her that... Mary tried to understand me. I was insanely in love with her. It didn't last. When I saw you again, my love for her seemed... Well, it was unreal. That's all. That's all. Is that the story you wanted to tell? Wait a minute, Jeff. She called me last the night before our wedding. She was a little hysterical. She said she had to see me right away. I said I couldn't see her, that I wouldn't. Then I got to worrying. I thought I'd better go. Finally, I took her for a long drive up the Hudson. We talked and talked until morning... Just at dawn, we stopped and watched the sun come up from the Palisades. She told me she loved me over and over again. She was crying a little. I was confused and bewildered. And having her so near, well, I lost my head. I'm not asking you to forgive me, Mary. But I had to tell you the truth. Well, your truth comes a little late, doesn't it? Jeff. You lost your head, huh? Getting married's a pretty deliberate action. Jeff, this is my affair. Now take it easy, Jeff. We did get married. Then for the first time, I realized what I'd done. We left the Justice of the Peace office, and it seemed to me like I was just coming out of a dream. I left her. You left her? Then? Yes, in the car. I took the train. I was crazy, Mary. You left her? Then? Mary, you do believe me, don't you? Say you do, please. I can't spend another night like last you night. You can't? Well, what about her? Never mind about me. Never mind you. Good Lord, Mary, there's a limit. Yes, and there's a limit to what I can stand. He's sorry, isn't he? You heard him say that? Oh, yes, I well, know. Well, that's it. enough. I don't care what he's done. I love him, do you hear? And he loves me. I do, Mary. Believe what if me. he did let me down? I'm sorry, Mary. Oh, I'm sorry, too. I love you, Dill. I love you. Oh, Mary. Well, that's that. Shep, may I have the honor of this dance? for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We have finished the second act of Forsaking All Others. And now before going into Act 3... We observe our custom of bringing you one of the backstage personalities of motion pictures. Among other things, Hollywood is noted for providing more strange occupations than any other town in the world. On our payroll are cobweb spinners, echo testers, fly chasers, professional screamers, and telephone cord untwisters. We meet one of these odd jobbers now. Her name is Kathleen Coughlin, and we call her our fan magazine contact. Kathleen gets paid for digging up unusual facts and ideas about the stars to be used in various screen magazines. In other words, Mr. DeMille, my job is to find new angles on Paramount personalities, new slants that are news. From the women's point of view? Oh, no, from the man's point of view, too. Almost half our fan mail comes from men. 
That's why the fan magazines print so many success stories. That's the type the men like to read. And then there are those which appeal to both men and women, stories with what we call a problem slant. For example, the personal handicaps which many stars have had to overcome. Meaning whom, Miss Coughlin? Meaning Fred McMurray. To see Fred today on the set of Coconut Grove, you would never suspect that he used to be so shy he'd go into a panic every time he had to meet people. He cured himself by centering his attention on other people and so developed his present easy manner. How he did it furnishes an interesting story. Still, I presume that today, as since the dawn of time, the type of story that interests a woman is a love story. Correct. But she's interested in the love story of stories of the stars from much more than a curiosity angle. You see, that woman has a Robert Taylor or a Clark Gable or a Tyrone Power of her own. Someone she wants to fascinate and keep enchanted. And so we found that a reader's main interest in the love story of an actress is to learn the means by which that actress succeeded in her Hollywood romance. Hollywood, you see, has become a school, teaching a widely diversified list of subjects, and with all the world as its pupils. It's become a sort of national proving grounds, and that's why I think the sponsors of this program are to be congratulated on their product. The fact that Lux Toilet Soap is so popular with the stars can be taken by every girl as adequate proof that it must be about the finest complexion care obtainable. I've seen Lux Soap in the dressing rooms and homes of any number of stars, actresses who could afford to spend almost any amount of money. Thanks for telling us that, Kathleen. But your job is to get good ideas for fan magazines. The 14 of them that appear every month have a combined circulation of 10 million. Each one prints about 10 articles, which means that out of somewhere must arise... 140 ideas every 30 days. Where do they come from? Well, take that recent article called The Story of Claudette Colbert's Second Honeymoon, which appeared in Photoplay magazine while Claudette was making Bluebeard's Eighth Wife. In reality, that story outlines her plans for a trip she's now on in Europe. That in itself wouldn't make what we'd call hot copy, but it suddenly became warm when Miss Colbert dropped a stray remark that she hadn't had a honeymoon because she'd been so busy making pictures. Then and there, we had the basis for an article that would interest thousands, again, because it could be applied to themselves. All brides, of course, don't have to hurry back home to make motion pictures, but all of them in their hearts want the romance of a honeymoon, even if it's only a two-week vacation. That's why such a story is so successful. But do our leading stars welcome interviews of that nature? Every star will give a good interview if the conditions are right. Conditions are right for Fred McMurray when he comes into my office, drops down in my chair, and props his feet up on the desk. Carol Lombard is highly conversational in a noisy atmosphere and talks most on the set between scenes. Irene Dunn prefers to wait until her picture is finished and then will entertain graciously at home for the interviewer. Gary Cooper is most uncomfortable when an interview has been planned for him. He's much more helpful if you can arrange to just to bump into him. In fact, Gary gave the finest interview of his career, basking in the sun on a pile of old lumber. There's a little tip for the next time Gary appears in the Lux, Lux Radio Theater. Thanks, Mr. DeMille, for interviewing an interviewer. Thanks for the starlight, Kathleen. <laughs> Betty Davis and Joel McRae return to us in Forsaking All Others. One month has passed, and Dylan Todd is in Mexico to free himself from Connie. Jeff, always the good friend, has gone along to keep him company and stands by the window of their hotel room, looking across the little town. Well, tomorrow's the day. Hey, Jeff. Hmm? I said tomorrow's the day. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Are you sure? That lawyer said positively. Final papers and everything. Lord, I'll be glad to get out of here. Why? It's not such a bad place. What are you talking about? You've been beefing about it for a month. Now we're going home, you suddenly take a liking to it. Just the same, we're catching that train tomorrow afternoon. Well, I'll tell you what, dear. Would you mind very much if you went alone? I think I'd like to stay on here for a while. What for? Well, just for a few weeks, I think I'd like it. You're crazy. Why, if you stay... You won't even make the wedding. Mary would kill you. No, I'll make it all right. You'd better. You're still best man, you know. No, I don't know. You know I thought maybe you'd pick Shep. What's the matter? Don't you want to be best man? Well, if it's all the same to you, Dill, I think everything ought to be, uh, well, different. Do you mind? No. No, of course not. I guess I know what you mean. 
It will be different, too. Sure it will. Well, I think I'll shoot an airmail to Mary. Shall I give her your love? Hmm? Oh, yes, do that, will you? Hello, Dent. Mr. Tingle. Welcome back, sir. Thanks. Am I expected? Oh, yes, sir. I heard Mr. Todd say you'd probably be here today. Jeff! Hello, Mary. Jeff, you finally got here. I was ready to kill you. Do you know I'm getting married tomorrow? <laughs> same place, same piano, same crowd, same wedding. Same Jeff. <laughs> it's good to be back. Come on, I want to speak to you. Now tell me all about yourself. No, there's nothing much to tell. How was Mexico? How are you? Feeble. Let me look at you. Jeff, you're thinner. No, I got too much sleep down there. Well, you didn't dare sleep before you reported here. No, I tried to, but I couldn't, so I leapt out of bed and fixed myself up cute and rushed right over. Oh, you did. Well, you can go right back home again. Oh, I... I got your wretched little postcard. Did I send you a postcard? Just too sweet for words. Where is it? Oh, yes. Yes, here it is. A whole month away in one postcard. At least I had the sense not to write to you. Oh, I read your letters to Dill. It's good the judge didn't know he was getting letters from a giddy young girl. Is that my postcard you're tearing up? The pretty picture of the lake? That's what I think of your pretty picture? Well, at least you waited until I got here. Just for the stamp. Oh, well, I've got something to tear up, too. What's that? Your last letter to Dill. He gave it to me for my stamp collection. Too bad I hadn't read it yet. Jefferson Tingle, I ought to slap your insufferable face. Well, you better not. I've been down in a country where a slap in the face means business. Say, where's Dill? Oh, he's around. We're both trying not to look self-conscious, so we steer clear of each other in front of company. Oh, it's good to see you, Jeff. It makes me feel good. Dr. Tingle, at your service. How are you, really? Feeble, Moss Tingle, feeble. No, I don't believe it. What'd you do while I was away? Well, I... I caught up with my classical reading. I went shopping and didn't buy anything. Shep and I tore up the town. We became famous far and wide. That pale, interesting woman and that very young-looking boy. <laughs> Is he the best man? Yes. Too bad I won't be here. What? Well, now, don't yell. I've got to eat. I've got a job, the boss suggests. I work at it a bit now and then. He's sending me out of town tonight. We'll delay the wedding. Oh, I'm flattered, but you won't. Oh, but I won't see married unless you're there. Oh, I'm a jinx. If I stay away, everything will go all right. Will it? I wonder. What's the matter? Are you good at diagnosis, Dr. Tingle? Very. What are your symptoms? A sort of unsatisfactory few weeks I've had. I've straightened out every dresser drawer and every closet in this house. I don't suppose that means anything to you, does it? Oh, certainly you're a neat woman. Go on. You probably counted the linen, too. Oh, a lot of the good old stuff Mother had was mildewed. I was so mad I cried. And then one rainy day up in the attic? You'd be mortified to know that I did spend such an afternoon. I sat in the middle of my ancestral trunks and balls. What over? Just told you. Over the fact that life was far from satisfactory. Well, didn't you feel better afterward? No. Well, what's the sticker, Mary? Whether or not I should marry Dill. What? Well, have you said anything to Dill? No, what is the two say until I've made up my mind one way or another? Well, you haven't much time, less than 24 hours. Make up your mind, either you are or you aren't. You ought to know. Yes, Papa. Say, are you one of these women who worry themselves into a fever trying to decide between pink and green? Haven't you got enough strength of character to know what it is you want and ask for it for a loud, clear voice? A loud, clear voice. That's easy to say. Because you know what to ask for and I don't. That's the difference, Jefferson. Your life seems very simple to me. Well, that's because I'm a very complex person. I see more than floats on the surface. I've practiced holding my breath for three minutes and walking around on the bottom with my eyes open. And you can do it, too. I've always considered you a person who knew the passwords. I've watched you out of the corner of my eye. You're shocked by the right things, stupidity and glitter and cheap sophistication. But this marriage business has you all mixed up. One of your little pet illusions cracked up about a month ago and it's got you down. Well, you've got to patch it up again. You've got to keep your pet illusions, and you've got to make them shatterproof. Wait till I get my copybook, and I'll write all this down. No, no. Either you know it or you don't. You don't get it by writing it down, and you don't get it out of books either. Then how is a poor girl to get it? Listen, you know what I'm talking about, and if you didn't, you wouldn't be trying to joke about it. You'd be cussing me out because you'd think I was saying you weren't sophisticated. And in this day and age, to say that to a person is to insult him to his non-existent soul. Well, I know the truly wise is simple. But it doesn't necessarily follow that the simple are truly wise. You're not being simple now. You've got to make up your mind. Do you want Dill or don't you? I told you I don't know. Mary, what is this? You're not trying to get even with Dill. 
I thought you knew me better than that. Oh, I do. You're above that. Thanks. If I weren't and I found out that I didn't love him, the best way to get even would be to marry him, wouldn't it? No, but you wouldn't do that. Of course I wouldn't. Mary, I... I don't know what this is all about. Neither do I. I told you I didn't. Well, have you spoken to anyone else? Oh, I couldn't. Still, I... I can speak about it to you. It's funny, isn't it? Well, we... Well, we're old friends. Oh, that must be it. Well... Well? That's your problem, Mary, and it's a big one. You haven't much time to decide. The minister's coming in a few minutes to make the final arrangement. Well, whatever you do decide, it'll be right. I know that. Thank you, Jeff. Goodbye, Mary. Bye. Well, uh, where to now? Go around the park again. Okay. Well, that makes four trips around. Go on, go on. You're getting paid for it. I got all day and all week, and I'm not in a hurry. Okay, lonesome. What? <laughs> remember me? I remember you. Oh, you do, eh? Yeah. Lonesome Dingle. <laughs> all the time, the best man. I picked you up on Park Avenue once, remember? Oh, yes. <laughs> lonesome Dingle. <laughs> that killed me. I thought you were screwed. No, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Turn around. Huh? Go back to the house where you picked me up and step on it. But I thought you said about... Go the... on, go on. Okay. Oh, hi, Mr. Tingle. Oh, where's Miss Mary, Dent? She's in the library. Thanks. Mary. Well, glad to see you back, Mr. Tingle. We've got your old room ready for you. Oh, well, Thanks. The conductor said 30 minutes for lunch, so I thought I'd get off and talk to the pretty waitress. That's nice. Sit down. Listen, Mary, I've been thinking, and I want to ask you something. Well, if you want to laugh at me when it's all over, I'll laugh with you, because maybe it's hilarious, only I don't think so now. Go on. Well, when I left here before, I realized I'd turn tail and run for the most important thing I'd ever had to make up my mind about. Is it made up now? Yes, it is. The taxi driver did it. He called me Lonesome Dingo, and that's what I am. And you know why. Because I never took my own advice. I never yelled out for what I wanted in a loud, clear voice. Well, I'm doing it now. Listen, Mary. If you do change your mind about Dill, if you aren't going to marry him, sometime after a decent interval, only I hope the interval won't be too long or too decent, would it ever occur to you to marry me? Yes, Jefferson, it would. <laughs> of course it would. <laughs> why not? Jefferson Dingle, that charming old fellow... Wouldn't it be amusing to think of being married to him at some time or other? Well, all right, Mary. Let me know. My office will give you my address any time in the next three weeks. So you didn't mean it? Did you? Yes. I did mean it. So did I. Mary. Jeff. What's happened? I don't know. Have I always loved you? I must have. Oh, we've got to find Dill and tell him. He's still here. We'll tell him together. Wait. Let me have a look at you. That tingle chap fell into a pretty good thing. So did that clay girl. Mary. Mary, where in heaven's name have you been? Here, dear, why? Well, you might have let me know. Your friend Paula's been on my trail all day, bawling me out for I don't know what. What is this mysterious thing known as my duty to you? Just what have you suffered that I don't know about? Don't you think I've had a little private suffering of my own? Well, I didn't stick Paula onto you, dear. You know how she loves to manage destinies. I thought you knew it was best to seem devoutly grateful and then go your own little way. You haven't any duty to me. And I've forgotten that I've ever had a single pang. Well, all right, Mary. You mustn't mind my getting all steamed up. Sorry to let you in for all this, Jeff. But after all, you were in from the start and you have a right to be in at the finish. Please excuse me, Mary. And you must try to excuse me. Dill, I... I don't know how to put it, except that I'm not going to marry you tomorrow. What? Oh, well, that's all right, Mary. If you want to wait a little while, I understand. No, Dill, I mean I'm not going to marry you at all. Why not? Why not, Mary? Dill, Mary's going to marry me. You and... <laughs> all right, children. It's not right. a joke. Not one of Jeff's ideas? It's both our ideas. I don't believe it. I'll never believe it. You're kidding. Wait a minute, Dill. Cut it out, Jeff. Do you mean it, Mary? Yes, Dill. Then I am a complete fool. Congratulations on making me oh, one. Oh, Dill, I'm sorry. Oh, don't say that. You can't be sorry. Not if you're marrying that fine chap, that true friend, Jefferson Tingle. What I can't understand, Jeff, is why you went all the way to Mexico to get me free. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Dill. This has happened to Jeff and me in the last half hour. 
We haven't had time to tell you. Yes, but you were going to tell me. How considerate. Perhaps you can tell me something I can tell my friends. Oh, Dill, don't say such things. We've always had so much fun together. Dill, that's it. We were getting married on the strength of the past. So I'm just a friend. Is that it? Just a friend that stuck his hand in the buzz saw for you to find out if it was sharp. So you want to marry Jeff Tingle instead of me. Is that it? That's it, too. All right. But promise me this. Don't ever talk about me. And give me time to get out of town. There goes Dylan Todd. I'm sorry. You know, Jeff, he didn't think of me at all. I'm glad of that. Why? Because then I won't have to sit up nights worrying about him. I think he took it nobly. Don't you think I took it kind of nobly when he let me down? As far as I'm concerned, I think you take everything nobly. Jeff, you're not going to start complimenting me at this late date. Well, Miss Clay, my position is slightly altered. As a bridegroom, I hardly know what to say. Darling. (laughs) Miss Mary, Reverend Duncan is calling. About plans for tomorrow? Oh, the minister. Jeff, kiss me. Ah, good afternoon, Miss Clay. Oh, um, uh, good afternoon, Reverend Duncan. And uh, this is Mr. Dylan Todd? Well, um, well, not exactly. What? I mean, uh, there's been a slight substitution. (laughs) Mr. Tingle for Mr. Todd. We take leave of our play for taking all others. And devote the next two or three moments to a meeting with our stars, Betty Davis and Joel McRae. A couple of weeks ago, Miss Davis, the Hollywood columnist Jimmy Starr reported on this microphone that you've just moved into your new home. Good work, C.B., but don't stop there. Don't whisper, Joel. Speak up if there's anything on your mind. Oh, no, no, not a thing. Well, you know, Joel here is in the cattle business, and uh, after all, Betty, what is home without a cow? Now, Mr. DeMille, what would I want with a cow? I'm sure I don't know, Betty. I'm only trying to help Joel out. He said that if... if... Well, uh, Betty, a cow... Well, you see, a cow is... Why, well, anyway, they're swell. They're quiet and restful, and, and they have big brown eyes, and I'm sure if you saw the one... Joel, that I... I don't wish to buy a cow. Oh, you... You don't wish to buy a cow? No. Oh. Well, how about a horse? No. Well, can I at least sell you a load of hay? It's very good hay, Betty. You two aren't partners by any chance. No, not exactly. You see, I own a herd of deer. But I don't want any deer either. No, but they eat so much hay that Joel said he'd give me all I need if I uh, helped him sell you a cow. Oh. (laughs) I see. Just a couple of boys in the moo movie business. (laughs) Maybe we'd better change the subject, Mr. DeMille. No, wait a minute, Joel. Since you and I have formed a sort of mutual admiration society for our friend Willie Wyler, why don't you send a cow to him as a token of your esteem? Excuse me, Betty, but Mr. Wyler has interrupted his picture directing and is now in Sun Valley, Idaho. Yes, far, far away from Hollywood with nothing to do but ski and ice skate and toboggan. Poor, poor man. That's why I think a cow might be just the thing to keep his spirits up. Tell me, Betty... Is it true that after directing you in Jezebel, poor Mr. Wyler had to go away for a rest? Oh, don't be silly, Joel. I'm the one who had to have the rest. You've worked with Willie. You should know. <laughs> uh, my secret agents informed me, Betty, that the real reason you worked night and day was to enable your co-star, Henry Fonda, to dash to New York and be there at the time he, uh, he became a papa. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite true. And in appreciation of our efforts, Henry promised to name the baby Jezebel. But he double-crossed us and named her Jane Seymour Fonda instead. I don't know, I suppose that's better. Jane's really kind of nicer than Jesse. <laughs> By the way, didn't Henry play in Forsaking All Others on Broadway? That's right, Joel. He was hardly more than an extra then. And now, five short years later, he's right up among our leading, leading men. But getting back to you, now just what is all this about your ranch? Well, the best way to find out is to come up and have a look for yourself. A real ranchman? Corrals and, and roundups and wooden bathtubs too, I suppose. Well, not quite that authentic, Betty. I'll own up to one small swimming pool. Well, speaking of bathtubs... And goodness knows you're the one to speak of bathtubs, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, anyway, I was about to remark that the first bathtub in this country almost caused a minor revolution. Its presence in the home of a Cincinnati gentleman in the 1840s 
brought forth a storm of protest from politicians, newspapers, and the medical profession. It was denounced as an Epicurean innovation designed to corrupt the democratic simplicity of the Republic. <laughs> Not long after the Philadelphia Common Council went into a turmoil over a proposed ordinance prohibiting bathing between November 1st and March 15th. (laughs) It failed to become a law by only two votes. (laughs) That's lucky for you, sir. This is the 20th century. Lux soap would have found it rather rough sledding back there in the unscrubbed 40s. (laughs) And lucky for us, too. I'm very happy to say that Lux soap is the soap in our new home. Thank you, Betty. And thank you, sir, for inviting me here to play Forsaking All Others. Many of you will remember the stage production with Miss Tallulah Bankhead, whose performance is one I know I shall never forget. Now, good night. Good night, C.B. Good night, Betty. So long, cowboy. (laughs) And now I have some wonderful news for you. Next week, we bring you the great W.C. Fields. The old God that never surrenders. Beneath the magnificent flaming canopy that is his nose, uh, there beats the heart of a Don Quixote. He's the ghost of the old family album, come back to shake the world with laughter. He's the last stand of old-fashioned chivalry and wisteria-draped sentiment. His speech gushes with 18-carat invective and 18th-century elegance. He's the minstrel boy in top hat and velvet collar, slightly frayed. He's that glorious charlatan, W.C. Fields. We dispatched an invitation to Mr. Fields to be with us next Monday night. And by carrier pigeon, Mr. Fields has sent his acceptance and will reenact his great screen success, Poppy, assisted by Anne Shirley, Skeets Gallagher, and John Payne. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents W.C. Fields in Poppy with Anne Shirley, Skeets Gallagher, and John Payne. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Turn the play appears to finish with Samuel Bowman and Louis Silvers through 20th Century Fox Studios where he directed music for the new film Sally, Irene, and Mary. Heard during tonight's program was Sweet Someone from Love and Hisses. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is ChestertonRadio.com. International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring Betty Davis in Broken Prelude, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you in behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Tonight, we welcome you to the 11th of the new series of Silver Theater Dramatic Productions. Among the many excellent dramas you will hear in future weeks, will be David Goth's Red Book magazine story, Challenge for Three, in which the lovely Ida Lupino will be co-starred with Conrad Nagel, whom we know you'll be glad to hear once again in a dramatic role. He's with us today in his usual capacity of director, so I'll let him tell you about this afternoon's play, Conrad Nagel. Thank you, John Conti. Today's drama, Broken Prelude, was written especially for Betty Davis in the Silver Theater by Grover Jones and True Boardman. Miss Davis has chosen as her leading man, Carlton Cadell, well-known radio actor. An important role will be played also by a very young lady about whom I think Miss Davis would like to tell you something. Right, Betty? Yes, Conrad. The young lady is a protege of mine, Pamela Cavanis. She plays the part of Nina Maloff, a girl of her own age, 15 years. Today marks Pamela's first public appearance, and I hope the Silver Theater audience received as much pleasure from her performance as I did 
when I first heard a scene and saw her act. I want to wish her luck in her debut and to thank Silver Theater for giving me this opportunity to present her. Thank you, Betty. And now the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the first act of Broken Prelude starring Betty Davis as Julia Connors. Our scene, the women's quarters of a penitentiary. Along the narrow corridor between the rows of cells moves a solitary figure, chief matron of the prison. Before one door, she stops. Connors? Connors, come along. You're wanted in the warden's office. Oh, don't let me rush you, dearie. I've got all day. Come along. Connors is going out. <laughs> She's got a day with a walk. <laughs> Give him my love, Connors. Give him my love. Yeah. Come on, Connors. Move along. Shut up, the rest of you. All right, Connors. Here she is, Mr. Parkman. Oh, yes. Come in, Connors. You, uh, know Mr. Thomas here. Julia. I told you it was a waste of time. I don't think so, sir. Mr. Thomas has just come from the parole board, Connors. He's convinced them that considering the circumstances of your conviction, you should be paroled in his custody. So, you're going out today. I tell you frankly, Connors, he got the board to release you only against my recommendation. I'll have to admit that in many ways you've been a model prisoner, but... Warden. Oh, yes. Yes. Mr. Thomas has asked permission to talk to you alone, and, uh, Well, come, Matron. Julia. <laughs> Julia. <laughs> Paroled in your custody. <laughs> Julia, listen to me. We've got to get this straight, you and I, now. Before you go out of here. You can't see what these three years have done to you. You're not the Julia Connors who stood up and pled guilty in that courtroom. You're a different person. Someone I... I don't even know. Is that all you have to say? No. Julia, you can't do it. I know what's in your mind. Marsha Wallace. You think that Marsha Wallace framed you, and because of that... I know she framed you. All right, you know it, then. And from the moment that you found it out, you've lived for just one thing. To get out of here and find Marsha Wallace again. That's true, isn't it? Julia, answer me. Yes, it's true, and I will find her. There's nothing you can do to stop me. A model prisoner, sure I was. Because I was out to cut down the sentence that you wished on me, Mr. Public Prosecutor. Six months. That's what you'd get me off with. But I must plead guilty. You said the cards were stacked against me, and I was sure to be convicted. But just by a plea of guilty, you could fix it. Maybe even get me off. Julia. Five years. That's what your friend, the judge, said. Five years. And I was innocent. I've tried to tell you a hundred times there was no other way. The evidence was there to convict you, and I... And evidence was all that mattered. A girl scared and desperate and swearing that she was innocent. And that didn't mean anything to you. Well, I'm not scared now, Paul Thomas. I'm not desperate. If anyone ever knew what the score is, a girl named Julia Connors does. The state and Marsha Wallace owe me three years. Three years, and I'm going to collect from both of them. Julia, you can't. You'll bring yourself right back to this place. Sure, I'll be back. And next time I won't be innocent. Oh, listen to No, me. I tried that once before. And as for that little joke of me being under parole to you, we'll both forget it now. Will we? Warden, matron. Yes, what is it? I suppose I go out at four o'clock, don't I? Well, that's customary, yes. But as long as Mr. Thomas came all Then over... I'll go back to my cell and wait till four. And when I go out, I'll go alone. All right, matron. Come on, Connors. What is this? My cell's the other way. You're not going to your cell. Why she should want to see you beats me. But as long as she does want to, you're getting no chance to refuse. What are you talking about? You'll find out in here. In the hospital ward, but... How's about stopping that phonograph? Yeah, that phone's driving us nuts. Turn the thing off, can't you? Shut up! Shut up, all of you! Shut up! Marloff wants that record playing, and she's going to have it. Hey, if it's Marloff sent for me, I won't see her. What's Marloff to me? Just because we're in the same cell for two years. Say, listen, this ought to mean something even to you, Connors. 
Malaf's dying. That's why those screens are around her bed. The doctor don't give her two days. Oh, well, why'd she have to ask for me? Well, that's something I can't figure out either. But she did. And you're seeing her. Now. Oh, I won't do it. That's record of hers. While I was in the cell with her, she played it 10,000 times. Even if she is sick, there's nothing that I can... Oh, all right. Go on. You can move that screen, but don't make a noise. The nurse said she wasn't to be excited. Okay. Anna? Julia. Julia. Hello, Anna. Listen. That's... That's me, Julia. I know. Anna Malos. Soloist with the... With the Chicago Symphony. The Anna Malos. It... It is not bad, Julia. Oh, no, it's good, Anna. It's wonderful. She can be proud of that anyway. Can't she, Julia? Oh, that can make up to her for... For other things, for me. Make up to... Oh, Anna, you know, you must be quiet and rest. You're not... Uh, I know what you think. But because I am sick, I... I see crazy things. Like out of my head. Oh, no. No, this is not like that. I know, Julia. I know what I'm saying. The, uh, the record, I'll turn it off. No, 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 again, Julia. Play it again. The others, maybe, then they... They do not hear what I tell you. Oh, no, they must not know, Julia. Only you. You go out today and... You are different. I... I know. You can understand... Oh, the, the, the record again, Julia. Sure. Sure, Anna. Now, come on, tell me. What is it, Anna? I'm going out. It's true. I've been proven. Oh, can you go see her, Julia? Oh, you... You've got to go. I can... I can ask nobody else. Come to see who, Anna? Nina. Nina? My daughter. Your d- Fifteen she is, Julia. Fifteen last month. Oh, and Julia, believe me, there, there is a greatness in my girl. I, I know it. You should hear her sing. Oh, but she must have a chance. You see that, Julia? Yes, 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 Anna, and she will have. If your Nina can oh, sing... Oh, but not she... with him. No, no, not with him. She can have no chance with him. He, he hates her. Because she is my child, he hates her. He told her I'm here, Julia. I begged him that she should never know. No. And yet, yet he told her. She wrote to me and, and told me that she knew. Hush, Anna, hush. You mean your father told her? Oh, no, 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 no. Her stepfather, he is. Joe Renato is his name. And, oh, Julia, tell me you go to see her. There is, there is nothing you can do, maybe, but, but you can see her. You can tell her I, I have said that always she must sing. That what has become of me must, must make no difference. I say you will go, Julia. He, look, look here, the address I have written down. One three five Cornelia Street. One, three, five, Cornelia. One. Oh, Julia. Oh, Julia. You do not say you will go. Oh, I'll go, Anna. Uh, One, three, five, Cornelia Street. Sure, I'll go. Goodbye, Anna. Good. Goodbye, Julia. Oh, it's not. It not matter so much now what. What happens to me? Just so you see her and. Tell her what I say. Goodbye, Julia. Mason, take me out of here. All right, this way. Hmm. And I think that of everybody in the place she chooses you to tell. Yeah, well, I wish to God she hadn't. And you were lying, weren't you? You'll never go see that kid. Connors, you were lying. Sure I was. Sure I was lying. Why shouldn't I? Why should you pick me to tell a sob story to? I've got my own business to attend to. 
business that nobody's going to interfere with. And what's Mollus' kid to me? So she can sing. Oh, that's great. I suppose I should look her up and maybe have her sing for me. Maybe that song I've already heard a thousand times before. Julia Connors, ex-convict turning good Samaritan, rescuing 15-year-old singers in distress. <laughs> oh, that's rich. It's wonderful. It's the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Just heard Act One of Broken Prelude, starring Betty Davis. Before we continue with Act Two, here's a man with a few words about Christmas. Not a white Christmas or a gray Christmas, but a silver Christmas. John Carty. The stores are bright with holly, and on every face you see, there's an air of expectancy and excitement as that day of days draws closer. And what a truly memorable Christmas it will be for someone you love, if it's a sterling silver Christmas. For here is a gift that will endure for generations. The gift of solid silver of imperishable beauty, proudly created by International Sterling. If she already owns International Sterling Silver, make this Christmas the occasion to complete her sterling service by adding salad forks or other matching pieces. She'll be proud of your taste and thoughtfulness in giving sterling silver and proud of your cleverness at knowing just the right pattern and the right pieces. Or if she's a woman who has always longed for solid silver but never had it, here is your chance to start a service for her. Give International Sterling's lovely Me to You set. This is a place setting for one person. Six lustrous pieces of solid silver in the Enchantress pattern, costing only $16.75. Your silverware dealer will welcome the opportunity to help you select the right gift and the right pattern. So go there tomorrow. Find out about the budget payment plan. For this is indeed the Christmas to give solid silver by International Sterling. Once again, the lights are dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on Act Two of Broken Prelude, starring Betty Davis as Julia Connors. Four o'clock has come and gone. Through the door which marks the boundary between freedom and imprisonment has walked the figure of Julia Connors alone. Early the same evening finds her in that crossroads of humanity that is New York's Grand Central Station. Uh, excuse me, miss, is something wrong? I mean, you, you look as if... The... All those people, they're all of them, all free. All of them, aren't they? Just going anywhere they want to. It's funny. Funny? Oh, don't don't mind me. I just want a taxi. Oh, yes, yeah, I'm right out here. Thanks. Taxi here. Get a yellow cab. Taxi lady. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Where to? 507 East 54th Street. And hurry. The young lady's wrong, driver. Paul. We want to go to 576 West 49th Street. Huh? Okay. You see, Julia, Marshal Wallace doesn't live at that address anymore. You're only wasting your time looking for it. So, you've been following me ever since I left up there, haven't you? Suppose we put it that I happened to come down on the same train. I told her I wanted to be left alone. Julia, there's one thing you overlook. You are under parole to me. And it depends on me whether or not you go back to serve those other two years. Oh, I see. And you'd send me back, wouldn't you? You'd love to send me back. It's the one thing I don't want to do. And you're not going to force me to. That's why you're coming with me now. <laughs> How do you like it? I'm more used to apartments that have bars in the windows. Here, let me take your coat. Oh, that won't be necessary. See, I'm not staying. But you are. Ah, uh-huh. I get it now. Excuse me. I evidently didn't understand what being paroled in someone's custody was supposed to mean. This is your apartment, Julia. I happen to be paying for it, yes, but only until we've found you a job so that you can support yourself. Accepting nothing from you, Paul Thomas. Why should I? I'll tell you why. It's a simple story, Julia. A lawyer who happens to be a deputy district attorney. A case is turned over to him to prosecute. A blackmail case involving a girl of 
whom he is very fond. There's just one thing he can do. He weighs all the evidence. He gives that girl his best advice. Promises her his help. Oh, you're wasting time. I know but all... But his advice proves wrong. His help is anything but that. And the girl he wanted to protect suffers more because of him. That's why, Julia. Because that man realizes there's nothing he could do for that girl to make up for his mistake. But he can try. Say that you'll stay here, Julia. No. You know, Julia, it's really not such a bad apartment. There's a swell view of the river from the kitchen window. I said I wasn't staying. And in case you feel like music, a combination radio and phonograph. I just guessed at the records. Listen, I'll play one. Oh, let's cut the little comedy, Paul. I told you before where I was going and what I was going to do to find Marsha. I told you, too, that... Turn that off. All right. You know. The matron told me. No, I think I see another answer. The whole thing was framed, wasn't it? A little idea of yours, even having Marloff tell me that tale about... No, Julia. It wasn't framed. You see, Anna Maloff got out of prison today, too. Just before you did. Only in a different way. Oh, did she? What are you going to do? Well, that's my business. She died believing you'd keep your word to her. Oh, but why should I? What's Anna Maloff to me? I phoned down for a report on the stepfather. And Joe Renardo was anything but a new name at headquarters. That address on Cornelia Street is a so-called club that he operates as a front for gambling. A swell place for that 15-year-old daughter of Anna's. Oh, will you shut up? I'm getting out of here. Getting out, do you understand? I told you what I was going to do. And parole or not, you can't stop me. I'm going to find Marsha Wallace. Uh, who, ma'am? Marsha Wallace. Is she here? Miss Wallace? No, ma'am. She ain't lived here for more than two years. Last I knowed Miss Wallace was at the Chelsea, ma'am. You go see me. Chelsea. I can ask Chelsea. nobody else. Hey, is that all you wanted, ma'am? Yes, the Chelsea, you say. I'll find the thanks. She was only here a month, but you could probably find her through Chorus Equity. Oh, Chorus Equity, yes. Yes, I should have thought of that. The others must not know. No, me, Julia. You go out today. You are different. You understand. Oh, no. No. What did you say? Oh, nothing, nothing. It's. It's just that I'm having trouble finding Marsha. Thanks, I'll, I'll try equity. Marsha Wallace? Why, yes, yeah, she's dancing at the green slipper up on the post road. You've got to go, Julia. There is nothing you can do, maybe, but you've got to go see her. One, three, five, Cornelia. Stop. Oh, you've got to go, Julia. Stop it, stop it! Huh? So, so hard. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, a, I'm just a little upset, I hear. The green slipper on the post road, you say. Well, well, thank you. I've been looking for Marsha for a long time, and I, I'm glad I found her. I'm glad. Yes, Miss. Where to? What? Hey, are you all right? I'm. I mean. Oh, uh, I'm all right. Take me to. Uh, yeah. Take me to. 135 Cornelia Street. Here, driver. Thanks. And say, miss, it's, uh, it's none of my business, but you're not going in that place alone, are you? You're right, it is none of your business. Well, I got them all before. The driver was right, Julia. Paul. And you're not going in there alone. So you're waiting for me. You are that sure. I wasn't sure, Julia. But this was our one hope. If you hadn't come here tonight, I'd have known that you... Oh, you are wonderful. You think you've had your way, don't you? Well, you haven't. I came here tonight, yes. Well, because I said I would. But nothing else has changed. After I've seen the girl, I'll, I'll go right on from where I left off. Oh, and in case you're interested, I found Marsha. Julia. I'm going in now and get this over. You can... Come and out, it makes no difference to me. It does to me, and perhaps to you, Julia. Have you thought how you'll get to see the girl? It probably won't be enough just to tell her stepfather that you came from Anna. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Well, I have. Come, we'll go in. I'd suggest you let me do the talking. 
Check your hat, sir. Oh, thanks. Uh, is Joe Renardo around? Yes, sir. Right over there. I'll get it. Oh, you said some kind of a club. This is just an ordinary bar. A front for the club inside, and the club in turn is a front for the gambling room upstairs. A little complicated, but Renardo's found it practical. He... Good evening. You wanted to see me? Oh, Renardo? Well, yes. Uh, Tony Morelli suggested that we drop in and see you. Glad to have you. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Miss Connors, Mr. Renardo. Hello. Oh, yeah. And incidentally, Joe, uh, suppose I said I felt lucky tonight. Think the place could do something about it? You can go right up to the rooms now if you want. But if you take my tip, you'll come back to the club room first. The kid's just started her number, and she's worth hearing. The kid? My daughter. Didn't Tony tell you about her? I got her singing now. Does all right, too. What do you say, Julia? Like to hear the girl? Sure, why not? Then uh, you're going now? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, show Miss Connors to a table, will you, Renardo? I've got a phone call to make. I'll be right in. Sure. Sure. Come along, Miss Connors. Here you are. Swell table. Thanks. Well? What do you think? The kid's not so bad, is she? No. No, no she's not. Well, the waiter will take your order when you're ready, Miss Connors. I'll see you later. I can't erase your beautiful face before me. Well, Julia, what do you think now? Paul, Paul, let's get out of here. Get out of here? Why not? I've seen the kid and she's all right, and that's all I said. You said her. you'd talk to her. Oh, I won't. Why don't you keep out of this? You're not leaving already. Yes, we. I've you... just been persuading Miss Connors to stay, Renardo, and I, I think another number from that daughter of yours might do the trick. Oh, Paul. But I think Miss Connors agrees with me that with a voice like hers, the girl ought to sing a different kind of song. Can she do None But the Lonely Heart? Paul, no. None but the... Well, I don't know, but I'll ask her. Is this more of what you call humor? Listen, Julia. You're to stay here with the girl, do you understand? Whatever happens. No, I don't understand, and I want you to keep out of this. You can't run my life, Paul Thomas. You tried that once, and I... That girl, Julia. That kid in this kind of a place. Shut up. And that voice singing for Joe Renato's customer. Oh, shut up. Out the back door, everybody, quick. Nobody leaves this room. Oh, that was why you phoned. I had them waiting. It's the one sure way to get rid of Renardo. Remember, you're to stay here. Whatever happens, you're to stay here with the girl. Okay, Mr. Thomas, they're all loaded. You say you're coming down to see about booking them? Yes. Uh, the lady here ain't to go, huh? No. And uh, that young kid's in the next room. What about her? Oh, I'll bring her out here. Uh, okay. Now, listen, Paul. I tell you, I'm not. Come in here, kid. Are, are you going to take me, too? No, Nina, we're not. It's just that Miss Connors here wants to talk to you. She's a friend of your mother's. Of my mother's? I've got to go. Come, officer. Paul! <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? And what is all this? Oh, you heard him Why say... Why didn't they take us, too? You heard him say, Why, Nina? Because I'm a friend of your mother's. Oh. You mean from a long time ago? You sang in the same company with her or something? No, I didn't sing with her. Well, mother's away now, you know. On business. She'll be gone quite a while, so if you... I just saw your mother this morning, Nina. This morning? Oh, then you're from... Yes. Just I got out this afternoon. Oh. How... How is my mother? She sent you a message. A message? Yeah, she... Uh, she wants you to keep on singing. Well, I've been doing that. Joe wouldn't let me stop if I wanted to. He says it's good for his business to have me sing. But, of course, that's not the kind of singing she wants me to do. Did you ever hear my mother sing? Yes. I heard her. She's one of the greatest contraltos of our day. An opera critic said that in a review. I read it in her scrapbook. She wants me to sing an opera, too. Uh, later on, I mean. Yeah, I'm sure she does. But you haven't told me anything about her. 
How she looks in her, me think. You see, after I... I found out I wanted to go up and see her right away. You know, to tell her I didn't care. I mean that I understand. You know. Yeah. I know. But Joe wouldn't let me. Of course, I wrote to her, but that's not the same thing. I told her I hated staying with Joe. But it'd be okay till... till she got out. But she hasn't answered yet. Do you know how soon her sentence is over? Why are you so funny? Why don't you answer me? Nina. Nina, listen to me. Your mother... Yeah? Um, Nina, you've got to give up the idea of going up to see your mother or of uh, her getting out. What do you mean? Well, you... You have to know sometime, I suppose. Your uh, mother died, Nina, this afternoon... It's it's better for her, Nina, and, and she wanted it this way, believe me. Oh, I'm the last person she talked to, and she told me she didn't care. She didn't care, except for you. As long as you're all right, that's all that mattered to her. Oh, and she's happier now. She's better off. Don't you see that, Nina? Sure. Sure. I guess I do. And, and like I said, she wants you to keep on singing. But I can't. Not for her. I mean... Like she wanted me to. When Joe comes back, you Oh, why did she have to die? <laughs> Nina. Nina, now, Nina, stop it. You've got to. And don't you worry about Joe. You're going away from here. Now, listen to me. You must have some other relatives, aunts or uncles, somebody you could go to. I haven't, though. I'll have to stay with Joe. Well, you won't. No, that's one thing you won't do. You're leaving here tonight. Leaving here? Sure. With me. You mean to stay? Oh, it's crazy. It'll mess everything, but... But you are leaving. You're right. Your mother did want you to sing different songs. And you're going to sing them. And I'm going to sing that you do. tell you something about next week's episode of Broken Prelude. But first, here's a man who'd like to help the men in our audience with their Christmas lists. John Carty. If you'd like to see the eyes of the woman you love shine with a new light this Christmas morning, make your gift to her America's finest silver plate. For here indeed is a gift to cherish a lifetime. Gleaming silver plate by 1847 Rogers Brothers. The name 1847 Rogers Brothers first won recognition... 91 years ago, when in a little New England town, a small company of silversmiths distinguished themselves by creating the finest silver plate this country had ever seen. The painstaking skill of those early craftsmen, the patient, loving devotion to the ideals of beauty and quality, have endured to this day, reaching even greater heights with the creation of their latest pattern, First Love. For the First Love ornament is deeply etched and richly raised in a perfection of craftsmanship formerly found only in sterling silver. And this loveliest of silver plate can be yours at special savings this Christmas. For example, the Silver Theater set, a magnificent 62-piece service in a handsome rosewood finish cabinet, costs only $59.75, $14 less than open stock price. Visit your silverware dealer tomorrow and see this stunning service in the first love pattern. And another beautiful 1847 Rogers Brothers patterns also. Learn on what easy, convenient terms you can get America's finest silver plate, 1847 Rogers Brothers. Next Sunday on Silver Theater, we'll conclude the story of Broken Prelude, starring Betty Davis as Julia Connors and featuring Carlton Cadell as Paul Thomas, and Miss Davis's own protege, 15-year-old Pamela Cavanis, as Nina Maloff. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com.
International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring Betty Davis in Broken Prelude, directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you in behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware, International Sterling, world-famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Welcome you to the 12th of the new series of Silver Theater Dramatic Productions. Next Sunday and the Sunday following, you will hear Ida Lupino and Conrad Nagel in David Garth's Red Book Magazine story, Challenge for Three. And in weeks to come, many more great stars and a score of thrilling and entertaining stories. And here is our director, Conrad Nagel, to tell you about today's play. Today's Silver Theater presents the second and concluding episode of Broken Prelude. An original drama by True Boardman and Grover Jones, starring Betty Davis as Julia Connors, and Carlton Cadell as Paul Thomas, and Miss Davis's 15-year-old protege, Pamela Cavanus as Nina Maloff. And now for our play. The lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the first act of the concluding episode of Broken Prelude. Three months have passed since Julia Connors was released from prison. And on that very day, took young Nina Maloff away from the gambling club operated by her stepfather, Joe Renardo. They've been months filled with problems for Julia, for the girl Nina, and no less for Paul Thomas, young deputy district attorney in whose custody Julia is paroled. As our curtain rises, Julia and Paul are discussing the problem of Nina with Judge Ernest Gordon, chief jurist of our juvenile court. I ask you here because I want you to understand my position in this case. I'm sure you both realize Nina Maloff is technically a ward of the court. While you, Miss Connors, well, to be frank... To be frank, I've got a record. I'm a convict on parole. And you don't think I'm the proper person to care for Nina. That's it, isn't it? Julia, Your Honor, there are other factors I don't think you consider. For one thing, the care Miss Connors has been taking of Nina these last three months. The things she has done to start the child in her career. Paul. Oh. Julia got a job three days after she was released. As a sales girl in a music store. Because then she could take operatic records home at night for Nina to hear. And there was the matter of lessons. Never mind, Paul. I can fight my own battles. Judge Gordon, do you know who the child's teacher is? Martucci. Martucci? But, Miss Connors, how could you afford... She can't. That's the point. Julia laid personal siege to Martucci's studio and practically browbeat him into accepting Nina as a pupil. And for about one-tenth his usual price. I tell you all this has nothing to do with it, Paul. On the contrary, it may have a great deal to do with it. The fact that you've been making certain sacrifices with the child... Sacrifices nothing. Nina's mother was my cellmate for two years. The day I was leaving, Anna sent for me. She was dying. And she begged me to look her kid up and see... Well, see that she was taken care of. And that's all I'm interested in. But as I recall, this department has suggested three different couples as possible foster parents for Nina. And each time you found some objection to them. Well, they weren't the right ones. Well, the kid's got talent. Her mother thought she could be a great singer. And, and maybe she can. So if anybody's going to adopt her, it should be somebody who can help her. I see. Then if this court proposed the girl's adoption by someone who could further the child's musical career, you'd be perfectly agreeable. Sure, why not? Why should I want to keep her? I've got my own life to live. But there's still the problem as to whether I can allow you to continue caring for Nina in the meantime. Why not? She's doing all right. Why not? Miss Connors, what was your profession before you went to prison? I was entertainer in a cabaret. So I understand. I also understand that working with you was a girl named Marsha Wallace. So what about her? Just this. Did you or did you not say before you left prison that you'd get revenge on Marsha Wallace because, as you put it, she framed you? Well, Miss Connors? Yes, I said that. Miss Connors, if I allow you to keep Nina for the present, have I your word that you will forego whatever action you intended against this Marsha Wallace? I've got to be going. Julia, wait. You haven't... Nina's at home alone, and I I've got to take her someplace at five o'clock. It's important. I can't wait here. Goodbye. Julia. Your Honor, I'm sorry. But it's as I told you. Julia... Won't... I'm sorry, too, Thomas. I know how you feel about Miss Connors, and I wanted to try to help you. But under the circumstances, I'm afraid I'm going to have to take definite action. <laughs> Yes, 
Here's the theater, miss. We made it. Two minutes to five. Fine. Come on, Nina. Here, driver. Thanks. We go in here, Nina. But what is all this, Julia? Why are you so excited? Why don't you tell me? Nina, inside there waiting for us, or rather for you, is a man named Charles Renison. Renison? Yes. The manager of the San Marco Opera Company. For six weeks I've been hounding him to give you an audition. And you're getting it. Today. Julia! Now don't Julia me. Come on. Yes, miss. Well, you're lucky. We had an appointment with. Oh, Mr. Rennison, I hope we're not late. Oh, not at all. Boris, hold it a moment, will you? This is Nina Maloff. Nina, Mr. Rennison. How do you do? Hello, Miss Maloff. What would you like to sing? Anything you say. Well, that covers a pretty broad field. The orchestra's been rehearsing some of the music for La Traviata. You know anything from that? How about Darfour Saint Louis? Oh, sure you want to try that? I'd just as soon. All right. Boris! Yes, Mr. Renison? Uh, Boris, the young lady's going to... Uh... Oh, Miss Marloff, Mr. Boris Coleman. How do you do? It is an honor, Miss Marloff. I was a friend of your mother. I... Oh, I'm glad. Uh, Miss Marloff's going to sing the Darfour Saint Louis. Oh, Good, splendid. Now, come along, Miss. Yes, and, and we'll listen from out front. Coming, Miss Connors? But just a minute, please. Nina. Yeah? Good luck, darling. You're not afraid? Uh-uh. Guess I can't be, can I? This has got to be good for both our sakes. You're right. Now go on up there and sing. Julia? Yes? Kiss me for luck, will you? Why? Sure, Nina. Thanks. Now beat it. All right, Julia. I'm ready, Mr. Coleman. All right. Okay, Anna Malov. Your daughter's got her chance. Now maybe you'd better start helping her. Oh, it's got to be good. It's got to be good. to cry about. Very fine, Nina. Excellent. All right, Miss Connors, I'm sold. Come back in the morning. We'll talk it over. Oh, thank you. 
find him there on the stage, Mrs. Anderson. Thank you, Steve. Charles. Charles, darling, did you forget we had an appointment? Oh, I'm glad you're here, my dear. Uh, Nina Mallow, Miss Connors, I'd like to have you meet my wife. Your wife? How do you... Julia. Marsha. Marsha Wallace. <laughs> And so ends Act One of Broken Prelude, starring Betty Davis. Before we continue with the second act, here's a man with a Christmas thought. John Conti. By this time next week, the suspense will be all over. You'll know exactly what was in even the most curious-shaped Christmas package. And many of you, I hope, will find this Christmas a particularly happy one. Because it brings you the gleaming loveliness of 1847 Rogers Brothers' silver plate. Silver plate in the glamorous pattern, first love. For this is the new and sensational pattern that brings to silver plate for the first time the miracle of sterling silver craftsmanship. Craftsmanship which etches the rich floral ornament more deeply, raises it higher, gives it beauty and elegance undreamed of before. Craftsmanship possible only to a house rooted in tradition. A house of 91 years supremacy in silver plate design. The famous house of 1847 Rogers Brothers. This Christmas... 1847 Rogers Brothers offer their glorious silver plate at special savings. The Silver Theater set, a beautiful 62-piece service in a stunning rosewood finish cabinet, costs only $59.75, a saving of more than $14 over open stock price. It comes not only in the first love pattern, but in other attractive 1847 Rogers Brothers patterns also. Visit your silverware dealer tomorrow. Find out what easy, convenient payment terms can be arranged and make your Christmas a silver Christmas with America's finest silver plate, 1847 Rogers Brothers. Once again, the lights are being dimmed and the silver curtain is rising on the final act of Broken Prelude. Several weeks have passed. Nina is under contract to Marsha Wallace's husband, Charles Renison. And after long and arduous rehearsal, the night of Nina's debut has come at last. Then on the following morning, there's cause for celebration as over the breakfast table, Julia and Nina read reviews of the performance. Nina's youthful and flawless voice brought a freshness and vitality to the character and gave primary importance to this usually minor role. There is little doubt but that the young newcomer is assured a brilliant future. Well, there you are. That's all of them. Oh, Julia, I think swell. Swell? They're a bunch of lies, and you know it. Drink your milk. A bunch of lies? Nina Malas, flawless voice. Humbug. You were flat six times in the second act. Julia, I wasn't. Well, once anyway, I think. I know what you mean, Julia. You're afraid maybe I'll... Well, that those things in the paper will make a difference. They won't, Julia. Honest. I know that part of those things are just... Well, just because I'm a kid. Well, well, if you realize that, maybe there's some hope for you. Pass the toast. Julia, I just thought of something. Now you can quit your store job, you know it. I need you with me at the theater, I mean. You know, be sure I look all right. Check on my singing and all. Oh, everything. no, no. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's a typical stage mother. When it comes to a career, I always say a mother's place is... Mother. Julia, do you know what you said? Well, well, suppose I did. Maybe it's not such a bad idea. Oh, Julia, I'm so happy. I didn't think I could be so happy. <laughs> come to think of it, neither did I. Hey, come on now. You get on to your practicing. This... I'll go. Hello, Paul. Hello, Nina. Paul, have you seen the reviews? Yes, Julia. Oh, and thank you for the flower store. <laughs> what did you try to do, buy out a flower store? I thought Nina was going to... What's wrong? Well, Nina, you better go in the other room. Paul. But what is it? I want to know. Go on, Nina. You don't need to say anything. Your friend Judge Gordon is going to take her away from me. Yes, Julia. Oh, he would wait for a time like this. If you'll remember, you told him you wanted to be rid of her. You also said that you'd make no objection to Nina's being adopted, provided the right family wanted her. Oh, but a career. In this case, if anything, her career would be helped. Oh, well, I guess that's that then. That means a good home for her and all the other things she needs. Oh, that's swell. 
That's all I was worried about. Down in your heart, you want that girl, Julia. You could fight to keep her. Maybe I've fought too long. Maybe I'm tired of it. All right, Julia. But there's one thing I think you ought to know. The people that want to adopt Nina are Charles and Marsha Renison. Marsha? Yes, Julia. Marsha, Marsha Wallace adopting Nina. Marsha taking that kid away from me now. Oh, it's wonderful. And I'll bet you think she's going to get away with it. Julia, then you will fight it. You won't let them take her. Fight? Oh, you've never even seen me start, Paul Thomas. There's nothing I wouldn't do to stop Marsha Wallace from getting that child. Nothing, do you understand? We'll take it to court. And I'll back you, Julia. I'll back you Court? To... Oh, no, no. We won't take it to court. Because I'll settle it before it ever gets to court. A long time before. And I'm starting now. <laughs> admit it, Your Honor. I did go to Marsha Renison's house, and I did mean to harm her. If that was necessary to keep her from taking Nina. That's what their lawyer has been trying to prove to you in this hearing, Your Honor. Well, he can save his breath, I admit. Well, that's very considerate of Miss Connors. May I continue, Your Honor? Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Marlowe. I submit, Your Honor, that this action Miss Connors has just confessed, considered by the side of her previous record as a convicted felon, shows her unfit to be guaranteed permanent custody of the child Nina Meloff. While on the other hand, the fitness of my clients, Mr. and Mrs. Renison, is self-evident. I believe that's all that need be said. Mr. Renison, Your Honor, you are fully aware of the responsibility that this adoption entails. Fully, Your Honor. And you, Mrs. Renison? Your Honor, I haven't had a chance to see much of Nina, but even from the little I have seen of her, I'm genuinely fond of the child. You have my word that... But I'd like to do my best to take her mother's place. Take her mother's place. <laughs> Miss Connors, please. Mrs. Renison. That, that's all, Your Honor. Except that I can't understand Julia feeling the way she does. Now, Mr. Thomas. Your Honor. I think it would be well if you would bring in the child herself. Yes, Your Honor. Well, Nina. Yes, Paul? Come in now. Come in, Nina. Come in and sit down. Nina, you probably know the purpose of this hearing. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Thomas. Now, Nina, don't be frightened and just answer the questions we ask you. First of all, do you feel that Julia has, has taken good care of you? I mean, have you been comfortable and well-fed? You know I have, Paul. But in this case, the judge wants to know. Now about your music. Did Julia make you practice regularly? Two hours a day and three on Saturday. She was strict? I'll say she was. She said I couldn't stay with her if I didn't work. All right, Your Honor. Mr. Morrow, have you any questions to ask the child? Thank you, Your Honor. Nina, you say Miss Connors took such good care of you. What kind of hours did you keep? I mean, what time did you usually go to bed? Oh, about 11 or sometimes 12. Oh, you stayed up till 12 o'clock regularly. I said 11 or 12. Besides, it was only because she brought records home for me to hear and she had to take them back the next day. Nina, did you ever hear Miss Connors mention the name of Marsha Wallace? Paul... Do I have to answer that? Yes, Nina. Well, yes. What did she say about Marsha Wallace? That that she had framed her, and, and when she got rid of me, she was going to get even, but, but she didn't mean that. I know she didn't. One more question, Nina. Did either Miss Connors or Mr. Thomas prompt you what to say at this hearing? Yes, they both did. Oh, they prompted you. And what did they tell you to say, Nina? They told me to tell the truth. Is that all, Mr. Morrow? Yes, Your Honor. Now, Nina, I have to ask your opinion about something very important. I know what you're going to ask me, and I can tell you the answer now, Judge. I want to stay with Julia. Please, Judge. You don't understand about things. Julia needs me, and I guess I need her, but Mr. Renison's all right, and his wife, too, but they can adopt somebody else. I belong to Julia now. Don't you see? That's what we're here to decide, Nina. You'd better go out again for a few minutes. Julia... Do I have to? Go on, Nina. Okay. And now, Miss Connors, Mr. and Mrs. Renison have each spoken in their own behalf. It's only fair that you should have the same privilege. Well? I have nothing to say. Julia. What's the use? It's all decided. It was decided before it started. It was decided three years ago when a jury of 12 infallible men and women said that Julia Connors was guilty as charged. I'm not a fit person to take care of Nina. I'm a convict. This court says so. 
And there's not the slightest chance in the world that this court could be wrong. Julia. All right, take the kid. Take her and see if I care. Because I don't, do you understand? I don't care. I'm glad she's out of my way. Julia. Your Honor, she doesn't know what she's saying. Give me one minute, please. I'll bring her back. Julia. I'm getting out of here. And I say you're not. Julia, what is it? What's happened? Now, Julia, listen to me. Listen. Let go of me. Paul, you're hurting her. Go on back in there. Listen to Marsha's speeches. They're much prettier than I can make and funnier. Julia, you're a fool. Do you understand that? A blind, stubborn, childish fool. I've been fighting with you through all of this. But now if I have to, I'm fighting against you. Paul. And it's a fight for more than keeping Nina. It's a fight for you yourself, Julia. And for our love. You're going back in there. I won't. I'm not asking you. You're going back in that courtroom. You're going to stop being blinded by your hatred for Marsha Wallace and tell the truth. You're going to let Judge Gordon see the Julia Connors that is deserving of being Nina's mother. The Julia Connors that I knew and fell in love with before all of this happened. You're going to break through this wall you built around yourself. And let Judge Gordon know the things that even you won't admit are in your heart. It's the one chance, Julia. The only chance. Oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I can, Paul. You see, there's so many things between you. You've got to try, Julia. And you're going to. Julia, please do what Paul says. Please. Well, Julia? All right. You better wait here, Nina. I will. Your Honor, Miss Connors is ready now. Very well. Judge, uh, Judge Gordon, I'm, I'm sorry for a minute ago and what I said was a lie. I do want Nina. Paul has just told me that my only chance in this hearing is to tell you the absolute truth. All right. Then, first of all, I was innocent of the crime I went to prison for. Marsha, in your heart you know that's true. She does, Your Honor, but she won't tell you so. And you won't believe me. I bet you can believe this. I love that child and I need her. You see, Your Honor, during the three years of my sentence, there was something, something that died inside me. And, and Nina Malaf brought it to life again. I don't know any clearer way to tell you than that. A long time ago, I gave up asking for things and started fighting. I'm not fighting now. I'm begging you to let me keep Nina Malaf. Thank you, Miss Connors. All of the parties concerned having been heard, it is the duty of this court to make its decision. I want you to realize that I have tried to be influenced neither by emotion nor by personal feeling. But I have considered only the ultimate welfare of the child. Therefore, it is the decision of this court that permanent custody of Nina Marloff be granted to Charles and Marsha Renison. Julia. Thank you, Your Honor. Charles. I... Let's get out of here. Marsha. I tell you, I can't stand it. Take me out of here. Mr. Thomas, Miss Connors, I'm sorry. With a prison record, there was nothing else I could do. I'm sorry. Julia. Julia, you mustn't take it like this. There's... Will you please go? Just leave me alone. But, Julia, my darling... I just want to be left alone. <laughs> I could do it. But not now. I can't. Not any longer. Marsha. Marsha, my dear, you... Charles, you won't stop me. Julia, for three years I've lived in a kind of hell. Because I let you go to prison for a crime that I committed. I was afraid. And, and so I lied. But I'm telling the truth now. To the judge. To everyone if necessary. You'll have Nina. You deserve her and... 
You're going to have her? I'm not sure what they'll do to me. I don't even care. At least I'll... I'll know some kind of peace again. Marsha. That's all. I'm going now. Marsha. Yes? Maybe... Maybe it won't be necessary to tell too many people. You see... Whatever crime there was three years ago. Well, I think it's already been pretty well paid for. Oh, Julia. Come, Marsha, my dear. Julia, then it's all right. Everything, I mean. I can stay with you. <laughs> yes, Nina. Everything's all right. Hey, you're crying. But why should you cry now? Oh, nonsense, I'm laughing. Oh, Nina. Oh, pardon me, you two, but remember me? <laughs> Paul. Or should I go, too? Go. Well, at a moment like this, I hesitate to intrude on the family. But you're a part of the family, Paul. Why, Nina. Julia. Well, this, uh, this seems to be the day for truth coming out, doesn't it? Oh, Julia. Paul, darling. Hey, remember me? <laughs> In just a few seconds, Betty Davis will come back to greet you in person. First, we'd like to remind you that while there are only six more shopping days before Christmas, there is something you can do about it. If you will, please, John. Ladies and gentlemen, there is still time to give your wife or mother or sweetheart the grandest Christmas gift of her life. Lustrous solid silver by International Sterling. Your silverware dealer has services in many sizes and a wide variety of exquisite patterns which can be yours on easy, convenient payment terms. If the one you're giving to already owns international sterling silver, find out the name of her pattern and make your Christmas gift extra salad forks or other pieces in the matching pattern. For remember, any woman can be a more gracious and charming hostess if her silverware is beautiful and adequate. But perhaps you'd like to start a sterling service for someone instead. You can very easily indeed by giving one of International Sterling's lovely Me to You sets. This is a place setting for one person created in the rich loveliness of the Enchantress pattern and costs only $16.75. Visit your silverware dealer tomorrow and visit your silverware dealer tomorrow and visit your silverware dealer tomorrow and visit your silverware dealer tomorrow and, dealer tomorrow and on that day of days Watch her face when she opens your package. When she sees the proud mark of international sterling on every lovely piece. When she realizes that here is solid silver through and through. Silver that will gleam as gloriously a full generation from now as it does this Christmas morning. International sterling silver. And now we return to Conrad Nagel, who is coming to the center of our silver stage with Betty Davis, star of our play tonight, and of the forthcoming Warner Brothers production, Dark Victory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Betty, if I ever write my memoirs, I'll have two stories to tell. The first will be about a time, oh, six years or so ago, when a young unknown actress named Betty Davis made her first screen appearance in a picture of mine. And the other will be about this program when a very young lady named Pamela Cavanagh started on what I'm certain will be another remarkable career. Oh, thank you, Conrad, for both Pam and me. And I'd like to thank Carlton Cadell for being such a patient Paul to such an impatient Julia. <laughs> thank you, Betty. It's been grand working with you. Well, you're certainly an industrious girl these days, Betty, making pictures like Dark Victory, appearing on radio shows like ours, and coaching Pam. Yes, and right now I'm taking over another job. Yours. Hmm? Ladies and gentlemen, next week on Silver Theater, Mr. Conrad Nagel will star with Ida Lupino in Challenge for Three. <laughs> well, it's my turn to say thank you. And thanks a lot for being with us these past two weeks, Betty. And come again. Hey, remember me? Yeah, you bet we do, Pam. <laughs> we'll remember you for a delightful performance and some lovely songs. I'd like to thank you and Betty for giving me a chance to sing them. Good night. Good night, Pam. Good night. Good night, Good night Betty. <laughs> Remember, if you want solid silver, you want international sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers, both proudly created by International Silver Company. 
All the characters and events in today's drama were purely fiction. John Conti speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. The House of Squibb presents the finest in motion picture entertainment, Academy Awards. The House of Squibb, manufacturing chemist to the medical profession since 1858, brings you Academy Award. The pictures, the players, the techniques and skills which have won or have been nominated for the coveted awards granted each year by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences to each in his field for outstanding achievement. Squib on the Air brings you only the finest in motion picture art. Squib in your home brings you only the finest medicinal products, pure, effective, reliable. Squib, a name you can trust. Tonight's picture is Jezebel. Tonight's star is the distinguished Warner Brothers player who has been nominated seven times for awards, has won the prize Oscar twice. Past president of the Academy, Miss Betty Davis. With Miss Davis tonight appears another Academy Award winner, Miss Anne Revere, who won this year's Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress in National Velvet. And now, Miss Betty Davis. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Miss Revere and I feel very honored to be on this first presentation of Academy Awards, those awards that mean so very much to all of us in the motion picture industry. Jezebel was written for radio by Frank Wilson with an original musical score composed and conducted by Lee Stevens and our producer-director is Dee Engelbach. Academy Award, starring Betty Davis in her 1938 award-winning role of Julie Marsden with Anne Revere as Aunt Belle in Jezebel. It seemed like the end of our world as General Bogardus and I stood in the street of New Orleans that dawn of 1851, listening to the depressing sound of the cannon as it was fired to dispel the fever which hung like a plague over the city. It seemed like the end of Julie's world, too. We watched her slowly walk beside poor Preston Billard as they carried him to the island of the dead. Oh, come, my dear. You, you can't stay in this street. Uh, dawn is breaking. The morning chill is penetrating. And in these dangerous days... Miss Bell, what are you thinking? I'm thinking of a woman called Jezebel who did evil in the sight of God. And yet I wonder... I wonder. Charles, you're out of your mind. You know you can't wear a red dress at an Olympus ball. Can't I? This is 1850, Dumpton. 1850, not the Dark Ages. Girls don't have to simp around in white just because they're not married. You'd insult every woman on the floor. You can't be serious. Never more serious in my life. But think of press. That's just what I am thinking of. Mr. Preston Dillard, who thinks that he can let his own affairs come before me, his future wife. That started it, Miss Bell. 
That damnable red dress. But that wasn't Julie's fault. Oh, if Preston Dillard had only taken my advice the night he came to call. I remember. You said... Your generation doesn't understand women, sir. Why, well, maybe not, General Bogarty. Nowadays, <laughs> no proper respect for our southern womanhood. Think your father would have allowed the lady of his choice to have come surging to his place of business this morning? Miss Julie didn't know I was presiding at a meeting, sir. Of course not, Preston. But even if the lady upstairs is my ward, I feel you should know what your father would have done. What would father have done, sir? Your father, sir, would have cut him a hickory, sir. He would have flailed the living daylights out of her and then helped her put lard on the welts and brought her a diamond brooch. That's what he would have done, sir. And she'd have loved it. Where is Miss Julie? Why, she asked me to please excuse her, Press. Is she ill? Why, no, Press. She's as sound as a nut. You will pardon me a moment, please. Take all the time you need, my boy. I do believe Mr. Dillard is going up the stairs after Julie. He's taking his walking cane at. Julie! It's Press. Open the door. I want to talk to you. Julie, why don't you answer? Look here, Julie. You and I have got to straighten things out. Oh, there's no sense to all this. I'm here because I love you. And because you love me. But there are some things we've got to set straight. Darling, if you just open the door, I'm sure I could. Julie! Open up at once! Who is it? Open this door! Why, Press, banging at a lady's bedroom door. I'm scandalized at Well, did you come here just to stand there? I see you've brought a stick. I'm waiting. When does the chastisement begin? I came up here to... Oh, Julie, how long must we go on like this? Like what, Fred? Fussing like a couple of children. Why do you treat me like a child, then? Oh, Julie, I love you. Spoiled child or not. Fred, in a lady's bedroom. Now you'll have to marry me. Oh, <laughs> oh look at me, darling. When I come in, I was going to beat you. Really? Now would you like to see my new dress? That's what I wanted to do all day. Well, let me go, then. There it is. For the Olympus Ball? Yes, isn't it lovely? But you can't wear red to the Olympus Ball. Why not? Well, you never saw an unmarried girl in anything but white. You know that. It's the custom. It has certain significance. Are you afraid I'll be taken for one of those girls from Galatan Street? Julie. Oh, of course, I'm sorry. I'm not supposed to know about things like Galatan Street. I'm just supposed to simp around in white. So that's it. You're nursing your spite. Well, I'm not going to let you. For once, you're going to do as I say. Julie, I'm calling for you tomorrow night at 10, and you're going to be properly dressed for the ball in white. Good night. Oh, Preston, you forgot your stick. She must have been getting scared over wearing that dress after what Press said to her. Yes, but her pride... Confound her fiendish pride. You know that she tried to get Buck Cantrell to take her to the ball without telling Press? Yes, I knew later. Poor drinking, jewel and easygoing Buck Cantrell. He loved her, too. Uh, thank heaven he refused her. He was a gentleman and an honorable man. I told you she'd be ready on time. Julie, we're ready to go. Julie, you promised me not to. So you wore it after all. Isn't it obvious? Shall we go, Fred? Not until you're properly dressed. Oh, why must everyone be so proper? Why don't you admit, Mr. Diller, that you're afraid? Afraid someone will insult me and you'll find it necessary to defend me. Julie. You're wrapped, Miss Marsden. May I? You ready, Aunt Belle? But, Press, she can. She can. She will. We are ready, sir. Miss Bell, my arm. And yours, Mr. Dillard? <laughs> Thank you. My, my dear Miss Bell, have you noticed Preston's face? Looks more like his father than ever tonight. And I never saw Tom Dillard look like that without somebody got killed. Theophilus, 
I'm just plain scared for her. <laughs> May I take your wrap, my dear? It's a... Well, the ballroom seems a little cool. I think we'll find it much warmer inside. Come. <laughs> Gentlemen, you all have the pleasure of Miss Marsden's acquaintance, I think. Gentlemen. Good evening, Miss Marsden. <clears throat> Yonder comes my partner. You'll excuse me. Of course, sir. You haven't a partner you have to meet, Cantrell? Why, no. Came alone. A pleasant evening, isn't it? Mighty pleasant. Nice and cool. Do you find it cool in here? I don't find it particularly cool. Do you, Julie? Why, no. I don't find it particularly cool. Miss Julie doesn't find it so. Perhaps it's something in the atmosphere that's peculiar to you. Why, no, I reckon not. Now you speak of it, it's just about right. It seems so to me. Press, please take me out of here. Well, my dear, we haven't danced yet, shall we? No. Oh, yes, we will. <laughs> got to take me off this floor. I can't. It's my own brother dancing with her. Everyone is leaving the floor. No respectable girl will dance while she's dancing. That dress is an insult. Take me off this instant. Press, I beg you, take me away from here. I can't endure it. No, we came to dance. We should go on dancing. But we're alone on the floor. So much the better. Oh, Press, let go of me. If you don't let go of it's me. It's a beautiful ball, don't you? So oh, Martin. take me away from here. Take me away. Good night, Aunt Beryl. General Bogardi, sir. You're not coming in, Press? No, ma'am. Good night. Night. Well? Goodbye, Julie. Is that all you've got to say to me? There's nothing more to say. Even if I was wrong? You couldn't be wrong. You're Julie Marsden. I might have go down on my knees. It'd be interesting, but utterly useless. Evidently, you've made up your mind. No, Julie, you've made up my mind. Well, then, goodbye, Press. Goodbye, Julie. Julie, don't let him go. Go after him. Me? After him? Yes, Julie, quickly. Oh, Julie, you're such a fool. Not so big a fool. He'll come back. Not this time, he won't. Believe me. Wait and see. He'll come back. Yet tonight, I think, if he does say I've retired and tell him I'm sleeping late in the morning, not to come round till tomorrow afternoon... Julie, tell him, tell him, tell him. Before we continue tonight's story of Jezebel, starring Miss Betty Davis and Miss Anne Revere, I would like to tell you about a doctor who lived during the period of this picture, a doctor so devoted to the cause of human health that his zeal still inspires those who carry on his work. His name was Edward R. Squibb. He was appalled by the dangerously inferior quality of drugs then available. He set out to supply the medical profession with drugs that could be relied upon. That's how the company he founded in 1858, the House of Squibb, first came to be known for medicinal products of purity, reliability, efficacy. And through the years, every member of the great family of Squibb products, from penicillin to dental cream, has been the result of painstaking study and research, of an endless quest for perfection. And that is why Squibb is a name you can trust. <laughs> And now for part two of tonight's picture, Jezebel, starring the Academy Award winners, Miss Betty Davis and Miss Anne Revere. Don't.
dawn brought heavy mists, the persistent melancholy of the booming fever cannon, a chill which sank deep into our souls. She lost him. She lost Preston Dillard through her own downright cussedness in flaunting herself in that red dress at the Olympus Ball. Theophilus, you must understand. She didn't know about Press. After all, he was away for over a year. All during that time, she hardly went out of the house save to ride that wild thoroughbred of hers. Yes. That quiet and moody. She wouldn't even have tried to escape the plague here in the city if she hadn't heard that Press was coming back. If you could have heard what she told me. He had to come to me, Annabelle. He couldn't help himself. You see, he wouldn't know how to fight as hard as I have to keep from going to him. We'll be married. I'm going to beg his forgiveness. I was vicious and mean and selfish, and I, I'm going to tell him I hated myself for being like that. I'll humble myself before him. All that ever stood between us will be gone when he takes me in his arms. Dear, dear child. Perhaps we'd, we'd better go to the plantation now that press is coming. Of course, Annie Bell is the place for our meeting. We'd better start packing. We'll give a party, a party to celebrate. And they came, all of them, the old, old friends. Buck Cantrell, Ted Dillard Press's brother, Dr. Livingston. Everyone came to house him. And Julie was walking on the clouds and dressed herself in the white dress that she was to have worn to the ball with Press. And Press. He came, and when the carriage... When the carriage stopped, my heart stopped, too. For Julie... Aunt Belle. Oh, it's wonderful to be back at Halcyon. I would have come even if I weren't invited. My dear, dear press. Aunt Belle, I have a surprise. This is Amy, my wife. His wife. Press had married. I tried to get away to warn Julie, but I had to stay with our guests, and while I was upstairs, she found him as he was in the library of Halcyon. <laughs> Are you remembering the time you wanted me to wear white? Are you? Well, until now, I never have. Cat got your tongue, Press. Julie. Oh, Press, what fools we were. Please, that's over, Julie. Yes, of course. Press, I can't believe it's you here. I've dreamed it so long. A lifetime. No. Longer than that. But, Julie, Oh, I... no, don't say it yet. I put on this white dress for you to help me tell you how humbly I ask you to forgive me. See, Press, I'm kneeling to you. Julie, don't. I want to, Press. I must make you forgive me and love me as I love you. Julie. Get up, please. For you, Press. Julie, I... this is Amy, my wife. Julie, Julie, where are you? Here, Aunt Bell. I... I was just about to congratulate Press on his marriage. I'm very happy, Mrs. Dillard, to welcome you to Halcyon. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, for heaven's sake, don't be gentle with me now. Do you think I want to be wept over? I've got to think to plan. Julie, you can't fight marriage. Married to that, that little washed-out Yankee. Press is mine. He's always been mine, and I'm going to have him. Press, why did you do it? We'd better join the others. Why? Because, because I love her. No, you're not such a fool, not after you had my love. How much do you remember? Everything you ever said or did. But it's past now, it's finished. I ought to have come to you. I wanted to so terribly, so much that I couldn't. And you felt that way too, that's what brought you back, Press. You had to come back to the country you know so well. 
Press listen. The night noises. The moon through the cypresses. Can you taste the night on your tongue? It's part of you, Press. The mockingbirds in the magnolias. The blue haze on a spring morning when the air is so soft it presses you like a kiss. It's the river rolling forever. The country you were born to. Julie, please don't do this. It's part of you, Press, just as I'm part of you and we'll never let you go. Press, put your arms around me. Oh, Julie. This is your country, Press. Amy couldn't understand it. She thinks there'd be snakes. Yes. And she'd be right. You talk about belonging. Amy's put her life and happiness in my hands. And they're going to be safe there. I think we'd better go in now. She tried to win him back. When she failed, she did the unforgivable thing. She, she set herself willfully to cause trouble. Yes, the other. She seemed possessed that night. I hear Press had to go into the city. Yes, they sent for him. I hope he'll be all right. I had grave reports of conditions there. The plague is sweeping on despite all effort to check it. Yeah, they posted the governor's militia to go out through the parish. No one will be permitted to leave the city or to enter it now. Oh, I'm so worried about Press. I pity he had to leave now. But I suppose his bank comes first. Oh, well, Press is devoted to the bank. Rather unfortunately so. You don't find that admirable, Miss Martin? <laughs> well, it just seems to me that there are other things more interesting. <laughs> I imagine Buck finds it so, too. That's right, Miss Julie. I never go into a bank if I can help it. Why, Buck? Because it seems to me they're mostly always studying how they can get away something from somebody. Oh, I'm sure Buck doesn't mean that the way it sounds. I'm sure Mr. Cantrell is capable of defending his own insinuations. Why, Mistress Dillard, I didn't mean to offend. I was just talking. Of course. Amy, he doesn't realize what he's saying. Doesn't even realize how Julie is using him. Why, Buck, am I using you? I'd be right happy if you'd explain that remark, sir. I'll explain it. You're fool enough to defend what you don't even understand. That Julie's been egging you on. First against press, and now against his wife. Well, that's pretty talk, isn't it, Buck? Yes, Miss Julie. That's very impolite talk, very. Let's put it this way, Mr. Cantrell. All evening, I thought you coarse and not a gentleman. Why, you insolent. At your service, sir. Why, Dad, you, you can't do this. I'm afraid, Miss Dillard, you don't understand our southern customs. <laughs> Gentlemen, will you please take your places? Remember, gentlemen, you turn and fire at the count of ten. Are you ready? Ready. Ready. Very well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. devil. Come on, Amy. We're getting out of here. We're all going. How do you propose to get through the guards? And there's yellow fever in the city. Surely my hospitality is better than the plague. We'll get through. Good night, ma'am. I shall never speak to her again even though she returned one day from the dead. When she heard that he was stricken, she had to come to him, don't you understand? She went through the swamp, past the guards, risked her life to get to him. His wife was at his side. She belonged there. Julie belonged there, too. Amy understands that now. She stole him away from Amy as he lay dying. The often, you must not judge. Believe me, Mrs. Dillard, it's unthinkable that you go with him there. Armed guards are coming to take him to the leper island. It's the law. All who catch the fever must go. When they come for him, 
I'm going with him. No, you can't go, Amy. It is your right to go. You're his wife, but are you fit to go? Loving him isn't enough. If you gave him all your strength, would it be enough? I'll make him live. I'll die with him. Amy, do you know the Creole word for fever powder, for food, for water? Can you talk to a sullen, overworked black boy and make him fear you and help you? Press his life and yours will hang on words you can't say and you'll both surely die. I must go with him. Listen, Amy, they're coming. Coming for him. Oh, Amy, it isn't a question of proving your love by laying down your life for press. Nothing so easy. Have you the knowledge and the strength to fight for his life and your own? Amy, it's no longer you or I. What do you mean? I'll make him live. I will. You see, I know how to fight better than you. I'll fight to the death itself. Where is he? Upstairs. Amy, you're the bravest woman I ever saw. I believe you even have the courage to save him by giving me the right to go in your place. Oh, you're not afraid to die. I know that. I boldly ask a greater sacrifice in Press's name, his life. You love him even more than I believe within your power. Oh, let me prove myself worthy of the love I bear him. Julie, tell me. Something which only you can tell me. Does Press still love you? He himself might know, but you would. Tell me. Amy, what does it matter who Press loves? It's his life that matters. Tell me. We both know Press loves his wife. Whom else could Press love? Not me, surely. I've done so much against him. Had there been any love in his heart for me, I'd have taken him away from you. I tried and failed because he loves only you. I'm grateful for you telling me in your own way what I had to know. Take care of them, Julie. I believe you've earned whatever right is mine. God protect you and friends. Go with him. Amy. Thank you. Let's get started. We've got to get him to the island. Press. Press, I'm here. I'll always be here, Press. Press, darling. I'm here. Come, Miss Bell. They've gone. And there's no turning back. Come, you cannot stay here in the street. Miss Bell, what are you thinking? I'm thinking of a woman called Jezebel who did evil in the sight of God. We are honored, ladies and gentlemen, on this first presentation of Academy Award to introduce a distinguished artist, known and loved by you on the air as Dr. Christian, president of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, Mr. Gene Herschel. Good evening. Ms. Davis and Ms. Revere, your performances were superb. Also, thank you, Miss Revere, for so brilliantly playing the role of Aunt Bell in place of Miss Faye Bainter, who is ill. And to you, Miss Bainter, our best wishes for a speedy recovery. The Academy appreciates the significance of this series of broadcasts. We are grateful to E.R. Squibb and Sons for their vision and support in sponsoring these programs. The Academy is dedicated to lifting the standards of motion pictures even higher. It values this platform of expression and views with deep satisfaction the t- determination to make this radio program through a broad variety of great weekly broadcasts an institution in the life of America. Next week, another great picture. The House of Squibb will present Academy Awards starring the beautiful and talented Miss Ginger Rogers in her Oscar-winning performance of Kitty Foyle. Next week, it is Academy Awards starring Ginger Rogers in Kitty Foyle. (laughs) Miss Betty Davis will soon be seen in A Stolen Life, produced by Warner Brothers, also producers of Devotion. 
Miss Anne Revere will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox production, Dragon Wing. This is Hugh Brundage bidding you good night until next week at the same time when the House of Squibb invites you to join us for Academy Awards. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis and Gregory Peck in Now Voyager. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The title of tonight's play comes from two lines by Walt Whitman, suggesting that to find life's riches, one must often have the courage to search far afield. To little Betty Davis, when I first knew her in New York, Hollywood must have seemed a distant and unlikely destination. But Betty had spunk as well as talent. She came, she saw, she conquered. And in Warner Brothers' great dramatic hit, Now Voyager, she conquered not only Hollywood, but the hearts of all America. Betty appears tonight in her original screen role as the woman who sacrifices everything for love. And co-starred with her is another favorite of ours and yours, Gregory Peck, whose early reappearance was requested, uh, I might say demanded, in so many welcome letters. Letters which have been so helpful in our selection of plays and casts. One letter from our audience tells us a story that I'd like to pass along to you. It's from Mrs. Edith Park of San Antonio, who says, I am 68 years old today, and 54 years ago I started crocheting an afghan. I worked on it off and on and finally finished it, and it was in constant use for years. When it finally stretched out of shape, I couldn't bear to destroy it. So I unraveled the yarn, wound it on skeins, and washed it in Lux Flakes. It came out soft and beautiful, so nice you'd almost think I bought it today. I'm so delighted, I wanted to let everybody know about it. Thanks so much for Lux Flakes. Thanks so much to you, Mrs. Park. And may I offer our belated but happiest birthday wishes. The lights of our theater are dimmed, and here's the first act of Now Voyager. Starring Betty Davis as Charlotte Vale and Gregory Peck as Jerry Durrance, with Joseph Kearns as Dr. Jackwith and Janet Scott as Mrs. Vale. <laughs> Untold want by life and land ne'er granted. Now, Voyager, sail thou forth to seek and find. I heard those words for the first time over a year ago from Dr. Jackwith in my room at his sanitarium. I knew what he meant. I had been there three months, and now I was ready to leave. I seemed to be well again, but how could he be sure? How could I be sure? I wonder what Dr. Jackwith thought of me the day Lisa... My sister brought him to our house. I remember the way he stood in the drawing room, smiling at me so gently. I, in my low-heeled shoes and my glasses, fat and dull and sullen, not trusting myself to speak, and my mother. It was not mother's idea to bring Dr. Jackwood to see me. Mother believed only in strength, never in weakness. What was it she said that day? Oh, yes. She said, I'm ashamed of you, Charlotte. I'm ashamed of you, Charlotte. It was Lisa's suggestion to bring Dr. Jakeworth here, not mine. Your sister says that your recent peculiarities, your fits of crying, indicate that you're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Is that what you're trying to achieve? Well, Charlotte, has the cat got your tongue? Mother, please. Be quiet, Lisa. Charlotte, Dr. Jakeworth has a sanatorium in Vermont, I believe. Probably one of those places with a high wire fence and yowling inmates. Oh, Mrs. Vale, I wouldn't want anyone to have that mistaken notion. A cascade is just a place in the country. People come there when they're tired. The very word, psychiatry. Charlotte, doesn't it fill you with shame? 
There's nothing shameful in my work, Mrs. Vale, or frightening, or anything else. You see, Miss Charlotte, people walk along a road. They come to a fork in the road. They're confused. They don't know which way to take. I just put up a signpost saying, not that way, this way. Well, Charlotte, would you like Dr. Jackwith to point the way for you? Uh, I'm going upstairs. Charlotte, come back here at once. Uh, please don't. I I'd like to speak to her alone. Excuse me. Oh, oh, Miss Charlotte, will you wait, please? Yes, Dr. Jack. Miss Charlotte, I wonder if I might ask you a favor. Will you be nice enough to show me around this house? One doesn't often get a chance to view the Vale residence. Very well, Dr. Jack. Thank you. Here is the room in which I was born. My mother's room. Hmm. It's a fine room. But I'd rather see what your room is like. I'm not your patient yet, Doc. Well, nobody thinks you ever will be. But, of course, if you'd rather not. It's on the floor above. When I was 17, I stayed out once until after midnight. That creaky step hasn't been fixed since. I'm not sure I know what you mean. And my mother heard it. This way, Doctor. I keep my door locked. Make a note of it, Doctor. Significant, isn't it? Well, it signifies it's your door. I've never heard it said that a woman's home is not her castle. My castle, Doctor. Well, you're comfortable here, aren't you? I try to be. I'm here a good part of the time. Mm -hmm. Hello, what's this over here? A work table? Yes. Ivory carving. Did you make this cigarette box? Why shouldn't I? The point is how you could. I have a very real admiration for people who are clever with their hands. I was always very clumsy with my own. I would say that you're one of the least clumsy persons I've ever known. Oh, uh, you wouldn't happen to have a cigarette hidden away someplace, would you? Do you think I hide cigarettes in my room? Oh, no, 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 no. I meant... Where that... do I hide them, Doctor? On the shelves behind the books? Cigarettes and medicated sherry and novels my mother would never allow me to read? Oh, please. It was only the box that reminded me. Oh, how very perceiving you are. How very right you are. You see, I was about to hide this album. You really should look at it, though. It wouldn't do for you to come all the way up here and miss your amusement. Look at it, Doctor. The intimate journal of Miss Charlotte Vale, spinster. Oh, dear. Won't anything convince you that I don't wish to pry? Oh, but you must pry. I insist that you do. Here's the record of my last trip abroad with my mother. You wouldn't have known me then. I was 20 then, and I was in love. Oh, Miss Vale. Oh, don't be embarrassed. I'm not. Here's his picture. I'd never met a man like Leslie before. I'd hardly ever met a man. Mother saw to that. Leslie loved me. He wanted to marry me. But he wasn't suitable, my mother said. What man is suitable, doctor? She's never found one. What man would ever say to me, I want you? Look at me. I'm fat. My mother disapproves of the foul dorals of diet. Look at my shoes. My mother approves of sensible shoes. Look at my glasses. You'll never get another pair of eyes, my mother says. Look at the books on my shelves. My mother approves of good, solid books. I am my mother's well-loved daughter. I am my mother's companion. I am my mother's servant. My mother says, my mother, my mother, my mother. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. no, 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 no. Look up here. You'll never get another pair of eyes, as your mother says, if you... Spoil them with tears. Oh, Dr. Jackwith, when you were talking downstairs, when you talked about the fork in the road, there are other forks further along the road. So many. Yes. Put away your book and come downstairs. I'll go ahead. Well, Doctor, it's just as I said, isn't it? Just nonsense. Mrs. Vale. Charlotte's no more ill than a molting canary. Of course, she's my youngest, you know. The child of my age. My ugly duckling. I suppose it's true that all late children are mocked. Often such children are not wanted. That can mock them. Dr. Jackwith, are you telling I've me that I... I've been trying to tell you that your daughter is seriously ill, thanks to you. Thanks if to you me? If you had deliberately and maliciously planned to destroy your daughter's life, you couldn't have done it more completely. How? By having exercised a mother's rights. Oh, a mother's rights, Twaddle. A child has rights. To discover her own mistakes, to make her own way, to grow and blossom in her own particular soil. Are you getting into botany, Doctor? Are we flowers? I, uh, I'm trying to help your daughter. I suggest a few weeks at Cascade. I spent three months at Cascade. Outwardly, Dr. Jackwith worked a miracle. I had lost weight. 
I was looking better. My hands were steady. Inwardly, I didn't know. And then came that morning when Dr. Jackwood told me I could leave. Well, the time has come for you to get out of the nest, Charlotte. Try your own wings. You mean go home? No, no. Go out and take a good look at the world on your own. Forget you're a hidebound New Englander. Meet people, talk to them. I, I'd be afraid. Charlotte, the other day I referred to a quotation. Do you remember? Yes. You said it was from Walt Whitman. That's right. Well, I've had it looked up. He's put into words what I'd like to say to you and far better than I could ever express it. He says, Untold want by life and land ne'er granted. Now, voyager, sail thou forth to seek and find. I sailed in three days, a pleasure cruise to South America. Lisa had secured space aboard ship because a girl she knew, Renee Beauchamp, decided suddenly to go to Arizona instead. It was too late for my name to go on the passenger list, and so I was known to the deck stewards and to the head waiter as Miss Beauchamp. I dreaded the embarrassment to explain this to the passengers, so I, I simply avoided them and stayed in my cabin. When we reached Campos, I decided to go ashore. Renee had helped me with my wardrobe, insisted, in fact, that I take half a trunk full of her own clothes. As I came down the steps to the tender, I knew people were looking at me. I was panic-stricken. My plucked eyebrows, my new hairdo, the lipstick I wore, my, my borrowed clothes. At the bottom of the ladder, a man was smiling at me. Excuse me, Miss Beauchamp. My name's Jerry Durance. It seems you've got the only shore carriage left, and the steward suggested that you might be willing to share it with someone. Well, really... I know it's an inconvenience. If it's too much, just say so. Well, if you can stand it, I should be able to. Oh, thank you. I've enjoyed myself today. Have you? You know, Miss Beauchamp, haven't I, I read about you in the newspapers, the girl who jumps horses so well, or is it tennis? You've never read about me in a newspaper. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I guess I'm mistaken. Nevertheless, you're quite different from what I expected. Please listen. Renee Beauchamp is in Arizona. I took her space at the last moment. I, I don't know why I'm telling you this, a stranger. <laughs> no, you're the stranger. You know who I am. My name is Vale. If it ever appears on the passenger list, it will be C. Vale. Boston. One of the Vales of Boston? One of the lesser ones. Well, which one? Miss or Mrs.? It's Aunt. Every family has one, you know. But Aunt what? My name is Charlotte Vale. Miss Charlotte Vale. Do you mind if we go? Oh, Miss Vale, I... I hope I didn't offend you. You know, it, it's like me to blunder just when I was going to ask you for a favor. I've got some shopping to do for my daughters, and, well, I need a woman's help. Of course. A spinster aunt is an ideal person to select presents for young girls. Miss Vale, I wish I understood you. He wishes he understood me. He wishes. You know, I think we did very well. The jewelry's just right for Beatrice and the sweater for Tina. How old is Tina? Here, I've got a picture. <laughs> this is my harem, all girls. Who is that knitting? Oh, well, that's, that's Isabel, my wife. Picture is very good of her. She'd only looked up and smiled. And that's Beatrice next to her. Then that must be Tina sitting cross-legged on the grass. <laughs> yes. We hope she won't have to wear glasses all her life. Tina wouldn't smile for me either. She's convinced she's an ugly duckling. Does Tina know she wasn't wanted? Now, well, there's an odd remark. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I made it. Well, I mean odd because it's so close to the truth. Even before she was born, her mother... Well... Never mind that. Here's a slight offering for being my guide today. It's a mixture of several kinds of flowers. It's called Jolie Fleur. Oh, oh, thank you very much. I'll put some on my handkerchief tonight. Will you? Good. Let's meet in the lounge for a cocktail. Before... All right. In my hand as I walked away was the bottle of perfume. My heart was beating wildly like a schoolgirl's. It was the first gift any man had ever given me. Hello. Hello. Sit down, Miss Vale. 
You know, you made a striking impression over there. She stood in the doorway looking for me. Probably put on too much lipstick. No, not that I noticed. I did notice that wrap at once. What's that? What's what? There's something on your wrap. Pinned on. It's a note. Well, somebody's playing a joke on you, I guess. Unpin it and read it. This cape always makes an impression. I hope it'll do the same for you. What's it mean? It means that this cape belongs to Renee Bushel. She lent it to me. Oh, I see. Your wings are borrowed. Well, they suit you just the same. No, they don't. They don't suit me at all. In fact, they're perfectly ridiculous. You're quite right. Someone is playing a joke on me. Only it's far funnier than you realize. Well, you aren't going, are you? Yes, please. Well, Jerry. Mac and Deb, too. Well, how are you? Hi, Jerry. We're joining your ship. Oh, wonderful. Oh, these are my old friends, Deb McIntyre and Frank. And my new friend, Miss uh, uh, Beauchamp. How do you do? Is this Rene Beauchamp? No, no, another one altogether. This is uh, uh, Camille Beauchamp. Excuse me, please. Good night. Good night. Oh, wait, Miss Beauchamp. I'll see you later, Deb. Oh, sure. Wait a minute, please. Wait. Now, why did you run out on me? Did you have to introduce me like that? Well, it wasn't up to me to let the cat out of the bag. Did I do wrong? Why did you call me Camille? Well, it was the only French name I could think of besides Fifi. I suppose that's meant to be funny. My wife calls my lighter moments trying to be funny. I, I intended a compliment. In that dress, you're rather like a chameleon. Likely. You haven't a very high opinion of yourself, have you? Perhaps this will help you know why. You showed me a photograph, now I'll show you one. A picture of my family. <laughs> family is right. Who's this, your grandmother? No, my mother. Oh, a very strong character, I'd say. And these? My brothers and their wives. Oh, they're so much older. Who's the fat lady with the heavy brows and all the hair? A spinster aunt. Oh, well, where are you taking the picture? I'm the fat lady with the heavy brows and all the hair. <laughs> I'm poor Aunt Charlotte, and I've been ill. I've been in a sanitarium for three months, and I'm not well yet. And I... And I... Forgive me. Uh, of course. Feeling better? Much. Thanks to you. Oh, many, many thanks to you. Thanks for what? Oh, for sharing my carriage today, and... And for walking my legs off sightseeing and, and for helping me feel that there were a few moments when I, when I almost felt alive. Thank you. Thank you who? Thank you, Jerry. Good night. Good night, Camille. Sleep well. next few days, I learned about Jerry Dorrance. His friend, Deb, told me. Deb talked a great deal. Charlotte, how much has Jerry told you about his life at home? Oh, that he was married. In fact, he showed me a snapshot of his family. He seemed very proud of them. He would. He's right out of the age of chivalry, that boy. If you mean thoughtful and considerate. Oh, dishwater. You don't know what I'm talking about. I'm afraid I don't. I'm talking about his home, his marriage. Honestly, when I see what a woman like Isabel can do to a man like Jerry, it makes me boil. He doesn't have to stand for it, does he? Oh, yes, he does. His kind always do. The weak have a great strength, you know, when they're clinging to something decent and fine. He's been cursed from the very first day he met Isabel by a ruling passion not to hurt her. She's not too well, you know. There must be something more. He married her. Yes, he married her. Isabel was a girl who believed that a kiss required a proposal. She's been draped around his neck ever since. Well, he struggled with his architecture till she made him give it up. He wasn't making enough money. The only thing he ever loved. Isabel kept reminding him that he was now a married man with responsibilities. When they had their first child, she considered herself a great martyr. And she's played the martyr ever since. That's her grasp on him. Her martyrdom, her jealousy, and when they fail, her weak heart. She can't have reason to be jealous. Oh, if you mean, does Jerry have flings with other women? No. She's jealous mostly of Tina, the child she never wanted. And yet, if you could hear her sanctimonious maternal tone when she lets it leak out what a self-sacrificing mother she's been. No, Jerry doesn't know. Or if he knows, he refuses to understand and do something about it. He only insists on enduring.
And so I found out that Jerry was unhappy too. Then one evening in Rio, our car broke down on the mountainside. We talked all night, Jerry and I. Toward dawn, I lay down beside the fire he had built. And when he thought I was sleeping, he leaned over quietly and kissed my cheek. My boat sailed without me. The next night, back at the hotel, we stood on the balcony looking over the harbor. You can rejoin your cruise in Buenos Aires. There's a plane going down first thing in the morning. Then there's another plane going down in five days. It'll get you there the same day as your ship. Oh. You know anybody in Buenos Aires? No. Oh, it seems a shame to rush down there to spend five days alone. But you'll be busy here. Oh, my business can wait. And we did start off for a tour. We started off for somewhere. Uh, if I promise to sit at a different table in the dining room and say, good morning, Miss Vale, I hope you slept well. So people will hear me and never guess that I'm head over heels in love with you. Will you stay? Now, don't say no, Camille. Say, I'll see. Uh, I'll see. I must go in now. No, not yet. Look at the harbor. Isn't it beautiful? Do you, do you believe in immortality? I don't know, do you? Oh, I want to believe that there's a chance for such happiness to be carried on somehow, somewhere. Are you happy, then? <laughs> Close to it. Getting warmer and warmer, as we used to say as kids, remember? Look out or you'll get burned, we used to say. Are you afraid of getting burned if you get too close to happiness? I'm immune to happiness and therefore to burns. You weren't immune last night on the mountain. Do you call that happiness? Oh, small part. There are other kinds. Such as? Having fun together. Getting a kick out of simple little things, out of beauty like this. Sharing confidences we wouldn't share with anybody else in all the world. Charlotte. Won't you be honest and tell me that you're happy, too? Since that night on the boat when you told me about your illness, I... I can't get you out of my mind, or out of my heart, either. If I were free, there'd be only one thing I'd want to do. Prove you're not immune to happiness. Oh, darling, you're crying. Oh, I'm such a fool. Such an old fool. These are only tears of gratitude. An old maid's gratitude. Oh, don't talk like you that. You see, no one ever called me darling before. Well, there's my plane. Yeah. I hate goodbyes. Oh, it don't matter. It's what's gone before. No. It's what can't go after. But we'll see each other sometime. No, we promised. We're both to go home. Will it help you to know I'll miss you every moment? So will I, Jerry. So will I. Depresa, senores. Depresa, senores. Goodbye, darling. Darling. Goodbye. Goodbye, Jerry. Our stars Betty Davis and Gregory Peck will return in Act Two of Now Voyager in a moment. Psychologists say that they can tell a great deal about what we've been doing by the way we associate words. For instance, if I say three, what other word do you think of, Libby? Three? Why, three strangers. Hmm, how did you arrive at that? Well, I've just seen a preview of Warner Brothers' new picture by that name. It's a real thriller. I can still feel the chills going down my spine. Suppose I said three again. Oh, since we've been talking about the picture, I think of two times three, which is six. What has six to do with three strangers? Six is the number of glamorous outfits Geraldine Fitzgerald wears in the picture. I counted them. Milo Anderson designed a blue negligee for her that's really the ultimate in luxury. And if I still persist in saying three? Well, since we've been talking about a negligee, I'd recall that pretty underthings stay lovely three times as long when they're given gentle lux care. Yes, there are three things to watch out for. Strong soap, hot water, and rough handling. Washing tests prove that these things make colors look faded and drab much too soon. All sorts of misfortunes can follow if slips and nighties get harsh wash day treatment. Of course, not as harrowing as the things Peter Laurie and Sidney Greenstreet experience in the picture. But frayed straps and burst-out seams can be a personal tragedy if it's a favorite slip. 
Especially now, when nice ones are so hard to buy. A tragedy you can avoid with Lux Care. Washing tests proved that underthings washed the Lux way stayed lovely three times as long. Yes, Lux Care is certainly thrifty. Lux is thrifty in another way, too. A little Lux goes a long way. Use all the Lux you need to get rich suds, but don't use more than you need. Soap is too precious these days to be wasted. Back now to William Keeley, our producer. Our curtain rises on the second act of Now Voyager, starring Betty Davis as Charlotte Vale and Gregory Peck as Jerry Durrance, with Joseph Kearns as Dr. Jackwith. Early in May, I returned to New York and went at once to see Dr. Jackwith. He was delighted with the change he saw in me, but even he didn't know how much I had changed or why. The final test was still to come when I went home to see Mother. I stood there outside her room, my heart beating wildly. In my mind, I kept hearing Dr. Jackwith's words. Just remember that honoring one's parents is still a pretty good idea. You're going to be a shock to her. I advise you to soften the blow. Give her time to get used to you. Give her time. Hello, Mother. So, you've decided to come back. You're looking very well, Mother. Lisa told me you'd been ill. Lisa but... knows nothing about me. Step over there where I can see you. Now turn around. It's worse than Lisa led me to suppose. Much worse. Yeah. I shall be wearing my white lace gown tonight. I'd like you to wear your black and white foulard. But, Mother, I've lost over 25 pounds. It won't fit. There's something else I want to say to you. Now that you have come home to take up your duties as a daughter again, I'm dismissing the last nurse. I'm to having a room occupied on the same floor with me. And in view of my heart, I agree it's a wise precaution. You will occupy your father's room from now on. I had William move down all your things yesterday. Mother, you had no right to move my things. No right in my own house to move what I see fit? Mother. I think if you wear your glasses tonight, you'll be less of a shock to the others. And take off whatever you've got on your face. As to your hair and eyebrows, you can say that often after a severe illness, one loses one's hair. But you're letting yours grow as quickly as possible. Mother, if you will excuse me, I'll go to my room. As I walked from the room, I knew the illusion was over. This was my life, this was my mother. This was my home, and the bars of reality were unbending. But that evening, some flowers arrived, his flowers, a box of camellias, and with them, a renewal of my courage. Charlotte? Yes, Mother. What are you doing in your old room? I had my things moved back. I'm going to sleep here. Didn't you understand I wished someone to sleep in the room next to mine? We can get one of the maids, Mother. Perhaps Hilda. As long as I pay the bills, I'm running this house. Please remember you're a guest, Charlotte. Well, if I am one, then please treat me like one, Mother. Your guest prefers to sleep in this room, if you don't mind. This is no time for humor. Where did those flowers come from? From New York. Who sent them? I've forgotten the name of the florist. In other words, you don't intend to tell me. Mother, I don't want to be disagreeable or unkind. I've, I've come home to live with you again here in the same house. But it can't be in the same way. I've been living my own life, making my own decisions for a long while now. It's impossible to go back to being treated like a child again. Where did you get that dress? I bought it in New York today. It's outrageous. Where's the black and white foulard? I gave it to Hilda. She was so grateful. Mother... Mother, please be fair and meet me halfway. They told me before you were born that my recompense for having a late child was the comfort the child would be to me in my old age, especially if she were a girl. And on your first day home after six months' absence, you behave like this. Mother, wait for me. I'll go downstairs with Thank you. Thank you. I prefer to go alone. Mother, please, you know you're not oh. supposed to. Mother! Dora, come here quickly. Mother's fallen downstairs. <laughs> She was not badly hurt, a torn ligament in her ankle, but it was enough to keep her in her bed during the party. I was a great surprise to the family that night, and as they left, one of the guests stayed on to speak to me at the door, Elliot Livingston. Well, Miss Vale? Well, Mr. Livingston? You know, I still can't get over our not having met. Well, as a matter of fact, we have, once and almost twice. Oh, I'm mystified. Well, the once was when we were children, you were the only boy who danced with me at dancing school, and the almost is when you were supposed to usher at my coming out party and didn't show up. 
I'm covered with shame. <laughs> I shouldn't have told you it wasn't nice. Well, I, I hope you're going to allow me to make up for my past rudeness. May I telephone you sometime? Of course, any time. Good night. Good night. <laughs> How's your ankle, Mother? It's extremely painful. I'm so sorry. I've been doing some thinking as I've been lying here in pain, listening to you all having a good time downstairs. How much did that dress cost? It was frightfully expensive. Go to sleep now, Mother. I'll tell you about it in the morning. To whom did you charge it? To whom I've always charged my clothes, Mother. And you expect me to pay for articles charged to me of which I do not approve? Well, I could pay for it myself. I've saved quite a little money. I have about... $5,000. $5,000 won't last very long, especially if your monthly allowance were to be discontinued. Oh, I see. Charlotte, I'm willing you should occupy your old room until I dismiss the nurse. That will give you a chance to think over what I've said. I'm very glad to give a devoted daughter a home under my roof and pay all her expenses, but not if she scorns my authority. Well, I could earn my own living mother. As a matter of fact, I've often thought about it. I'd make a very good head waitress in a restaurant, or I could... You may think that very funny, but I guess you'd be laughing out of the other side of your face if I did carry out your suggestion. I don't think I would. You see, Mother, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Summer, winter, and then spring again. Between Mother and me, there was a sort of armed truce. In her own way, I think she respected me for what she called my stubbornness. And then there was the matter of Elliot Livingston. Why haven't you accepted Elliot? Do you imagine there's a Livingston waiting for you on every corner? I've been waiting to see how you feel about it, Mother. <sighs> you know well as I do. Makes no difference to you how I feel about it. You always do exactly as you please. I think you're pleased. I'm nothing of the kind. I'm only so astonished that you of all the family should bring such a feather to the family cap. Then if you really do approve, Mother, dear, oh, why... Keep all that soft talk for Elliot. <laughs> Mother, there's no one like you. That night I told Elliot I would marry him. Our wedding was set for June. Mother was pleased and I was too. Then three weeks before the wedding, I saw Jerry again. There was a party at George Weston's house. In a room full of people, I saw him. And it was just as if we'd never been apart. George noticed immediately. Why, what's the matter, Charlotte? George, I, I think I know that man over there. Oh, Jerry Durrance. He's been doing a job for me since March. Architect for the medical center. Shall I tell him your name or let him guess? Oh, let him guess. Right, come along. Oh, Jerry, here's someone who thinks she's met you before. Why, oh, yes, of course. You do look familiar. Now, don't tell me your name. I've got it. Uh, Beauchamp, isn't it? Camille Beauchamp? I'm sorry, Jerry, but you're wrong. My name is Vale. I met you on a pleasure cruise once. Oh, yes, Miss Vale. I hope you'll forgive me. I'll leave you two alone to make your own peace. George tells me you've been in Boston quite often, Mr. Durrance. And I didn't know. Oh, yes, several times. You look simply glorious. An architect. Oh, Jerry, I could cry with pride. I wanted horribly to call you up. I walked by your house on Marlborough Street. Once I almost rang the bell. Oh, why didn't you? Tell me about Deb and Mac. You introduced me to them on the pleasure cruise, remember? Oh, they're all fine. And how is Tina? Well, Tina, we're having quite a bad time with Tina. Tell me about it. I'm afraid we've got to send her away somewhere. Doctor thinks she shouldn't be with her mother. I took her to see Dr. Jackwith. He was highly recommended to me by this Camille Beauchamp I mistook for you. Charlotte, I've got to see you. May I come to your house tonight? I won't stay but ten minutes. I must talk to you. Yes, I'll be waiting. Hello. Hello, Charlotte. Jerry, why haven't you come? I've been home for hours. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm leaving tonight on the midnight. But why? Well, I've got to get back on business. I heard the news. You're going to marry Elliot Livingston. Oh, I wanted to tell you. I just wanted to say I think he's a fine person. And... Jerry, where are you now? I've got to see you. Charlotte, I think it's best that we don't. Are you at the station? Goodbye. Jerry. Jerry. Jerry, wait. Charlotte, you shouldn't have come. I had to. I want to talk to you about Elliot. Why are you marrying him? 
Are you in love with him? No, not like we are. Not like us. I thought it might grow to be something like it. I thought I was getting over you, Jerry. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. You're not angry with me. Oh, no, only with myself. It was rotten of me to make you care, and then because of some noble sense of duty to leave you to get over it the best way you could. And there isn't a thing in the world I can do about it. Isabel depends on me more and more. She's ill and getting worse. Then there's Tina. Even if I could chuck everything, Oh, I wouldn't Charlotte... let you, Jerry. I knew you were married, and I walked right in with my eyes wide open. But you said it would make you happy. Oh, it has. I've got back my work, and that's due to you. Oh, I'd been hoping you'd say that. I'm more understanding for Tina. I'm kinder to Isabel, so don't blame yourself. Well, then don't you. That's different. It's not. Shall I tell you what you did for me? You made me feel important. You were my first friend. And then when you fell in love with me, I was so proud. And when I came home, I, I needed something to make me feel proud. And then your camellias arrived, and I, I knew you were thinking about me. Oh, I could have walked into a den of lions. As a matter of fact, I did, and the lions didn't hurt me. Please take back what you said. If you marry Elliot Livingston and have a full and happy life, I will. I'll try. I'll look for you around every corner. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, darling. I did try. I wanted to marry Elliot, but it was of no use. We broke it off by mutual consent. And I knew then I would never have a home of my own, or a man of my own, or a child of my own. Why did you break the engagement? Because I don't love him, Mother. Have you no sense of obligation to your family? Or to me? Here you have the chance to join our name, Vale, with one of the finest families in the city. And you tell me you're not in love. You're behaving like a romantic girl of 18. I don't doubt it. And what do you intend to do with your life? Oh, get a cat and a parrot and live alone in single blessedness. You've never done anything to make your mother proud. Nor to make yourself proud, either. Why, I should think you'd be ashamed to be born and live all your life as Charlotte Vale. Miss Charlotte Vale. Dr. Jackworth says that tyranny is sometimes an expression of the maternal instinct. If that's a mother's love, I don't want any part of it. I didn't want to be born. You didn't want me either. It's been a calamity on both sides. Oh, mother, let's not quarrel. Oh. We've been getting along together so well lately. It was a horrid thing to say. Forgive me. Mother. Mother! What's the matter? Dora, she, she was sitting there and we quarreled. We, we quarreled. I did it. I did it. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act three of Now Voyager, starring Betty Davis and Gregory Peck, will follow in a moment. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I want to introduce our guest of the evening, the number one smoother of wheels at the David O. Selznick studio, Miss Lydia Schiller, who bears the title of scenario assistant. Reading scripts is one of your chores, isn't it, Miss Schiller? Yes, and I work on scenarios, too. I sit in on story conferences and then follow through on production details. What are you working on now, Lydia? Duel in the Sun. It has over a thousand people in the cast. And stars, I understand, Jennifer Jones, Joseph Cotton, Gregory Peck, and a host of others. That's right, Mr. Keeley. It was two years in preparation, one year shooting, and cost over five million dollars. Hmm, with a technicolor picture of that scope, you must have had many problems. We certainly did, Mr. Keeley. Now take the costumes, for example. Mr. Kennedy will be interested in how we kept them looking so lovely and fresh. How was that, Miss Schiller? We used Lux, naturally. We luxed all the blouses, lingerie, washable gowns, and of course, stockings. That helped keep down the stocking bills, didn't it? You're perfectly right, Mr. Kennedy. 
We had very little run trouble because stockings were luxed after every day's shooting. You found out by experience what has been proved by actual test. Strain tests made by a famous laboratory proved Lux cuts down runs amazingly. A strong soap and rubbing with cake soap made runs come quickly. Stockings actually lasted twice as long with Lux. Yes, we're luckier than the girls who lived in the days of duel in the sun. It take, uh, takes place in the 80s, you know, in Texas. Before Lux was invented. And a wonderful invention it was, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Miss Schiller. And now, a suggestion. Don't get discouraged if you don't find Lux the first time you try. Your dealer will have more soon, and Lux is worth waiting for. Here's your producer, Mr. William Keeley. We continue with the third act of Now Voyager, after which I hope you'll come backstage with us to meet tonight's stars. Betty Davis appearing now as Charlotte, and Gregory Peck as Jerry Durrance, with Joseph Kearns as Dr. Jaquith. My mother was dead. I had quarreled with her and I couldn't shake off the feeling of guilt. It grew worse and worse until at last I had to get away. I went back to the only refuge I had ever known, back to Cascade. How are you, Miss Vale? Dr. Jack required you were coming. Hello, Trask. Well, for goodness sake, I hardly know you. Oh, of course. I expected you hours ago. It's been a long drive. I'm tired. Do you suppose I could go to my room right away? Certainly. I put you in 18. Your old room, remember? I thought it would make you feel more at home. Oh, thank you. How was Dr. Jacklet? Same as ever, handing out common sense instead of sympathy. <laughs> Trask, that child over there at the table, who's she? A problem if I ever saw one. Her name is Christine Durrance. Uh, oh, excuse me a second. I'd better see about your bags. Tina Durrance, Jerry's child. She sat alone over a picture puzzle. Her eyes dull and staring behind her glasses. Her plain little face tightened into an expressionless mask. I went and stood beside her chair. She turned away from me. Hello. What's the picture supposed to be? I don't know. Do you mind if I join you? I'll collect all of the pink pieces. I know who you are. You do? You're my new nurse. No, I'm not. Oh, you can't fool me. And I know why you've come here. To make sure I don't run away from this place again. Oh, did you run away from here once? I didn't know. What's your name? You know my name. That's why you stood there and stared at me. Oh, that was very rude of me. But you see, you reminded me of somebody. Who? Well, if you must know, myself. Of course, at your age. Oh, Christine, your schedule calls for you to spend the evening with the young people next door. They don't want me. Oh, nonsense. Of course they want you. I've got a fine ping-pong game all fixed up for you. Barbara and Betty against you and Bob. But he's the best player here. And I'll be the worst one. I'll die. I'll just die. Now you'll do nothing of the sort. Please, please, please don't make me. Don't make me. Oh, don't make me. Now, don't. Don't make me. <laughs> but the doctor wants Christine to have exercise in the evening. I'll see that she has some exercise. I have to take my car down to the town and leave it at the garage to be washed. Christine could go with me. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Christine, oh, but please I... Please let me go with this lady. I'll drink all my cocoa tonight, if you will. For goodness sake, Christine, don't carry on. Go get your coat. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, Trask, I couldn't help it. <laughs> I thought you were too tired to do anything but just crawl into bed. I suppose Cascade has performed another miracle on me. Tina's room was next to mine. Late that night, I heard her. She was crying. Tina. Tina, what's the matter? Don't be afraid. What is it, Tina? Oh, don't leave me. Don't leave me. I won't till you're asleep. Tell me what's the matter. I'm ugly and mean and nobody likes me. Tina, you? I'm not pretty in the least. And they hate me. They all hate me. Who are they? Everybody. All the kids at school, Miss Trask and the nurses and the doctors. Oh, there must be something terribly wrong with me. Do you like them, Tina? Oh, no, I hate them. That's the trouble. If you want people to like you, you've got to like people. I bet you're only fooling me. Well, you try it and see. And in the meantime, it'll help you any. I like you. And I think you're very pretty and very sweet. You do? Really? Really. Now don't cry anymore. Oh, why are you so good to me? Because somebody was good to me once when I needed somebody. Now, now, come on, go to sleep. 
close your eyes and let your muscles go all limp. There, that's better. Much better. Jerry's child was in my arms. Jerry's child was clinging to me. Jerry's child. Well, Chuck, I hear you're running Cascade now, giving orders to mistrust my doctor. You mean about that child? Don't try to appear innocent. But I didn't give any orders. I only requested. I thought you came up here to have a nervous breakdown. Well... I've decided not to have one, if it's all the same to you. Say, well, go on. I just think Tina is so unhappy here. I haven't anything to do with my time. Mightn't I be the nurse instead? I promise not to do anything again without first asking your permission. If only... Mm -hmm. Well, just go ahead and tell me what you'd do. I'd stay with her, pay attention to her, make her feel wanted and important. I'd, well, I'd take her camping in the woods. She adores camping. Sounds like a wonderful break for her. Of course, I couldn't do it without her parents' permission. I wouldn't. What would her mother say, do you suppose? Oh, she'd accept any plan that would relieve her of the child who's always been a thorn in her side. Though the lady would loudly protest if she heard me say so. And her, her father, what would his attitude be? Sympathetic and protective, possibly too protective for Christine's good. Result, resentment felt by the mother. See, the child's absence from home became desirable for all concerned, so I brought her here. I was highly recommended to the father by a friend of his, but uh, he placed her in my care, not yours. I suppose I'd better ask you something. How much do you remember about my trip to South America? Well, you sent some beautiful postcards. No, that's not what I mean, about an automobile trip I made and the man who was with me. I never knew the gentleman's name. You never told me. I'd better tell you now. It was Tina's father. Tina's father? Mm -hmm. Does that alter the situation? Of course it does. I don't know anything about your relationship with Dorrance. I don't know how emotionally involved you are with him. I... I can't work in the dark. Well, I'll tell you everything. It's over. That's it in two words. And Tina needs me, and I... Well, I've never been needed before. <laughs> well, I'm crazy, but if you promise to behave yourself... Oh, thanks. But you're only on probation. Remember what it says in the Bible. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. How does it feel to be the Lord? Oh, Jerry had to be told, of course, and though we never saw him, he sent a message through Tina. He asked her to thank me. And then came the time when we returned to Boston and the house was filled with young people. It was laughter and fun and Tina coming down the stairs in a new dress and her hair all curled and, and Jerry standing there. Tina. Daddy, oh, Daddy. Well, can this be Tina? Do I look nice? It's my first party dress. You look lovely. Do you really like me? Oh, I love you, darling. Tina, don't you think it'd be nice to show your father your room and your studio and everything? Would you like to see my room, Daddy? Oh, very much, if Miss Vale will pardon us. How long are you going to call her Miss Vale? What should I call her? I don't know. Would it sound too funny if you called her my name for her? Now, what name is that? We decided it on the camping trip. I call her Camille. Camille. I think it would sound very nice indeed. Jerry, what are you doing here all alone? Come and join the party. Uh, I want to speak to you, Charlotte. What about? That to take Tina home. Take her home? But you... But you can't. Dr. Jackwell says it'll be the worst possible thing. Oh, I don't care what he says. Charlotte, I've accomplished very little with my life, but oddly enough, I've always managed to keep my self-respect. How am I to interpret that? By recognizing the sacrifice you're making and admitting it. I can't let you do it, Charlotte. I can't go on forever taking, taking, taking from you and giving nothing. Jerry, that's the most conventional, pious speech I've ever heard. Oh, forgive me. I know it's your pride, isn't it? Let me explain. You will be giving. Don't you know that to take is sometimes a way to give? The most beautiful way in the world if two people love each other? You'll be giving me Tina. Every single day I'll be taking and you'll be giving. That's very kind of you to put it that way. Well, then is it something that Tina has said? Don't you think she's happy here? Happy? She told me upstairs she loved you almost as much as she loves me. Well, what is the reason? Is it something about us? Well, of course it's about us. Why didn't you marry Livingston? I'll tell you why. Because I came along and ruined him for you. And now my child comes along and claims all your attention and takes your whole life. 
when you should be trying to find some man who'll make you happy. Some man who will make me happy. Oh, so that's it. Here I've been laboring under the illusion that you and I were so in sympathy, so one, that you'd know without being asked what would make me happy. And you come up here to talk about some man. Jerry, you haven't the slightest conception of what torture it is to love a man and be shut out, to be always an outsider and an extra. Charlotte. When Tina said she'd come and stay with me, it was, well, it was like a miracle, like having my own child, a part of you. I thought you'd understand, but evidently you don't. Again, I've been just a sentimental fool. It's a tendency I have. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, I thought... I was afraid you were keeping Tina out of pity. Pity? But there wasn't any pity in your voice just now. <laughs> I feel very small, Charlotte, and very much ashamed. I'll never doubt you again. Thank you. Come here. Come here, Charlotte. No, Jerry, please. Let me go. Listen, darling, Dr. Jackwith knows about us. When he said I could take Tina, he said, you're on probation. Do you know what that means? He allowed you to come here as a test. And if I can't stand the test, I'll lose Tina and we'll lose each other. Jerry, please help me. Well, uh, shall we have a cigarette on? Yes, please. May I sometimes come here? Oh, whenever you like. There are people here who love you. And it won't be for this time only. That is, if you'll help me keep what we have. We could talk about your child. Our child. Thank you. There's something else I, I want to tell you. I, I don't know how. Charlotte, I'm not afraid of what's ahead for us. We have a certain immunity, you and I. It's, it's a strange kind of love, isn't it, that keeps us apart. But it's stronger than both of us together. And it won't die. You believe that, Charlotte? And you will be happy. Oh, Jerry, don't let's ask for the moon. We have the stars. Betty Davis and Gregory Peck will return for a curtain call in just a moment. I read the other day that a neighbor of ours was getting married. So when I met her younger sister, I asked about Mary. Susie gave me a withering look. She gives me a pain. What now? Well, the airs Mary puts on. She came into the kitchen last night while Mom and I were doing the dishes. And of course, she hasn't touched a dishcloth since she's been dating Fred. Here was Mom, up to her elbows in suds. What do you suppose Mary said? From your look, it wasn't good. <laughs> the nerve of her. She said she couldn't possibly wash dishes when she got married because Fred's always raving about her soft white hands and she doesn't want to spoil them. And what did your mother say? Well, I spoke up before Mom had a chance. I said if her eyes weren't on Fred so much, she'd see that box of Lux right on the kitchen sink and she'd have taken a look at her own mother's hands. Why, since Mom changed to Lux, her hands look divine. So then what? <laughs> so Mary did take a look at Mom's hands and kissed her and said, whoopee, and off she went. To buy a box of Lux flakes? No, of course not. She had a date with Fred. But I could see she was impressed. Well, it is impressive, Susie. You see, the Lux people made a lot of actual tests. What kind of tests, Mr. Kennedy? They had women wash dishes with strong soaps. And you should have seen their hands. <laughs> like Mom's used to be, I guess. All red and rough. Yes, then the same women changed to Lux Flakes, and their hands became soft and smooth and lovely again. Well, Mom says it costs hardly anything to use Lux for dishes. She says a big box lasts and lasts. That's true. Lux does go further. Lux does up to twice as many dishes, ounce per ounce, as other leading soaps tested. Your mother's a smart woman, Susie, and I'll bet your sister Mary will take after her. Here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. It gives me great pleasure to bring back to the footlights for their curtain call... Betty Davis and Gregory Peck, who appear together for the first time on any stage. Well, it seems natural to be on a stage with you again, Bill. And it's been a real privilege for me to play opposite Betty. Betty, I, I want you to know how proud we all are of the honor accorded you in Mexico as the first American screen star to be included on their role of honor. What was the occasion, Betty? Well, it was a screening of The Corn is Green in connection with the opening of a K-1 
campaign to educate all Mexicans to read and write. And thousands of Mexicans who learn to write will be sending you and Greg fan mail, that I'm sure. Greg, I'm happy to see that your boss, David O. Selznick, won the December box office Blue Ribbon Award for Spellbound. Yes, I feel mighty lucky to have been in that picture, Bill. Oh, I don't think it was luck. I think for both of you, success was predetermined. It's a very nice thought, Bill. What do you mean? Well, you may not know it, but you were both born on the same day in April. And from ancient law, you know how the stars affect our lives. Well, I know how stars like Betty Davis affect mine. <laughs> well... <laughs> I'm talking about the celestial stars. Oh, I'm afraid that subject's a little over my head, Bill. Well, perhaps we'd better gravitate to the stars we're having in this theater next week. That's better, Bill. Who are they? They represent two generations of fine acting, Lionel Barrymore and Margaret O'Brien. In the 20th century, Fox hit Captain January. Captain January is a story of a bluff and salty lighthouse keeper and the light of his life, a little girl named Star. A story of how they face an often hostile world together, bound to each other by tenderness and understanding. They should be wonderful together in that play, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night. You took us on a very pleasant voyage. <laughs> Before we part, may I leave with you a grave and vitally important message. In the recent war, we learned what loss of life and limb can mean in terms of human anguish. And yet in America today, there is a shocking toll of lives and human injuries through carelessness. Carelessness that since Pearl Harbor has killed more Americans at home than lost their lives in battle. Yes, it doesn't seem possible, but it's true. Most accidents are preventable if each of us will assume responsibility. Especially on public highways, drive with care. Observe all speed and traffic regulations. Be ready for unforeseen emergencies. Help stop the growing scourge of accidents throughout America. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Margaret O'Brien and Lionel Barrymore in Captain January. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. In reviewing the wartime record of the motion picture studios, their stars, executives, and personnel, America can be proud that its great entertainment industry, mobilized for victory, received the commendations of two presidents of the United States. Also, the commendations of the Secretaries of War, the Navy, and the Treasury, as well as of the commanding officers of every military branch in every theater of the war. For its unstinted service in the cause of victory, the motion picture industry has earned the gratitude of all America. Betty Davis will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, A Stolen Life. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Now Voyager, starring Betty Davis and Gregory Peck, has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the safe, gentle flakes, smart women everywhere, used for all nice washables. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Captain January with Margaret O'Brien and Lionel Barrymore. The Spry Treat of the Week. Tender golden spry pancakes to put you in high on brisk winter mornings. Mmm, mmm, taste the delicate flavor difference in pancakes made with spry, the pure all-vegetable shortening that gives all your cooking a boost for the better. Rely on spry. Next week's Lux Radio Theater presentation, Captain January, is based on a novel by Laura E. Richards, published and copyrighted by L.C. Page and Company. Be sure to listen. And why not tune in a half hour early to hear Joan Davis over most of these stations? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Torlite brings you Everything for the Boys, the Command Theater of the Air, starring Mr. Ronald Coleman, his guest, Miss Betty Davis. Everything for the Boys is presented by the Electric Autolite Company and its 22 great manufacturing plants. Builders of precision equipment for 35 years. World famous for Autolite spark plugs, batteries, wire, cable, and electrical systems for automotive, aviation, and marine use. Your host, Mr. Ronald Coleman. <laughs> Thank you and good evening. Yes, I think we may say a very good evening, for we have a famous guest, a great play, and a shortwave conversation to a very remote place on this globe. We were delighted when Betty Davis said she would be here with us tonight, and particularly in a reunion with Somerset Maugham's great emotional story of human bondage. Arch Obler has written an exciting radio dramatization of that novel. After the play is over, Betty and I are going to talk by short wave to some American soldiers in Reykjavik, Iceland. We're going to talk of life, love, and the absence of trees in, in the Arctic. So to them and their comrades stationed in the far north, we dedicate this global half hour. <laughs> Before our play begins, a simple question. How many hands is a pilot? Two, you say? In our four-engine bombers, they are multiplied many times electrically. These electrical helpers are called aircraft relays. I'd like to tell you about them, how they help the pilot, the bombardier, the flight engineer. But I'm sorry this information must be withheld. I can tell you that they are a type of remote control switch precision device that must obey commands with split-second speed. Aircraft electrical relays have greatly contributed to modern airplane design and production. Autolite men and women, backed by their 35 years of experience in precision manufacturing, have designed, engineered, and are now building such aircraft relays in volume. New types of materials, plus Autolite's manufacturing know-how, have resulted in an aircraft relay weighing less than half its original weight. At the same time, Autolite engineers increased its load capacity, with contact life outperforming test requirements as much as 300%. Knowing how to build such dependable equipment is proof again that the name Autolite means precision manufacturing. <laughs> The players, Mr. Ronald Coleman and his guest, Miss Betty Davis. A priest sits in the quiet of his study. These are the thoughts in his mind. I am a minister of God. Tonight I sat at the bedside of one who was very ill. Her thin face was a heavy mask of powder, a death's head with a twisting mouth. <laughs> she had a strange story of hate to tell me. Hate for a man named Philip Carey. How he had cheated her, and he a gentleman. She told me many things. How one night the man had come into the tea shop where she worked. He had told her he was from the medical school nearby, and so she had been pleasant to him. But as the woman talked, strangely, somehow, I could sense the untruth behind her words. What you want? Here's nothing. Well, I, I'd rather just talk to you. It really is filthy weather outside, isn't it? It makes no difference to me. I'm in here all day. Oh, that's true, of course, isn't it? Yeah. I'm here to take orders and wait on customers. 
I've got nothing to say to them, and I don't want them to say anything to me. Well, I beg your pardon. I do indeed. Her name, she told me, was Mildred Rogers. And she said that since this man, Philip Carey, was a cripple, a clubfoot, she began to be particularly nice to him out of simple decency. And again, somehow, through her words, I sensed the lie and the truth. You don't mind my walking home with you? Why should I mind? If you can keep up with me. Oh, you mean my... If the shoe fits, wear it. I don't know why I tolerate you. You don't have to talk with me, you know. When I'm away from you, I think it's impossible. When, when I'm with you... I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't take me out, some other fellow will. I come from good family, you know. Was your father a professional man? He was a doctor. I knew it. The minute you came into the shop, I saw you was a gentleman in every sense of the word. Look here. May I call you Mildred? You may if you like. I don't mind. Call me Philip, won't you? I will if I can think of it. You might go as far as to say you'd like to. Why? Why, it doesn't matter. Would you come and see a play with me? Why? Because I want you to, because I want to be with you. Well, I'd better go in now. This is where I live. Oh. Mildred. What are you trying to do? Won't you? Kiss me goodnight. Empty then. I want to kiss your thin, pale mouth. Oh, you can go to the devil. You go to the devil. <laughs> she went on telling me how nice she had been to the man. How very nice. <laughs> Why are you waiting for me? Well, Mildred, have you forgotten? You said you'd go out with me. No. Me aunt Phil. Got to go and stay with her. You're going out with somebody else. You are, aren't you? It's that man Miller that always comes into the shop, isn't it? You've been spying on me, and I thought you was a gentleman. It is, Miller. Well, I'd rather wait for him than have to wait for you. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Mildred, you... Mildred, don't be beastly with me. I... I'm awfully fond of you. I can't help it. Please dine with me. We'll go anywhere you want. No. You keep looking around for him. I'm standing here, and you're looking for him. Mildred, I... I can't go on like this. It's too degrading. If I go, I go for good. Unless you come with me tonight, you'll never see me again. <laughs> good riddance to bad rubbish. You. All right. Goodbye. Are you back again? Do you want to order some tea? Don't remember that I... I said I'd never see you again. Oh, did you? Then what you doing here now? Wish I knew why I came back. I don't. Do you want to order some tea? Mildred, don't be beastly to me. You're a funny fellow. I'm very simple. I'm a blasted fool who's in love with you with all my heart and soul. Well, I've said it. I know you don't care tough and for me, but I've said it. Mildred, I can't endure this anymore. I've tried to get over you and I can't. I never shall. Marry me. Do you hear me? Marry me. She told me that Philip's talk of marriage made her begin to think of marriage for the first time. There was a nice elderly gentleman who came into the shop, a commercial traveler by the name of Miller, a good, substantial citizen. And so, Fitch, she had gone away with this Mr. Miller. Philip was to blame, she said. And so when Mr. Miller left her, she had come back to await the birth of Miller's baby. What are you talking Oh, you mean Griffith. Well, he's an unpunctual devil. He's probably making love to one of his girls somewhere along the line. That's not the way to talk in front of me. Oh, come, come now. The facts of life are the facts, after all. Oh, Griffith! Griffith, over here! I say, he's a handsome guest. All right. Oh, Clifford, do forgive me. I'm terribly sorry to be so late. Quite as long as you're here. Uh, Mrs. Miller, may I present my best friend, Harry Griffith. 
How do you do? Well, this is indeed a pleasure, Mrs. Miller. I've heard a great deal about you. Really? Not so much as I've heard about you. <laughs> What's this? Has Philip been blackening my character? Oh, no, he's just been saying the nicest things about you. Mm -hmm. I've been so looking forward to meeting you. Why don't you sit down here, Mr. Griffith? Well. Isn't the sea wonderful today, Mr. Griffith? Blue light. Like the promise of heaven. This is it now. <laughs> Tell me, Mildred. Philip, I might as well tell you and have done with it. I can't marry you at all. Chris? Yes. I don't know what's come over me. Well, say something. I will. I will. I paid out the money to keep you until your baby was born. I paid for your doctor. I paid for you to go to the seashore. I paid for the keep of your baby. I paid then, I'm paying now. Haven't you any loyalty in you? If you was a gentleman, you wouldn't know what you've done for me in the face. Oh, for heaven's sake, shut up. If I were a gentleman, I wouldn't waste my time with a creature like you. A crazy silly, crazy wanting to be with you. You're coming with me to Paris, and you're going to marry me on Saturday, or and take the consequences. All right. You go? Don't make me laugh. I wouldn't let you touch me now if I was starving. I'm through with you. Oh, Philip. Before I go, there's these bills. Bills? Or what? The dress you said I should have, and the baby's suit with Mrs. Cleary, and my rent that's due on Saturday. What of it? I need the money very much. Do you? I should think you'd want to give it to me. I won't. Well, I'll ask Harry Griffith. Will you? He owes me seven pounds this moment. Goodbye, Mildred. I... Oh, here, take the money. Take it. Well, you we might at least be civil about it. If you want, I'll kiss you goodbye. Don't touch me. Goodbye. Good riddance. Hello? Hello, could I speak to Mr. Griffith, please? Oh, it's you, Harry. I didn't recognize your voice. Harry, listen. I've got the money. We can go away, like you said now. We can go away now. She said Philip Terry left her then, walked out on her. And then she said that after a few weeks his conscience began to hurt him because he looked her up at the apartment of the relative where she was staying. <laughs> but the lie was clearer than ever before. Milton! Milton! Well, that's the same you. What are you doing out here? What do you think? Uh-oh. Leave me alone. I, I have a few problems with the broke. I was just walking along here on my way back to my lodging. I expect to meet one of the girls from where I work. Don't lie, for God's sake. Don't lie now. Oh, sit down. <laughs> Come on. Come on, get into the cab. Come on, get everything will be all right. Believe me. Told me he began to plead with her to come back to him. And finally she agreed. <laughs> Only for the baby's sake, she said. How are you? The baby all right? The baby's sleeping. Oh. Well, I, I think I'll go back to my own room. Bella, what do you want to go to bed so early for? Well, it's nearly one. I'm not used to late hours, is it? Philip. Yes? Philip, it's almost two weeks now since you asked me to come and stay here. I... I didn't mean what you thought I meant when you said you didn't want me to do anything for you except just to cook and take care of the flat and that sort of thing. Didn't you? I did. Oh, don't be such an old silly. Well, I meant it quite seriously, I... 
shouldn't have asked you to stay here under any other condition. Why not? Well, I can't explain it. I, I feel differently, that's all. Very well. Just as you choose. You're a fool. Good night. <laughs> She did everything to make life easier for the man, wash for him, cook for him, sew for him. But his treatment of her became worse and worse until she couldn't endure his cruelty any longer. But as her thin lips said the hateful words, in my own mind I saw the truth. You're home late, Philip. Oh, uh, why aren't you in bed? I waited up for you. Sit here by me. All right. Philip. Yes? I do love you. Please don't talk right. Why don't you go to bed? Uh, Philip, I can't live without you. I want to make up for all the harm I did you. Philip. Mildred, please, your arms are... Philip. Oh, Philip. No. I need you, Philip. Philip, now. Philip, stop it. It's too late. I loved you too much. There's nothing left now. I can't look at you now without thinking of Emma Miller and Griffith. <laughs> Mildred, I can't help it. That's the way it is. <laughs> you old silly. I believe you're nervous. You disgust me. What? You heard me. You disgust me. Me? Me? I disgust you. Well, you disgust me. You me. And we laughed at you, Griffith and me. And at you because you were such a maga, maga. And you want to know why? A cripple, a cripple, a cripple. <laughs> Where I was so very nice to mean to me, I had to go away. He said, I'm telling you the truth. Oh, be quiet, you brat, you. We'll be out of here soon enough. I've got work to do. The night is beautiful, picture. There's the first one. Oh, stop it, stop it. I'll smash it over you. Now the second one. That will show it. The night now, his favorite now his book. Oh, no, no. First the mirror. Now his book. Thank him, book. There, there. That'll show him. That'll show him. That'll show him. The words came slower now as she told me how she went away quietly, determined never to see him again. And then she was ill. And since she had nothing... She called him back to look after her, as a doctor looks after a woman. Mildred! Mildred! What, you follow me? Mildred! Mildred, you shouldn't be out. You're, you're sick. I warned you weeks ago. I'll hold the door. Oh, for heaven's sake, come along. Let go of me. Let me take you home. Please listen to me, Mildred. No, no, let go of Mildred. me. I'll do as I please. please let listen. go of me. I'll do as I please. Then her last words. I don't believe I will ever forget them. I haven't seen him now for a long time. I hear he's a regular doctor now. And there's a girl. Good girl. And he's going to marry her. Marry her. You hear that, father? Marry her. I hate you. I hate you. And tell him that I hate you. I've got to know that. Tell him Mildred sent him. 
that she never wanted him. She never will want him. Tell him that, Father. Tell him Mildred says it. I will tell him. I will tell him you are sorry for what you did to him. What? What did you say? I will tell him you are sorry for what you did to him. And ask his forgiveness. No. No, that isn't true. I... Oh, yes. Yes, it is. He was so good to me. Brushing my hair like he used to. Making me feel like a lady. When I was not. Nothing but dirt under his feet. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, Philip. Philip, I'm sick and I'm scared. You were so good to me. The only one that ever was. Why did I let you go? You have just heard Miss Betty Davis and Mr. Ronald Coleman with Hans Tom Reed in Of Human Bondage, is dramatized for radio by Art Jobelitz. The original score was written and conducted by Gordon Jenkins. While the two-way shortwave radio circuit is being set up between Hollywood and Iceland, a thought about one of your problems. Do you know how important a distributor in your car is to efficient engine performance and economy? It's very important because it distributes high-voltage electrical current to the spark plugs at the proper instant. In a six-cylinder automobile engine running at 35 miles an hour, the spark must occur every one-eightieth of a second. Imagine, about 5,000 times every minute. No matter how strong the electrical impulse may be or how perfect the wiring, an efficient spark can only arrive at the spark plug to a healthy distributor. During these war days, when your car must last longer than ever before, the life of the distributor should be safeguarded by giving it greater care. Drive in to any one of the thousands of Autolite service stations, your local car dealer or serviceman. Have the electrical lifeline in your car checked. This will include the distributor. If any of the parts are worn or out of adjustment, replace them if necessary with original factory parts, Autolite parts. They will help keep your engine operating at top efficiency and economy. Remember, the name Autolite means precision manufacturing. Mr. Coleman, we'll be ready on your call to Iceland in just a minute. Thank you. Uh, that just gives me time to say this to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, we have a problem. Hundreds of letters have come to me from relatives of men overseas, asking me if I would arrange our shortwave conversation this week or next so that we could talk to their own sons, husbands, and brothers. Well, we'd like nothing better than to be able to grant all these sincere requests and make these dreams come true. But unfortunately, uh, the regulations of the War Department make that impossible. The men on the fighting fronts to whom we speak are chosen by the military authorities. We know of their identity only a matter of hours before broadcast time. Of course, from week to week, it may happen that someone close to you will appear in this program, but as with so many things in life, that's a matter of happy chance. Now, one more thought. Uh, to you, to you who long so much for the voice of someone you love, think of the great happiness that comes to the families of the boys who do speak on this program. Then I'm sure you'll be happy with them and for them. You might think of the boys, too, as if they were your own. They are, in a way, aren't they? Yours and mine. And now, Engineer, how's the call coming? Reykjavik Iceland is standing by, Mr. Coleman. All right. Hollywood to Reykjavik. I've never done that before. <laughs> you're, you're always wonderful in the new role, Betty. You put on these earphones, grab a fur coat, and let's join the boys up at Reykjavik on the Flaxifloy. What's the Flaxifloy, Ronnie? What?
Ben would send her his love. Oh, I'm sure of that. Well, just so she'll get the message, you deliver it. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. From Ben to Charlotte, I love you. <laughs> Ronnie, you're giving that sergeant an awful lot to live up to. <laughs> but what are the other messages? Well, there's one from his n newest nephew, James. He's only five months old, so you haven't seen him yet, Ben. But your mother quotes him as saying, Da Da Glub. Which, <laughs> which liberally translated means I'm very proud of my Uncle Benny. <laughs> In Icelandic, Ben. And your father says he hopes you're keeping up with your music. That's right. They were all proud when they saw your photo in Life magazine a few weeks ago. You were leading carolers on Christmas Eve. That was just after you'd gotten through the services for those of Jewish faith. Uh, Betty, do you know what his mother says Ben misses most of all? Well, he comes from Milwaukee, so I'd say it's beer. No, no it's trees. Trees? Yes, they don't have many trees in Iceland. I think we ought to do something about that, Betty. For instance? Well, can you make the sound of a tree? <laughs> That's one role I've never tried. Well, how about a little help from the sound department? <laughs> All right. You hear that, Ben? Well, we've just brought you a charming maple tree on the Kinnikinick River. <laughs> <laughs> That's as bad as flax, Floy. <laughs> By the way, what is that? Ah, uh, Betty, there's another young man waiting for a message. Oh, yes, Private Jimmy Jones. We understand, Jimmy, that your regimental commander calls you the ideal soldier for contributing to Icelandic friendly relations. Oh, really? I would like to talk to this young man. I've known a few friendly Joneses myself. Well, he's quite a fellow, Betty. Jimmy, we heard about your risking your own life to rescue a child from the path of an automobile. Just to make you feel at home, we've brought you something from your hometown of Pittsburgh. Yes, Jimmy Jones, from Hollywood to Iceland to Pittsburgh. Listen. There you are. How's that, Jimmy? <laughs> now, Ronnie, before we go any further, I want something done about my request. Oh, yes, I know. About Flaxy Floyd. Well, uh, Frank Martin, do you know? Why, yes, it's a bay, of course. Reykjavik is on the Bay of Flaxafloy. Uh, 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 of course, Betty. Oh, is that all? You know, boys, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I really thought... Time's up, a... Miss Davis. <laughs> Maybe it's just as well. Just as well. Good night, Sergeant Cohen and Private Jones. Good luck and God bless you. Good night, boys. Good night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, those boys so far from home... Bring to mind a young lad who might have been from your town before he enlisted. He married his high school sweetheart. A year later, he went overseas. It was rather like the end of the world for both of them, especially because he wouldn't be around for their baby's arrival. Well, he saw plenty of action, but one thing that worried him was that the mail was not getting through regularly, and the lad began to worry. The baby, perhaps his wife, was sick. So he went to the Red Cross field director. A cable was dispatched to a Red Cross chapter back home. Not long after, these reassuring words arrived. Son born last week, wife writing regularly, both are well. Now, the Red Cross needs your help now to carry on this and many other services here and overseas. The Red Cross is your hand and your heart. Next week, Global Life cordially invites you to another program of Everything for the Boys, your new global half hour uniting the home front and the fighting front. Your host, Ronald Coleman, in a dual role, will have as his guest, Miss Ann Baxter, in our Tobolus dramatization of the very amusing comedy, The Ghost Goes West, dedicated to a pair of our fighting men who will speak directly from their distant base in Chongqing, China. Our thanks to Betty Davis for being with us tonight. Until next week, when Ann Baxter is our guest, this is Ronald Coleman saying good night to you and the boys, and God be with you. Betty Davis, whose latest film is Old Acquaintance, appeared through courtesy of Warner Brothers Pictures. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Tonight, your neighborhood good golf dealer joins the golf companies in presenting the third in a new series of programs. Reviews, musical comedies, and dramatic shows, all the varied entertainment forms of Hollywood. So welcome, all of you, to the motion picture star's own program, the Golf Screen Guild Show, with Betty Davis, 
Robert Montgomery, Basil Rathbone, Louise Beaver, Oscar Bradley, and Hollywood's favorite master of ceremonies, George Murphy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third Screen Guild show. Hollywood's own program, written, directed, and acted by the greatest names in the motion picture industry for the benefit of the Motion Picture Relief Fund. Each week, we present a different type show with a different cast of stars. Last week, a musical comedy. Next week, a review starring Mary Bolin, Marlena Dietrich, Frank Morgan, and Cliff Nazaro. Tonight, it's a drama, Can We Forget? Directed by Frank Capra and written by Mary McCall, Jr. under the musical direction of Oscar Bradley. invited to a gay party at an exclusive hotel on Park Avenue, where the most photographed, the most discussed, the most envied debutante of the season, Hilda Rutherford, played by Betty Davis, is having her coming out party. Among her many admirers in the stag line is a young man named Alan Barker, played by Robert Montgomery. Dancing with Hill at the moment is Paul Ferguson, enacted by Basil Rathbun. Lights. <laughs> Music. <laughs> Curtain. <laughs> Now, if the stag line doesn't discover this alcove for a minute, perhaps I'll be allowed a few steps with you. Oh, it's a lovely party, Hilda. Do you think so, really, Paul? Well, don't you? Oh, it's wonderful to me. I love the whole silly business. Being rushed, being stared at. Makes up for all the black times of childhood. Like the years I had to wear bands on my Oh, you never did. (laughs) I did so. And I (laughs) lift. You know, Paul, I didn't think you'd come tonight. Whatever put that into your head? Oh, I was afraid you were above Deb parties. Aren't you always merging companies and sitting on board? Oh, sounds like a very uncomfortable position. Perhaps that's why I was afraid you wouldn't ask me. Not ask you? Paul. Well, a man of 35 must appear to you to be on the very brink of his dotage. May I cut in, please? Oh, uh, I'll allow it only if I may have the supper dance with you, Hilda. It's a bargain. Don't forget. I won't. Oh, but you will, though. I will what? Forget whatever it is. You'll only remember me. I don't remember meeting you. You haven't. We dance well, don't we? Well, if I've never met you, I couldn't have asked you to my party. That's right. You weren't asked. No, I weren't asked. You crashed my party. Yes, but I did it so neatly. More like an incision than a crash. You know, uh, you're not as pretty as your pictures. Mr. Whatever your name is, I... But you're much livelier. Makes you shine, kind of. Get your coat, Hilda. Get my coat? What on earth are you talking about? About getting your coat. We can't talk here. This place is full of people. Yes, it's full of people. Full of my guests, my invited guests. And if you think I'm going to leave here with you, you're out of your mind. I never heard such a noise! No, of course not. She's unique. Does she always do that? Yeah, mostly. I call her the Blue Arrow. I bought her on time, my freshman year in college, for $23. <laughs> What's that, a radio? Certainly it's a radio. But no brakes. No. No, I drag one foot on the hills. <laughs> <clears throat> Hilda, tell me what you like. What do you mean, tell me? Now, don't start that again. I want to know what you like. Food, books, anything. Well, well, I like cream cheese and fur bedroom slippers, the smell of heliotrope, horses... Flagstaff's voice, Helen Hayes. What on earth am I doing this for? Because I asked you to. Now, I'll tell you what I like. I like the west front of the Parthenon. Oh, by the way, I'm an architect. Just out of the shell, but <laughs> boy, am I talented. Oh. You know, you must try to get over that inferiority complex. It doesn't do to be too much. Don't interrupt. And I like English shoes and eggs Benedict and uh, kissing a girl in the cold and the Mohawk Valley in May and... Oh, Hilda, you're a swell girl. Will you marry me, Hilda? What's your name? Alan Baker. What's that got to do with it? Alan Baker. I think you're the freshest, rudest, most conceited puppy I have ever met. And I wouldn't marry you if you were the last man in the world. And whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. 
This carriage will never take the place of your automobile, darling. <laughs> Does the horse also park? Well, he's an English horse. <laughs> I say, old fellow, uh, cease walking. <laughs> no. Desist. Relax. <laughs> Halt. Why don't you just say, whoa? <laughs> <laughs> you make everything so simple, dear. <laughs> you happy, Hilda? Oh, yes, Alan. I'm so happy I could purr. Well, go ahead. Purr? It's a mighty poor purr. <laughs> How about a little music? You're crazy not to like that funny little phonograph all over the music. Sure, you know the old saying. She shall have music wherever she goes. You were playing that song when you first spoke to me, darling. Uh-huh. That's why I like it. Hilda, if I say something, don't laugh at me, will you? Oh, no, I'll never laugh at you when you're serious. Well, all that... That dizzy business the night we met, dragging you out of your party, that was because I was scared. Scared? Sure. If I'd had someone introduce me, I'd have been just another guy. I had to shock you, make you laugh, make you mad, because I had to have you. But, darling, you'd never seen me before. No, no, I crashed your party to see the girl who was in all the papers. And there I found you, darling. Hilda, no matter how gay you are, or sad, or anything, you make me feel you're only using part of it. There's so much more to you. I knew that night that I couldn't let anyone but me... Oh, Hilda, always love me. Oh, yes. Yes, I'll always love you, Alan. Even when we're both old, my heart will still jump when I see you. You said that night I had a kind of... Well, that I saw it shown. That's only when I'm with you. That's only because of you. Now, these are the place plates, Camille. Yes, um. When you take off the soup plates, you leave the place plates. Just leave them set? Yes, that's right. Oh. Then you exchange them one by one for the hot dinner plates. Miss Baker, why don't you all just have a lap supper? <laughs> well, Camille, because Mr. Baker is bringing home a client. Yes, um, but a lap supper don't take so much swapping. <laughs> I was only hired out to you for cleaning, Miss Baker. For waiting, you should have had my cousin Octavia. <laughs> you can do it, Camille, if you only just try. Now, once again, the place plate. Oh, dear, see who it is. Yes, sir. Um, only if it's the ice cream, it'll be all too much by the time... Yes, sir. Mrs. Baker? Well, I don't think she want to see nobody. We got a company dinner on uh, hand. Yes, and... yes, but I'm the company. Uh, may I come in? Who is it, Camille? Hello, Hilda. Paul? Yes. Paul Ferguson, are you... You're not Alan's client, Mr. Ferguson. Yes, why not? Let me look at you. Oh, oh you look lovely. No, lovelier. You're very happy, aren't you? Oh, yes, we're very happy. Sit down, won't you? Thanks. Paul, um... Paul, tell me something. Do you honestly want Alan to do your house? Because if it's to help him because of me, well, Alan and I couldn't accept that. Oh, don't be silly. I like his work enormously. He has taste and originality, and his plans are practical. Oh, he is a grand architect. Well, then? Then it's all right. Paul, why didn't you come to our wedding? Uh, I, uh, I was away. I couldn't get back in time. In here, darling. Paul's here. Paul? Paul? Paul who? Oh, Hello, Mr. Ferguson. Uh -huh. Hello. Alan, you idiot. Why didn't you tell me it was Paul Ferguson? I've known him forever. Oh, my dear child, a struggling architect doesn't call his clients by their first names. He was Mr. Ferguson to me. In fact, he was Mr. Ferguson. God bless him to me. <laughs> oh. Miss Baker? Yes, Camille. Miss Baker, I'm afraid you're all going to have to do without them place plates. <laughs> oh, Camille. Well... Well, I told you, if it was waiting you wanted, you should have had my cousin Octavia. <laughs> now, nurse. Yes, Mr. Baker, you may see her now. Hilda. 
Hilda. Hilda, it's a girl. Did you want a boy, Alan? You'd never tell me which. No, no, I... I wanted a girl so there'd be two of you. Was it very bad? No. Have you seen her, Alan? You bet I have. Is she all right? Alan, I don't lie to you. Is she perfect? Perfectly beautiful. What do you see for yourself? You want to see for yourself? Could I? Yes. The nurse is bringing her. Here she is. Uh, I'll, uh... <clears throat> I'll take a nurse. Keep your hand under her head. Sure. Nurse? Yes, Mrs. Baker. Could we have her by ourselves? Just for a minute. Of course. I'll wait outside. Oh, Ellen. She is beautiful. Gee, I had no idea they were born with fingernails. <laughs> Alan. Well, I mean, not like that. Is it? Is it okay to touch her? Yes. Well, you feel that skin, though. Say, is she doing that? Of course. Well, isn't that pretty advanced? I mean, most kids don't cry right off like that, do they? Oh, darling. I'm sorry to blubber like this, but it's so wonderful. Yeah. Well, what do you think I'm doing? Now, why don't you come right out and admit you take three sugars? I don't. Two in and one on the side. But you always put the side one in. <laughs> you mind your own business. <laughs> I gotta go, sweet. I'll just look in and see Carol. Is that tooth still bothering her? It's through. No kidding. Go look at it. Oh, but don't put your finger in her mouth. She'll snap at you. <laughs> <laughs> Kiss? Thank you. Now, don't forget the new dress. Oh, not a chance. What color? Any color. Uh, so long as it's red. <laughs> Bye, darling. Goodbye, you darling. Camille? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Miss Baker. Camille, I want to plan a nice dinner tonight because uh, tomorrow night Mr. Baker's taking me out. <laughs> it sure is a treat to watch Mr. Baker eat. I likes a hearty man. My husband was the picky kind. <laughs> well, I'll make out a list and call you, Camille. Yes, sir. Soup, soup. Beautiful soup, so rich and green. Da-da. Did you call me, Miss Baker? Oh, no, Camille, that was singing. <laughs> you certainly feel good this morning. Camille, I feel so good that if I felt any better, I'd bust. Carol has a tooth, Mr. Baker has a new house to do, tomorrow's our second wedding anniversary, and I'm going downtown to buy a new dress. Oh, Camille, make one of your lemon pies tonight, will you? <laughs> yes, sir. I'll get it, Camille. Soup, soup, beautiful soup, so rich and pink. Hello? Yes? Yes, this is Mrs. Baker. I'm sorry you have to speak very slowly. Oh, but you see, it can't be. You see, he just left. So it can't be. Oh. Oh, I'll be right there. Ah! Miss Baker! Oh, he just left! Camille, you know he only just left. They said he was crossing the subway. But he was here only a minute ago. Camille! That man said my husband is dead! Alan! You have just heard Act One of Can We Forget with Betty Davis, Robert Montgomery, Basil Rathbun, and Louise Beavers. Now, before we raise the curtain on Act Two, we'll hear a few words from Johnny Conti. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I wish that I could personally introduce to each one of you the good golf dealer in your neighborhood who helps make this program possible. But since I can't, why, I hope you'll take the opportunity of meeting him yourself the next time you're near his service station. You'll find that your golf dealer is a mighty good neighbor. An independent merchant who conducts his business to give you and your car the best in service as well as the best in automotive products. So next time your car needs gasoline or motor oil, visit your good golf dealer. Your motoring needs will receive prompt, courteous attention at the sign of the Gulf Orange Disc.
now the curtain is about to rise on the second act of our play, Can We Forget? Hilda Baker has been left alone with her baby daughter, Carol, after the sudden death of her husband, Alan. Hilda's old friend, Paul Ferguson, and Camille the maid are the only ones left to help her forget the tragedy. Lights. Music. Curtain. Miss Baker, Mr. Ferguson is here to see you. Tell him to go away. Hilda. That's all right, Camille. Yes, sir. Paul, please go away. You've been sending me away for six months. Paul, you've been so wonderful. But I just want to be alone, please. Hilda, believe me, I know how you loved Alan. I love him now. Just because he's dead doesn't change anything. Why can't I be dead, too? Don't say that. It's true. But you have Carol to think of. I've tried, Paul. How can I think when I keep hearing it over and over? I wake in the night hearing it. Hearing what, Hilda? That voice on the phone. That man telling me, Mrs. Baker, prepare yourself for a shock. Prepare myself. Stop, Hilda. Yes, I know. But Carol Saker must stop remembering. But, Paul, I hear it. I hear it over and over and over and over. Hilda! Now you're to dry your eyes and come out for a drive with me. Oh, Paul. I can't. You must. Do you understand? You're going to have dinner with Mr. Ferguson again? How did you guess, Camille? He's been doing that pretty regular for three near years now, ever since Mr. Yes, Camille. One of these days, I expect he's going to ask you to marry him. Yes. Yes, I suppose he will. You suppose he will? Well, excuse me for speaking right out, Miss Baker, but you ought to hope he will. Yes, I guess you're right. I ought to hope he will. I do, Camille. There he is. Let him in, will you? Yes, um, When he say he'll be here at 7 o'clock, he means two minutes after. Hello, Camille. Good evening, Mr. Ferguson. Hello, Paul. Oh, I like that blue dress. I only hope these will match. Flowers again? Oh, Paul, you should. Oh, <laughs> why not? They grow only for people like you. That's a very pretty speech, Mr. Ferguson. My, oh, I my. Love White orchids. Why, Paul, I haven't had white orchids since... Why, not since my debut. I'm glad you like them, dear. Where's Carol? In bed. Of course, she wanted to stay up and see you. Ah, uh-huh. good for Carol. Come on, dear. This is an important occasion tonight. Mario has a very special, special dinner waiting for us. Wish me luck, Camille. I sure it does. I sure it does, Mr. Ferguson. <laughs> They say that the honeymoon's over and married life begins with your first breakfast in your own house. In such a beautiful house. Alan enjoyed so much planning it for you. Toast, Mrs. Ferguson? Yes, thank you. Just wait till you see that terrace in the spring. There are bulbs scattered all through the grass. I know. I remember Alan saying they'd bloom next year. With those long windows open, it'll be like eating our breakfast out of doors. Yes. Alan planned that too. What? I thought I heard someone. Someone whistling. No, I don't hear anything. No. I guess it was my imagination. Or someone passing on the road. That hedge makes us very private. Alan always said that the planting was part of the house. Hilda. What? What did you say, Paul? What? I... I didn't say anything, dear. Oh, I, I thought... That white birch by the library bay was on the plan the first time he showed it to me. Because you like white birches. Yes, because I... Darling, darling, what's the matter? Nothing. Nothing, Paul, I... uh... Sugar? Oh, don't you remember me? I'm Paul, the man who hates sugar in his coffee. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Whatever am I thinking of? You were thinking of me. Two lumps in and one on the side. But you put the side one in. Hilda, Hilda, what is it? Aren't you feeling well? Yes, yes, I'm all right, Paul. Remember that last breakfast? We had such fun being in love. Yes, such fun. Darling, darling, there is something wrong. 
No, I... Uh... Good morning, Mother. Oh, good morning, darling. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Missy. <laughs> That's a funny name. Oh, well, you're a funny girl. She just cut her first tooth. We were so proud of her, remember? Hilda. Remember Hilda in the hospital? Her first cry. And I said... Alan. I mean... I mean, Paul, excuse me. Hilda. I... Hilda. Hilda, where are you going? Hilda. Oh. Is he taking my place? With Carol? With you? No. No, Alan. Nobody could take your place. She's part of us. She grew from our love. Hilda. Hilda, what is it? What's troubling you? Please. Please, just leave me alone, Paul. No. If there's anything wrong, I want to know what it is. Perhaps we shouldn't have come to this house. Perhaps it's tied up to the past. Things that you must forget. Can you forget, darling? Our years. We'll go Our away. Memories. No, I can't. We'll go away for a while, Hilda. And, and when we come back, I'll get you a new house. I feel at home here, Paul. No, no. We'll have a new house for a new life. Suppose, um... Well, suppose in the meantime we run down to Bermuda. Riding in a funny carriage, swimming in the moonlight. No. No, Paul, not Bermuda. Let's, uh, let's go to Sun Valley. You see, uh, see, I've never been there. Well, whatever you like, dearest. Of course, we'll have to be back by Christmas. Oh, yes. Yes, by Christmas. I wouldn't miss the holidays with our little girl. Our little girl, Hilda. Yes. Our little girl. Our little girl! Darling. It's Christmas morning. Christmas is the time for families. Alan, I want to be with you. I'm here. I'm with you when you call me. Oh, not like that. All the time. The way it used to be. The way it should be. I've tried to make a new marriage. I shouldn't have, Alan. I can't be married to anyone but you. You're coming to me, aren't you, darling? Yes, sir. I'm coming to you. I have to leave Carol. Oh, that's wrong, isn't it? I can't help it. I'll drink this now. It won't hurt very much. To be quick off of me. Maybe I'll be afraid. But not in my heart. Because I want to be with you, my darling. I must be with you. Hello, Mother. Carol. Did you get up early to see your presents, too? Oh, Carol, darling, you were... You mustn't be down here. Go back to bed, please, Carol. But, Mother, it's Christmas. Can I open Paul's present? Please, Mother. Well, all right, darling. But I'd better light the fire. It's so cold here. There's my present. What does it say on it? To Carol from Santa Claus and Paul. Paul did give my, my letter to Santa Claus. Oh, Paul's the most wonderful daddy in the world. Carol, Paul isn't your real father. I know. You told me. But Paul's my father now. Oh, but your real father. How you would have loved to. Please open Paul's present, Mother. All right. There it is. Don't get too close to the fire, Carol. But it's just what I asked for in my letter. Look, Mother. You see, Ellen, she doesn't remember. No, she doesn't remember. Then it's all right for me to leave her, isn't it? She's happy here with Paul. Hilda, the tree, the fire. Carol, Hilda... Hilda, darling. You feeling better? Oh, where is she? Is she badly burned? She'll be all right. Oh, let me go to her. It's my fault. I let the fire and the tree fell. Lie, lie still, lie still. The doctor dressed her leg. She didn't even cry. Just lie back, darling. I'll get you some water. Hilda. Yes, Alan? You called him, you know. You were talking to me. But in that danger, you called Paul. Why? Why, yes, I did call Paul. And that's right, Hilda. Because he's alive. You kept me here. But I don't belong. I'm in the past. No. No. 
Yes, Hilda. I haven't been here except in your mind. You must forget, as Carol has forgotten. I can't. You must. Hilda, let's say all our words very quickly and for the last time. For the last time? Remember that first night when I cut in? May I cut in, please? I don't remember meeting you. You're not as pretty as your pictures, but you're livelier. It makes you shine, kind of. What's that, a radio? Certainly a radio. But no brakes? I drag one foot on the hills. Oh, Hilda, you're a swell girl. Will you marry me, Hilda? Even when we're both old, my heart will still jump when I see you. Oh, Ellen, she is beautiful. Gee, I had no idea they were born with fingernails. Kiss? Thank you. Now, don't forget the new dress. Not a chance. What color? Any color, so long as it's red. Goodbye, darling. Hilda. I said goodbye, darling. I can't say it. Say it, Hilda. Quickly. Say it. Say it. Goodbye, darling. Say it. Goodbye, darling. Alice. Goodbye, you darling. of ceremony, but rather as one of the millions who heard this play tonight, I want to say that I shall never forget the performance just given by Betty Davis, Bob Montgomery, Basil Rathbun, and Louise Beavers. And a special bow to the writer, Mary McCall, Jr., and the director, Frank Capra. It has indeed been a privilege to be associated with them on this, the Screen Guild's own program. Ladies and gentlemen, we feel it worthy of note that the money paid by the Gulf Oil Companies to the stars and feature players on this program is turned over to a special fund to build a home for the care of aged and indigent people from all branches of the motion picture industry. The famous stars who are our guests tonight donated their services. Every single dollar they would ordinarily receive for themselves is being turned over to this fund. The Gulf Oil Companies, your neighborhood good Gulf dealers, and all of us here in the studio are proud to take part in such a worthwhile project. We sincerely hope you enjoy this new kind of radio entertainment made possible by the motion picture industry, the Gulf Oil Company. This is George Murphy saying thank you and good night. Next week, same time, same station, the good golf dealer in your neighborhood joins the golf companies in welcoming you to another Screen Guild show. A review with a lot of fun with Mary Boland, Marlena Dietrich, Frank Morgan and Cliff Nazaro, written by Ken England and directed by W.S. Van Dyke. We are grateful to Warner Brothers for Betty Davis, soon to be seen in Dark Victory, to MGM for George Murphy, and for Robert Montgomery, who has just completed Fast and Loose. This is John Conti speaking. I'll follow my secret heart as from Conversation Peace. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You are listening to Chesterton Radio at ChestertonRadio.com. We have a big problem. Our culture is dying and souls are in danger of being lost. The answer is conversion to Jesus Christ in His church. St. Paul Street Evangelization is a Catholic organization and we have hundreds of teams spreading the good news throughout the country. But we need your help. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Find out more and get involved today at StreetEvangelization.com. That's StreetEvangelization.com. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton Day at ChestertonRadio.com.